deal with those. Uh, but again, we're hoping for uh, sometime before um, our day off on Saturday to uh, take care of that business. But we're still working on it. Um, so with that, Mr. Chair, I'll turn the, go turn the uh, mic back over to you and we can proceed. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chuck. And uh, I will then uh, turn the gavel over to our vice chair who's sitting there with you, uh, Brad Pettinger, to pick up on agenda item E3. Okay, thank you, Chair Grelnick, and welcome everyone. Um, I guess we'll go straight to it and uh, look to uh, John to start us off on uh, E3. John? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, Council Members. Um, agenda item E3 uh, deals with the adoption of ground fish harvest specifications for 2023 and 24. Um, as you are all aware, uh, the uh, framework for deciding harvest specifications um, requires uh, analysis of any alternative harvest control rules that you might want to entertain for uh, the next management cycle. However, if you, for any stock where you decide the default harvest control rules um, are where you want to be, uh, there is no need for an extensive analysis uh, of those. Um, and for your consideration, we've had a lot of deliberations in this process to get to this point. And you'll see, um, first off, agenda item E3, re supplemental revised attachment one. Uh, there were a few missing values in the original attachment one. These, these are uh, all of the actively managed stocks in our FMP and uh, the harvest specifications under default harvest control rules. Uh, we were missing uh, the copper rockfish in California uh, values. Uh, the quillback values uh, were not in the original um, attachment one. And we also uh, I realized that we didn't have the uh, 4010 adjusted ACLs for Link Cod South in the original attachment. So those, those have all been um, added into that supplemental revised attachment one. Uh, we have attachment two in your uh, draft, uh, in your advanced uh, briefing book, and this is the draft safe document. Um, and uh, the only action there is we're just asking uh, the GMT, GAB, SSC, and anyone really um, involved in the process uh, um, if they have any recommended edits or would like to add content to that. Um, the plan is to finalize that document early next year in time for your April decisions. Um, the attachment three uh, that was in your advanced briefing book was uh, some uh, requested uh, catch only projections for black rockfish off Oregon. Um, so uh, the different advisory bodies speak to uh, that attachment with their recommendations. So um, that's available for you. Uh, we have a supplemental revised attachment four. Um, one thing we realized when we uh, were reviewing all of this material in the SSC meeting is that the wrong category designation was used for Vermilion and Sunset Rockfish in uh, California, north of uh, Point Conception. Um, they went with a Category 2 designation, whereas the SSU is recommending Category 1. You'll see that in their report. So that's the only change in the Supplemental Revised Attachment 4 is we now have the correct uh, projections for uh, Vermilion and Sunset north of Point Conception in California. And um, all of those values, of course, are in that Supplemental Revised Attachment 1 as well. At the council's request in uh, September, we have some information to inform uh, uh, stock delineation decis decisions for copper rockfish. Uh, this is attachment five, and then an equivalent uh, uh, information for quillback rockfish is uh, found in attachment six. In your advanced briefing book, there are two GMT reports. Uh, the first one dealing with uh, harvest specifications uh, and some considerations and recommendations uh, for uh, alternative harvest specs. And 
uh, GMT Report 2, which is uh, um, a, a very informative uh, analysis of our uh, component stocks and stock complexes. And um, they've compared uh, recent total mortality estimates to their OFL contributions to um, determine which stocks may be at, at risk and deserve some uh, additional management attention here in this next cycle. Supplemental to um, the advanced briefing book, beyond the supplemental revised attachments one and four that I mentioned earlier, we have um, a supplemental SSC report with their recommendations. We have a supplemental GMT report three with some additional information on stock complexes. Um, what the GMT has decided to do is uh, cover all of their recommendations and material in two supplemental uh, PowerPoint presentations. And so you'll see those um, in your uh, briefing book now. And the GMT will cover their material in those presentations. And we also have a supplemental gap report with their recommendations. Um, that is all of the material that uh, we have in hand here. I believe that uh, with those supplemental revised attachments and the supplemental advisory body reports, uh, we have all the information you need to make decisions. And to be very clear on that, um, the action under this agenda item is to adopt the 23-24 uh, OFL stock categories and P stars, um, and then uh, for those stocks where you want to uh, consider some alternative harvest control rules, um, will you, you are uh, being asked to adopt a, a preliminary range of uh, OFLs, P stars, ABCs, ACLs uh, for more detailed analysis for your consideration next April. And then uh, finally, provide some uh, guidance on stock complex restructuring. You'll see in all the advisory body reports their recommendations uh, regarding that. And um, I would especially look to uh, the GMT presentation on uh, material to help uh, inform your decision on stock complexes. Don't know that I need to belabor the overview any further, but if you do have questions on the material, I am happy to entertain them. Hey, thank you, John. Um, I see Maggie has a question. Maggie? Thank you very much, Vice Chair. Good morning. Thank you, John, for the overview. You mentioned that uh, one of the Council's actions today will include adoption of stock categories. Um, have we not already done that when we adopted stock assessments? Can you help refresh me on that? Thanks. Well, um, you know, this is this is certainly an SSC call, and um, it could be argued that you did when you adopted their um, their recommended uh, assessments. Um, but just to be very clear, all the stock categories are listed in in that supplemental revised attachment one. Um, we provided that attachment so it, it's easier to make all of those uh, decisions. But I'll, I'll say that the stock category designations in uh, revised attachment one are consistent with what the SSC uh, is recommending. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Maggie, um, for that. Um, further questions for John? Okay, okay, thank you, John. Um, so with that, we'll go to the SSC report, and I believe uh, we have Galen Johnson and John Budrick. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Good morning, Council. This is Galen Johnson, and I'll be reading agenda item E3A, the supplemental SSC report one. The Scientific and Statistical Committee reviewed the 2023 and 2024 groundfish harvest specifications under default harvest control rules agenda item E3 attachment one, and made some corrections. The harvest specifications for Oregon quillback rockfish have changed from those previously reviewed due to an assumed lower catch in 2022, as the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife will be implementing non-retention regulations. Catch-only projections for black rockfish, agenda item E3 attachment three, were presented for two scenarios that differed according to the timeframe for which ABC's ACLs of 512 metric tons were assumed. 
2021 to 2022 versus 2021 to 2024. For both scenarios, previously assumed catch projections for 2019 and 2020 were replaced with lower observed catches for those years. Additional harvest specifications for lingcod, sablefish, spiny dogfish, and vermilion sunset rockfishes were reviewed, agenda item E3, attachment 4. The SSC noted that a Category 2 designation for vermilion and sunset rockfishes for the Northern California model was incorrectly used in this projection as well as in agenda item E3. AGMT Report 1. These projections will be updated to reflect the Category 1 designation assigned and corrected in the PACFIN database. The California quailback rockfish projections were updated to reflect the 4010 harvest control rule. The SSC endorses the catch specifications now that the suggested corrections have been made and a supplemental revised attachment 1 was anticipated at the time of this writing and John says it's done. In addition, the SSC endorses the alternative projections in attachments three and four, except for those in table six, attachment four, projections for the Northern California Vermilion Sunset Rockfish. Dr. Brian Langseth of the Northwest Fisheries Science Center provided the SSC with an update to a presentation from a Groundfish Subcommittee meeting held via webinar on September 29th to 30th, 2021, that focused on available information to determine stock management delineation for copper and quillback rockfish off the U.S. West Coast. The new information was primarily related to quillback rockfish, which was found to differ very little from that for copper rockfish. In general, adult quillback rockfish exhibit limited observed movements with high site fidelity. There's little understanding of larval dispersal patterns for these species, which is likely the mechanism by which mixing would occur given evidence for limited adult movement. However, minimal genetic variation between Washington and Alaska has been observed, which suggests the potential for broad scale larval dispersal. The only notable genetic differences observed occur between Pacific between Puget Sound and coastal regions. Estimated recruitment deviations for quillback rockfish showed some unquantified degree of spatial coherence. However, this alone does not necessarily imply connectivity during the larval stage as broad scale environmental forcing could be responsible. The SSC had extensive discussions about when to aggregate assessments across stock delineation boundaries for status determination. During these discussions, at least three tiers of information to consider were evaluated. The highest tier is a genetic difference among meaningful markers, which has not been demonstrated for quillback or copper rockfish. The the next highest tier of information is exchange or movement of adults followed by larval dispersal between areas. For both copper and quillback rockfish, adults exhibit high site fidelity and the magnitude of larval dispersal is uncertain. The lowest tier of information the SSC discussed was demographic differences such as size and age. The available data for these species do not suggest strong coastwide differences in size and age. There appears to be differences in selectivity patterns between commercial and recreational fleets that is stronger than selectivity patterns between states. The SSC recommends for quillback rockfish that three separate stock areas be maintained for status determination, California, Oregon, and Washington. For copper rockfish, the SSC recommends a reduction to two stock areas, pooling biomass estimates from Southern and Northern California assessments to determine status in California, and pooling the biomass estimates from the Oregon and Washington assessments for a northern area status determination. For sunset vermilion rockfish, separate stock areas should be assumed for status determination for the southern and northern California assessments because of the presence of sunset rockfish primarily south of Point Conception. The Oregon and Washington assessments should be combined into a single stock area because of the lack of population structure within vermilion rockfish at the northern extent of its range. The SSC notes that there is considerable uncertainty regarding stock structure for the three species and that additional data may clarify the situation. The SSC reviewed and endorsed methods for catch allocation between regions. The SSC reiterates that harvest should be spatially allocated proportional to relative biomass to reduce risk owing to the stock structure uncertainty, particularly for the copper rockfish of California. Mr. John DeVore, Council staff, provided a presentation on background and context for structuring groundfish stock complexes. GMT members were available to discuss their report on the topic, agenda item E3A, GMT Report 2. The SSC thanks the GMT for their carefully constructed report on this topic, especially given the limited time frame, and Mr. DeVore for his concise presentation. While recognizing that data limitations and the nature of co-occurring stocks are the primary reason to continue to use stock complexes for management, current concerns include, one, inflator stocks, which have large OFL and ACL contributions to complexes, yet catches that are lower than their ACL contributions. Two, stocks where catches consistently exceed OFL contributions within complexes, including 
A, those that need management action, and B, those that are caught primarily in areas outside the complex and where coastwide management might be a better approach. Three, stocks without OFL contributions and where targeting and retention of the species are not expected. These could be considered for designation as ecosystem component species. Four, stocks with or anticipated to have an overfish designation. Responses to the above issues could include removing stocks from complexes and manages, managing as individual stocks or designating as um, ecosystem component species, adding accountability measures and or prioritizing stocks for assessment as appropriate. Impacts of such changes to quota shares should be considered in weighing alternative actions and in general proposed changes to complexes should consider broader management implications. The SSC recommends management action to address the stocks with catches exceeding OFL contributions highlighted in agenda item E3A GMT report 2, as well as copper rockfish south of Point Conception due to new assessment results. In addition, given the anticipated overfish declaration for Quillback rockfish off California, the SSC recommends that stock be removed from complexes and managed separately to facilitate rebuilding. And that concludes our statement. Um, thank you, Galen. Um, questions for Galen on the SSC report? Okay. Um, seeing no hands, oh, we'll next go to um, Whitney Roberts in the uh, GMT report. Whitney? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I will turn to Lynn uh, Mattis right now, actually, she will give an overview of the GMT's approach for this agenda item, and then she'll turn it back to me for presentation one. Thanks, Whitney and uh, Vice Chair Pettinger. Uh, yeah, as Mr. DeVore said, uh, our goal or our plan here today is, I, I know y'all are going to be disappointed, but we're not going to sit up here and, or sit here and read the, our, our reports. Uh, instead, we have developed a couple of presentations to walk you through the overview of the reports. Whitney is going to cover uh, GMT report one on the biennial harvest specifications, and that is covered in supplemental GMT presentation one. Um, after Whitney gives that presentation, has some question and answers, then I will take over and provide supplemental GMT presentation two um, on stock complex evaluation. And this presentation covers GMT report two that was in the advanced briefing book, and then supplemental report three, which is some new information we have provided. So we hope that works for you all and uh, it is a better approach than uh, sitting and reading uh, lengthy statements. With that, uh, Whitney, go for it. Thank you, Lynn, and uh, good morning, members of the council. Um, as she alluded to, I'll be giving presentation uh, one supplemental GMT. Um, this, as she said, refers to the GMT report one under harvest specifications, which has been in the briefing book um, for quite a while. And um, to, uh, if, if you could go to the next slide, please. To kick off um, just and recap the goal of today's action item, um, number one, uh, move forward with default harvest control rules for stocks which uh, do not need consideration of alternative harvest control rules. Um, and then number two, uh, focus on <clears throat> those stocks that uh, do need consideration of alternative harvest control rules and um, select PPA on those alternative harvest control rules. Next, please. Um, so the breakdown of what includes harvest control rules starts with the um, overfishing limit, which the council has already adopted under stock assessments, um, the stock category, um, the sigma and P star, which determine the deduction amount from the OFL to the ABC, the ABC itself, acceptable biological catch, and then the ACL, um, which is the P star approach as well. Um, and part of what we're deciding today. Next, please. So except for the stocks listed here, the GMT recommends adopting all default harvest control rules. Um, and then the stocks that we recommend, uh, including a range of alternatives for the harvest control rules are sable fish, which is uh, assessed coastwide, um, but the ABC is a portion north and south. Um, 
based on the average annual swept area biomass estimates from the Northwest Fisheries Science Center trawl survey. So we're talking about coastwide sable fish um, at this point in time. Uh, second, Lincod North of 4010, Lincod South of 4010, Oregon Black Rockfish, Pacific Spiny Dogfish, Vermilion North of 4010, and Vermilion South of 4010. Next, please. Um, again, these are the alternative harvest control rule stocks that we are considering at this juncture. Um, I won't list them again. Next, please. So the first stock, sable fish, as I said, which is coastwide, um, there are three alternatives that the GMT recommends keeping in the range of alternatives. Um, however, the GMT is recommending choosing either from the no action or alternative one, um, which are a P-star of 0 0.45 and 0 0.4. However, the GMT does recommend keeping 0 0.35 in the range of alternatives moving forward. Um, and the ABCs under the no action alternative would be 10,825 metric tons for 2023 and 9,923 metric tons for 2024. The ABCs under alternative one would be 10,170 metric, seven metric tons for 2023 and 9,252 metric tons for 2024. Under alternative two, the P star 0.35, the ABCs would be 9,412 metric tons and 8,608 metric tons for 2024. Next, please. And the next slide will provide some additional rationale, but this is uh, just a quick look at the recent sable fish removals, pointing out that um, recent removals have been slightly under the coastwide ACL. Um, and as we point out in our report, this could indicate that um, the projections for sable fish uh, in the long term could be um, slightly different from what is actually the case given that recent removals have been under the coastwide ACL and you can see the attainment there as well, which has um, been lower in recent years. Next, please. So some additional background and rationale for selecting from either the PSTAR 0.45 or 0.4 um, is that the update assessment in 2021 indicated that the stock is at 58% of unfished spawning biomass suggesting a more optimistic status than was estimated in the 2019 full assessment projection of 46%. The risk to the stock is similar under the low state of nature for the default P-star of 0.45 and the two alternative harvest strategies, um, which is 49% under 0.45, 51% under 0.4, and 53% under a P-star of 0.35. Um, and in the table below, you can see the economic implications of these alternative P stars um, and alternative ABCs, uh, which is developed from the IOPAC model. Um, and you can see that there's a difference of 2.9 and $5.7 million in potential lost revenue, as well as 5.9 and $11.6 million in potential lost income when compared to the no action alternative. Next, please. So in summary, the Sablefish Coastwide GMT recommendation is to select a PPA from either the no action P star of 0.45 or the alternative one P star of 0.4. And the ABCs are listed there again. Um, and again, we recommend, although not selection, selecting a PPA from this alternative, keeping the P-star 0.35 in the range of alternatives for analysis. Next, please. So the second stock is Lincod North of 4010. Um, and the, there are two alternatives currently uh, proposed for analysis that we recommend in the range of alternatives. Uh, the first one is the default P-star of 0.45 with ACLs of 4,378 metric tons in 23 and 3,854 metric tons in 2024. The alternative one, P-star of 0.4, uh, provides lower ACLs of 3,817 metric tons and 3,418 metric tons for 2024. The GMT at this time does not have a recommendation on PPA because uh, this, among some other stocks in this presentation, um, the GMT sees as a primary, primarily a council risk tolerance decision. Next, please. To provide some rationale behind um, including that alternative P star in the range of alternatives, 
Uh, the 2021 stock assessment for Lincoln North of 4010 was highly uncertain around the estimates of stock size and designated a category two assessment with a sigma value of one. The previous assessment in 2017 was designated as category one with a sigma of value of 0.5. During the star panel, a P-star of 0.4 catch projection was conducted as a possible management option to account for the large uncertainty in the assessment. And recent estimated total mortality has been approximately 1,000 metric tons as shown in the next table in, oh, I'm sorry, it's not in the, in the slide, but it has been around 1,000 metric tons, which is much less than the no action alt ACL and the alt one ACL. And therefore the GMT does not foresee any notable economic implications to Lincoln North of 4010 under either alternative. And there you can see the P star, uh, the ACL projections under each of the P star alternatives. Again, next please. So in summary, uh, again, for Lincoln North, the GMT is not providing a recommendation um, at this time, and that is similar for Lincoln South as well as the rationale for Lincoln South. Um, again, there are two alternatives under this one as well, um, with uh, the, the default harvest control rule being the 4010 adjustment um, under a P star of 0.45, which provides ACLs under no action of 726 metric tons and 722 metric tons. Under the alternative one, which is a, a 4010 adjustment under an alternative P star of 0.4, um, the ACLs are 633 metric tons and 634 metric tons. Next, please. So similar to Lincoln North, um, the star panel applied a P star of 0.4 as a means to address the uncertainty in the assessment um, and was designated a category two stock accounting for the uncertainty around the estimated spawning biomass and fraction unfished. A recent total estimate, recent estimated total mortality has been around 290 to 450 metric tons, which is less than no action ACL and all one ACL. Um, and given that, as well as that total mortality has been declining, um, the GMT does not foresee any notable economic implications to Lincoln South of 4010 under either of these P-STAR alternatives, which you can see in the table there as well. Next, please. Moving on, uh, Oregon Black Rockfish is also considering an alternative harvest control rule. Um, and this one has been used in the 21 and 22 cycle as well. Um, the no action here is using the default P-STAR 0.45, which has ACLs of 477 metric tons and 471 metric tons. Um, the alternative one is a case-by-case -case ABC approach um, set at the 2122 ACL, which is 512 metric tons, and that would be for both 2023 and 2024. Next, please. And the background and rationale behind this is that in the 2015 assessment, um, the 2015 assessment was approved for management, but there were some issues identified by reviewers um, which designated uh, the assessment as category two due to large overall uncertainty around stock size and status. Um, it was a given a 60%, or I'm sorry, the assessment projected 60% of unfished spawning biomass at the beginning of 2015. Um, and there are similar long-term results for both of the alternatives of depletion, um, which is 54.4% under the no action and 54.1% under alternative one. Um, additionally, alternative one would provide some short-term benefit, um, which involves more time for ODFW to incorporate their hydroacoustic visual survey, uh, as well as stabilize the fishery a little bit. And um, you can see in the table some uh, back to 2015 recreational mortality, commercial nearshore mortality, as well as total mortality against the Oregon ACL and Harvest Guide for Harvest Guideline. Next, please. In summary, um, the GMT is recommending alternative one, which is the case by case ABC approach set at the 2122 ACL of 512 metric tons to help stabilize the fishery in the short term um, and provide a little bit more time for the survey to get in place. Um, and again, the no action is using just the P-STAR of 0.45. Next, please. 
Moving on to spiny dogfish, um, similar to some other stocks, the GMT sees this as primarily a council risk tolerance decision and therefore does not provide a recommendation here. Um, but we do offer, and this was in our report in the advanced briefing book, we do offer a new alternative one um, to compare with the no action alternative, which is the default P star of 0 0.4. Under the no action, the ABC would be 1,456 metric tons and 1,407 metric tons. Um, and as was discussed under the stock assessment agenda item, um, the, the stock assessment was revised during MAPA panel review to, um, to take a deeper dive at the uh, catchability coefficient. Um, and as of the stock assessment agenda item, the council adopted uh, this new base model is what the SSC called it, um, where the Q is equal to 0.43. Um, so with that in mind, the GMT uh, provides this new alternative one where the ACL would be set at a lower value, for example, 1,075 metric tons, which is the recent five-year average catch um, or recent five-year mortality for 23, 24, and then revert back to the ACL equals ABC with a P star of 0.4 thereafter under the middle state of nature model, which like I said, has been adopted at this point. Next, please. So I apologize that this is a lot of words, but um, as I said, the new middle state of nature model, which has a Q of 0.43 lower than the old base model 0.59 projects a more optimistic status of the stock compared to the low state of nature model um, and based on the uncertainty around the queue, the council may wish to take a precautionary approach in the short term. Uh, for this reason, the GMT proposes the new alternative one, which would set an ACL of 1075 for 23 and 24, and then use the default harvest control rule of ACL equals ABC P star 0.4 thereafter. This would allow the council to move forward with precaution without unnecessarily constraining ground fish sectors. The alternative one is similar in catch projection levels for 23, 24 to the middle row of the decision table for the species. And I do wanna note that this is the decision table that the GMT had access to at the October meeting. Um, and the decision table in attachment four uses now only the new base model projections um, under alternative P stars. So I just wanna clarify that. Um, the spiny dogfish catch is variable across all sectors and years, and a difference of 74 to 105 metric tons could constrain some sectors. And in our report one, we do provide a table of uh, recent mortality across all the different sectors that largely contribute to Pacific spiny dogfish catch. So that is in our report one if you want to reference that. Um, and it is primarily caught as bycatch in all the sectors. Since not targeted and approximately 60% is discarded, the GMT does not anticipate any direct economic impacts from reduced ACLs aside from effects in which the fishery is required to alter their operations to minimize bycatch if it becomes a constraint. Next, please. Moving on to Vermilion Sunset Rockfish north of 4010. This is one of the stocks that the GMT sees as a council risk tolerance decision um, and doesn't provide a PPA recommendation at this time. Um, the no action alternative involves a P star of 0.45 with ACLs of, I wanna note that these ACLs may not match what is an attachment for Vermilion Sunset is the only uh, stock that is not consistent with the revised attachments in the briefing book because of the updates that John DeVore alluded to. Um, and I do want to also note that the there is a, an inaccuracy or a, this slide is incorrect for the no action P star that should say P star of 0 0.40. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, that is actually P star of 0 0.40 under no action. So I would refer folks to the uh, revised attachments to reference those final numbers for Vermilion Sunset especially. Um, and then the alternative one would be a P star of 0.35. Next, please. So some background rationale for Vermilion North um, is that with recent overages of the OFL contribution to the complex, the council may want to consider being more precautionary and apply a P star of 0.4. Even under a P star, of, I'm sorry, that would be a P star of 0.35. Even under a P star of 0.4, management actions may be necessary to keep the total mortality below the ACL contribution. 
not a target species in the recreational fisheries off of Washington or Oregon, nor are they targeted by commercial nearshore and non-nearshore fisheries. Therefore, designing management measures to reduce impacts will be challenging. And you can see the total mortality in recent years in the table below. So again, um, the default is a P star of 0.4 and the alternative is a P star of 0.35. Next, please. Um, this is just some additional look at the ACL contribution under the no action and alternative one. Again, noting the P stars there should be 0.4 and 0.35. Um, under 2023 and 2024 for the different areas that um, the stock is broken out into for Washington, Oregon, and then 4010 to 42. Next, please. So Vermilion Sunset Rockfish South is another stock that the GMT does not have a recommendation of PPA at this time um, and sees it as primarily a council risk tolerance. Um, under no action, the ACL equals ABC P star would be 0 0.45 and under alternative one, the P star would be 0.4. Um, again, for both Vermilion North and South, I would refer folks to the revised attachments as the final numbers um, as these are the ones um, that could differ. All of the other stocks in this presentation have been uh, triple checked, but Vermilion has made some um, recent adjustments, so refer to those revised attachments for the final numbers. Next, please. Some background and rationale for Vermilion South are that um, it's similar for Vermilion North um, and for the same reasons. Uh, with recent overages of the OFL contribution to the complex, the council may want to consider a more precautionary PSTAR. Um, decision tables provided for uh, Vermilion Sunset Rockfish with ACLs um, under PSTARs of 0.4 and 0.45 and 0.4 are for the assessment areas rather than management areas. And um, so therefore in the table, we provide the assessment areas listed um, with the total under 23 and 24, as well as their ACL contribution under the alternative P stars. Next, please. So wrapping up, this is a, a table of our summary recommendations um, and as well as our summary uh, recommendation for alternatives to be included in the range of alternatives. Um, and we bold the two that we have a PPA recommendation on, but as you can see, the majority of them do not, we do not provide a PPA recommendation at this time because we consider them to be uh, council policy risk decisions. Um, and you'll also note that number nine and 10, Quillback Rockfish off California and Copper Rockfish off California, we have placeholders there because at the time of writing this report, um, we had not had enough information to consider those um, stocks for harvest specifications. Um, and next, please. With that, uh, that concludes our um, range of alternatives and recommended PPAs under harvest specifications, um, as well as default harvest control rules. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions from members of the council. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Whitney, for a very clear and concise uh, presentation there. Um, I see Lynn's hands, uh, hand is up and uh, John DeVore. So um, who's, who am I taking first here, Lynn? Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Vice Chair Pettinger. Um, with apologies to Whitney, uh, we found a typo early this morning. There's been some emails going back and forth, um, and I think Whitney may have captured it slightly incorrectly. If we can go back to slide 19... The yes, north. So the the a the no action ACL is correct at 0.45. Where the error is is the alternative one ACL should say 0 0.40 in this slide. Everything else after this slide has the correct no action alternative of 0.45 and alternative one of 0 0.40. There's just a typo in this one slide. Um, and again, apologies to Whitney um, for not for not catching this typo and some confusing emails um, quickly this morning. So just wanted to correct that. All the information on the subsequent slides does reference a P star of 0 0.40, and those values are correct. It's just this one slide with 0.35 has the, the typo. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Lynn. Um, 
Um, Maggie Summer. Maggie? Uh, you're muted. Hey, oh. Yep. <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, Vice Chair. Thanks, Whitney, for the presentation and Lynn for the clarification there. A question on, uh, I heard the GMT recommends for sable fish keeping uh, in the range, the alternative with a P star equal to 0.35, uh, but I didn't hear uh, any rationale for keeping that in um, and I, I didn't see uh, much detail in GMT report one. So I wonder if the, the team had any more discussions uh, on that, anything related to rationale for retaining that that you might offer? The Vice Chair, thank you, Ms. Summer, for the question. Um, if I can try to jog my memory, because a lot of this discussion happened during our October meeting, um, I think the rationale behind keeping it at least in the range of alternatives is that there's been some pretty strong public comment requesting that it be in the range of alternatives, and we want to be sensitive to that, those requests, um, and we, we consider sable fish ultimately one of the things that could be a council policy risk decision as well in terms of the specific P star that would be used. And so if the council um, wishes to be uh, considerably more precautionary than the P star of 0.35 could provide that um, level of precaution. Um, and so it may be considered overly precautionary by some on the, and so we don't recommend selecting it as PPA at this time for that reason, um, but keeping it in the range of alternatives could certainly um, allow analysts to uh, to look deeper and see if there is, is, is further rationale for considering it for a PPA um, and didn't want to uh, entirely pr preclude leaving it out at this time. I, I hope that answers your question. Um, thanks, it, Maggie. It does, great answer, thank you, appreciate it. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, Heather Hall, Heather. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, good morning, and, and thank you, Whitney, for um, this presentation, and thank you to the GMT for putting this together. I find it a really helpful way to synthesize all this information uh, that we have um, to make our decisions on. And, and my question is also about sablefish, and, and it, it is, in a way, getting at um, a, a little bit of what Maggie asked. I'm, I'm trying to understand um, the differences and the implications from the, the three alternatives or the no action and the two alternatives, I should say, uh, for the P-STAR. And um, my question is, is really um, relative to slide eight. And on that, we see that um, the estimate that under a P-star of 0.35 um, and an ABC of 9,412 metric tons, there's a potential loss of 161 jobs. And what I um, could use some help understanding is how that compares um, to that ACL um, under the PSAR 0.35, which ranges from about 9,400 um, metric tons to 8,600 metric tons. Um, well, at the same time, our current catch is less than 6,000 metric tons. And so what I'm um, saying, hopefully, it, to try to make it clear, is we have under a PSAR 0.35, Three, five, a much higher ACL than what we have in place. And yet the um, economic look at that shows a loss of jobs. Um, so I hope my question's clear and I don't know if you can help me understand the, the metrics here and, and why there would be a potential loss of jobs under this, even though it's a much higher um, ABC and ACL than what we have in place now. Through the vice chair, thank you, Ms. Hall, for the question. Um, I think what you're getting at is, uh, could essentially be answered, and Lynn can correct me if I'm wrong on this as well. She may um, have 
some insight, um, but we, when we use the IOPAC model to project these potential um, economic implications, it, the IOPAC model inherently assumes that the full ACL is taken um, in those years. And so you're absolutely correct that when you compare the um, projected ABC to recent removals, um, the impacts here could be uh, considered as an upper bound um, in the grand scheme of things uh, compared to what may actually um, be projected. And I see Lynn just put her hand up, so maybe she uh, can correct me on something if I misrepresented. Uh, Thanks, Lynn. Yeah, Lynn. Yeah, uh, through the vice chair, Ms. Hall, um, when he's got, got it partially correct about the full ACL, um, the potential lost jobs, that is in, not in reference to current or status quo. That is in, in comparison to if the P-star was 0.45. So the, the change in revenue, the change in jobs is not compared to current where we're at right now. It's compared to the potential uh, of if we went to the no action P star or ABC of 10,825. So it's comparing alternative one and alternative two are being compared to that uh, no action alternative, not to the current. Hopefully that helps some. To both of you, that helps very much. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. And thank you, uh, Whitney. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you, Heather, for the, the question. Um, for the questions for Whitney, uh, Phil Anderson, Phil. Yeah, I guess I, I had similar question. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I had similar questions to what Heather had. I mean, we we could also have a had a column here of what our what our current um, ABC is, and and then compare that to what the ABC would be uh, under with the new stock assessment and the 4540. And you might have another column that would indicate how many additional jobs might be added uh, to what their the current number of jobs associated with the lower ABC that we're currently operating the fishery under. Is that a, is that, I mean, if, if there's, I mean, there's different ways to look at this. And one is lost jobs over what the maximum might be under a four five and the ten eight two five. Another way to look at it is with our current ABC, but I don't remember off the top of my head what it is, but under any of these scenarios, the ABC is going to be higher than what it was in our current management cycle, and therefore there's a potential uh, increase in number of jobs. Is that fair to think in that if, of it in those terms? Through the vice chair, thank you, Mr. Anderson, for this question. I, I am going to kick it over to Lynn. I think she can help answer this question. Uh, through the chair, Mr. Anderson, th that is correct. That that is another way we could look at it, and we can try to provide that information um, at, at a future time. Uh, it did not occur to us to, uh, to uh, look at it that way at this time. Um, and I freely admit that we have a couple of non-economists trying to play the role of economist on the GMT right now. And we, it just slipped our mind to look at it this way, but that is some information uh, we will include in additional analysis. Um, uh, appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, Phil, um, if I may ask, well, actually I'll, I'll, I'll get to do a discussion, so, okay. Next up is, um, oh, actually, um, further questions for Whitney? All right, seeing none, we'll, uh, we'll go to Lynn and uh, take us from there, Lynn. Sure. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Petger, uh, and thank you, Sandra, or whoever's writing the IT right now for keying up our presentations. Again, this is supplemental GMT presentation, and this is going to cover what is in GMT Report 2 that was in the advanced briefing book, and then supplemental GMT Report 3, which is some additional information and discussion we've had. Um, next slide, please. 
So in September 2021, the council requested the GMT prepare a comprehensive evaluation of mortality estimates compared to harvest specification contributions of the species managed in stock complexes. And that's where we focused our time and attention and efforts was on that specific task. Looking at stock complexes, it could be a very large undertaking, which I think we're going to be discussing more over the next couple of hours. But for this report, and at this time, we focused on this specific task, and that is what is covered under report, uh, report two in the advanced briefing book. Next slide, please. So to start off, what is a stock complex? We looked at the regulations and the new national standard guidelines, and it's a uh, stock complex is a tool um, to to manage a group of stocks within the FMP. Um, and at, to the extent practicable, um, there should be a full and explicit description of the proportional composition of each stock. And stocks may be grouped for various reasons, including uh, multi-species fisheries, where species can't be targeted independently of other, uh, where there's insufficient data to measure a stock status relative to a stock determination criteria, or when it's not feasible for fishermen to distinguish individual stocks among their catch, such as some anglers having difficulty between Deacon and Blue or Vermilion and Sunset. Next slide, please. So where practical, a group of stocks should have similar geographic distribution, similar life histories, similar, similar vulnerabilities to fishing pressure, and, and such that the impact of management actions on the individual stocks within the complex are similar. And the individual vulnerability, which I'll discuss more in a couple of slides, of individual stocks should be considered when determining um, if a complex should be created or reorganized. Next, please. So th this is in report three. This slide, the information in this slide is not in report two, but it is in report three. Um, we had some discussion um, to help frame the, the complexes for some of the newer members on the GMT and thought it would be helpful for uh, council members as well, how the current stock complexes came about. We do note that the current stock complexes were created prior to the National Standard 1 revisions. Uh, most of them are an evolution of what used to be the Sebastes complex back in the, in the 1990s. And many of the guidelines outlined in the previous two slides were not considered when those when our current complexes were created. So we don't have practical indicator stocks. Um, many of the complexes have a mixture of vulnerability scores and OFL contributions. So some of those things that National Standard 1 requires weren't part of the discussion, weren't part of the decision making when the complexes were originally created. Next, please. Now on to the vulnerability. Uh, the 2020 SAFE document, and I believe the, uh, the draft updated SAFE document that uh, Mr. DeVoris provided in the briefing book, um, discusses the productivity and susceptibility analysis approach. Um, the GMT led by Dr. Jason Cope took this un undertook this for our ground fish stocks in 2011, um, looking at the susceptibility to current fishing practices and the productivity as defined by life history traits. And each vulnerability component is comprised of several attributes that are weighted individually, um, and those combined create the vulnerability score. Next slide, please. In the COPE et al., the work that the GMT did in 2011, um, we established vulnerability reference points of assessed and unassessed West Coast ground fish stocks. Um, I like to color code things using the, the stoplight plus orange. Um, it helps, it really helps me identify things fairly quickly. So any species with a vulnerability score of greater than 2.2 uh, is considered of major concern. Vulnerability scores of two to 2.2 species of high concern. 1.8 to 2.0, medium concern, and anything with a vulnerability lower than 1.8 is considered of low concern. As you might imagine, rockfishes and elasmobranchs showed the highest vulnerabilities with vulnerability scores greater than 2.0, with the deepest residing members of these groups often the most vulnerable. Uh, though there are several species of nearshore rockfish with some of the highest vulnerability scores, uh, China, quillback, and copper, which we've been talking about already today. And then in general, flatfishes showed the lowest vulnerabilities. Next slide, please. So now into the data, a summary of data on the current stock complexes. The data sources, uh, this was a several week undertaking looking uh, to try to summarize data on complexes. 
Uh, we looked at the groundfish mortality reports from WICGOP, the harvest specifications database, the SAFE reports, digging through individual stock assessment documents, uh, old briefing book documents, as well as federal regulations. So that's where all of the data that is in report two um, and in the subsequent tables that we're going to talk about comes from. Next, please. So in report one, or report two, there are tables like this for each or each of our current complexes. And on the slides, the number in the parentheses, table one, that is a reference to the table in report two that corresponds. So for each complex, we have one of these tables that lists the species, then the current stock category. Uh, then for this presentation, we did color code the vulnerability score with that red, yellow, orange, green. We provide some information on the average OFL contribution, um, the average OFL percentage, and that's a percentage of the whole for that complex. So for, for example, the first line copper rockfish accounts for 11.56% of the total OFL contribution of the near shore complex north. The next column is the average over or under the OFL contribution. So if it's a negative number, like looking down at China rockfish, where it says negative 17.73, on average, the total mortality has been a little over, just a little under 18 metric tons below the OFL contribution. For copper rockfish on the first line, uh, positive 8.69, that means that on average, we've been a little under nine metric tons over the OFL contribution. And the, finally, the last column in these tables is the number of years over the OFL over the last four years. Uh, we just chose the last four years um, for ease of some data. Now, these tables are uh, for species that the GMT has identified as ones that may be a, uh, the council may want to look at um, in greater detail, may want to reevaluate. We have put those in the top lines bolded them, made them bigger font so that they're easier to see. So for uh, here at Nearshore Rockfish North, um, based on stock category, vulnerability score, number of years over the OFL, the GMT thinks that we may want to look at copper rockfish and quillback rockfish in the north in the north complex. We do note that China rockfish also has a high vulnerability score, but it has been quite a bit below the OFL contribution and it has not exceeded the OFL contribution in the last four years. So I've got tables like this for each of the, the complexes. Um, and I can't move the slide, which I'm just trying, I tried to do. Uh, so next slide, please. Thank you. For near shore rockfish south, again, the same table setup, same color coding. Uh, oh, I do want to note, <coughs> We do not, for any stock that is a category three stock, um, in, in all of the tables, tables, anything that is a category three stock, all of the text for that species is in italics. But we do not include category three stocks as stocks that need to be reevaluated. There's not enough data on those stocks to um, inform, to make that decision right now. So for nearshore rockfish south, uh, in the south of 4010 complex, we do note quillback, quillback rockfish. It's a category two stock with a high vulnerability score. It's been just a little bit, a little over a metric ton over on average the OFL contribution. And in four of the last four years, the OFL contribution has been exceeded. Therefore, we may want to look at that quillback rockfish. And I know quillback rockfish is, is a species of concern for, for other reasons. Um, China and copper are also high vulnerability scores. However, neither of those have been exceeded. Uh, China has been exceeded twice, but on average less than one metric ton and copper has not ex had the OFL exceeded. So for nearshore rockfish south, uh, the, the main species the GMT thinks should uh, be examined is quillback rockfish. Next, please. Shelf rockfish north. Same thing, we looked at all of the data. The species that stood out in the shelf rockfish north complex is vermilion rockfish. Uh, while it has a, a moderate concern, it's in that orange category on the vulnerability, the average OFL contribution has been exceeded by about 12, a little under 13 metric tons, and it has been exceeded in the four of the last four years. Next, please. 
Uh, I should note that on these shelf rockfish complexes, the tables are somewhat truncated just because I couldn't fit enough on the slides. Uh, but the the lower part of the table where it's all category three stocks and we it has not been exceeded, I felt it was okay to truncate them for this presentation. Shelf rockfish south, uh, two species stood out to the GMT, square spot rockfish and vermilion rockfish. Uh, both of those species have uh, had the OFL exceeded in three of the last four years, uh, and for one of them by a, quite a bit. Uh, I do, we do note that tiger rockfish has also it had the OFL exceeded every year, uh, every year of the four years, but it is a category three stock, and the average OFL contribution is less than 0.1 metric tons. So even uh, a de minimis amount of fish technically makes more over the OFL. So for shelf rockfish south, uh, species that the council may want to consider that the GMT believes are square spot and vermilion, at yeah, vermilion sunset. Next slide, please. For slope rockfish north, um, and this is in table five in the report, um, the, the main one that stood out to the GMT is Aurora rockfish. Uh, it is a category one stock and it is in that uh, orange category for vulnerability and in all of the last four years, the OFL has been exceeded. We do want to note and point out that both that the rough eye black spotted rockfish as well as short raker rockfish, uh, they are in that red vulnerability category of high concern, but uh, rough eye has been on average less than 31.7 metric tons, a little less than 32 metric tons over the OFL contribution. And short raker on average has been about seven metric tons less and the OFL has not been exceeded. Uh, therefore, under slope rockfish north, Aurora rockfish is the only species that stood out. Next, please. For slope rockfish south, uh, there were no species that uh, the GMT identified as needing uh, additional consideration at this time. We note in the far right column that none of the OFLs have been exceeded in any of the last four years. Again, short raker and rough eye are in that red vulnerability category. Um, so if there's a bigger picture look at complexes, they something may need to be done there. But at this time, we have not identified anything of concern in slope rockfish north. Next, please. Other flatfish. Uh, this is a group of flatfish that don't belong anywhere else as far as complexes. All of the stocks in this cat in this complex are category three stocks. Um, all of them are in the green vulnerability category, and there's only been one year where any of them have had their OFL exceeded. That was flathead sole had one year, um, but most species are significantly under the OFL contribution each year. Uh, so no species identified out of other flatfish. Next, please. Um, I notice, you'll notice we don't have other fish. Uh, Oregon Black Blue Deacon or the Washington or Oregon Cabazon Greenling complexes, uh, nothing identified in those complexes stood out and, and with only two species, they, they seem to be going pretty well. So if a species has a new overfish declaration, uh, previously when, a count, when one has been declared overfish, it, the council has removed it from the complex. An example would be canary rockfish a number of years ago and managed with individual harvest specifications. So we recommend the council continue to give any, give, consider any addi uh, additional consideration for any newly designated species. Uh, this is primarily coming up because there is a lot of discussion about coolback rockfish in California. Uh, the GMT uh, was hesitant to say pull quill back out rockfish out because it's overfished because it hasn't been officially declared overfished and we didn't want to presuppose what was going to happen and jump a step. So we just wanted to add this as a generalization that we do recommend if a species is declared overfished, then we do consider removing it from a complex as we have done in the past. Next slide, please. Some additional considerations when thinking about removing species from a complex. Uh, it, it may seem simple and in way, ways it is, but there are some additional calculations that will have to go into place. 
uh, for example, off the top deductions, to, uh, which we'll talk about more tomorrow, um, to develop the fishery harvest guidelines would need to be redeveloped, um, both for the species removed from the complex, as well as whatever species are left in the complex. That could prove challenging because in a lot of cases, the information to inform things like off the top deductions um, have been given at and tracked at the complex level, not at the individual species level. Uh, an example, research is reported at the complex level. In most cases, we don't have the, the stock by stock um, estimates within that complex. So developing what the appropriate off the top deductions would be for the species removed as well as whatever's left in the species or in the complex could be proved difficult. And then similarly for any complexes that have IFQ implications, there will need to be mechanisms for distributing the, the species removed as well as the remainder of the species. Um, and, and that could be a little complex with, with doing those calculations. Next slide, please. So a summary of this is a summary slide of the species we identified for uh, further consideration about whether they should stay in the complex or not. For near shore north, it's copper and quillback. Near shore south, quillback. Shelf north, vermilion. Shelf south, vermilion and square spot. Slope north, aurora. Slope south, none. And same thing with other fish, or other flatfish. Next, please. Now, the, these last several slides are about what is in report three that we submitted yesterday. So if the council has a, identifies a species that needs to be addressed, um, the council or the GMT sees there's two pathways for including that as part of the 23-24 specs process. And that, that's one of the decision points here uh, at this meeting. The first option would be to remove that species from a complex, which then we need to set new species specific OFL, ABCs and ACLs for the species, as well as for the remainder of the complex, determine the off the top deductions, the between and with sector allocation, state sharing, et cetera. And then we'll need to develop management measures such as commercial trip limits, recreational bag limits, sub bag limits, et cetera. The team sees this as the more complicated pathway for inclusion in the 23-24 specs process. Next, please. The second potential pathway would be to leave it in the complex, but set species specific management measures. Um, this is somewhat similar to what we have done with black Hill rockfish recently, where you set a species specific, everything, it stays within the complex, the OFL ABC complex level stays the same, the off the top deductions, et cetera, stay the same. But we set a species specific harvest guideline for that individual species, and then set regulations such as the commercial trip limits, depth restrictions, bag limits, et cetera, to stay within the harvest guideline. We as a team see this as the, more, as the less complicated pathway for inclusion as part of the 23-24 specs process. Next, please. So through all of this discussion about complexes in October over the last few days with the SSC, with some members of the Northwest Science Center who were very helpful, oh, and the Southwest Science Center who were very helpful in our discussions, uh, some bigger picture issues came up that are, are bigger than can be handled as part of this 23-24 specs process. We wanted to lay them out at now, um, since we're talking about complexes, it seemed like a good time to bring it up. So at some point, again, outside of the, spec, the current specs process, the council may want to do a comprehensive examination of stock complexes, including update the susceptibility part of the productivity and susceptibility analysis. Um, that was last done in 2011, and there's been some fairly significant changes in our fishery since then. But we do recommend waiting until the non-trawl our uh, area management item is completed, because that could really change some of the susceptibility. That would be a good time to look at indicator and a inflator stocks, as well as OFL apportionment among management areas, as well as some stocks without species-specific OFL contributions, um, especially those that have more negligible, more than negligible annual mortality. So there's some species we don't have any information on. There's not a, there hasn't been a data poor assessment, nothing, but yet there is some, some take of those species. And then there could be potential other considerations, um, but these are big picture that would have to be, uh, we believe, done on its own process. Next, please. That is the end of my overview, and I will be happy to try to answer questions.
Thank you, Lynn, um, for, a, for a great job and a great presentation. Um, John DeVore, John. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Vice Chair uh, and Lynn. Um, I, I just want to uh, clarify a couple of things in this presentation. When you go to slide 14, uh, can I presume that the, um, the title of that slide is incorrect? This is really uh, the Southern Slope Rockfish Complex. I think you spoke to that during the presentation, but I just note that the slide label appears wrong. Through the vice chair, Mr. DeVore, that is correct. Uh, that, that is a typo, it should be slope south. Um, this is what happens when we try to hurry up and provide presentations while do, working on seven or eight other reports. So thank you for correcting that. Slide 14 should be slope rockfish south, that is correct. Right, okay, thank you. And you did speak to it during the presentation. So I just wanted to clear up any potential confusion there. Um, and then, um, I point to the second bullet on slide 17, where you talk about mechanisms for distributing species uh, to the IFQ uh, sector um, would need to be developed. Um, I note that uh, in the amendment uh, 20 um, framework and, and analysis, uh, we do have a, a mechanism already in place that can be used for uh, doing this. So. Um, I mean, we can circle back uh, later in, you know, after talking with Jim Seeger, uh, but I, I, do un I do believe that there is a mechanism already in place. Through the vice chair, Mr. DeVore, thank you for that update. Um, it doesn't surprise me that there's one in place. It's just something we wanted to note that, that there could be IFQ implications that we'll have to do some calculations on. And that helps us out if there's a mechanism already developed that we can utilize. Appreciate that input. Sure. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, Phil Anderson. Phil. Um, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I just wanted to really compliment the GMT and, and Lynn on, on their presentation in this uh, PowerPoint um, pictures and colors and all of those things help help certainly help me uh, understand um, what's being presented and the information um, better than than uh, maybe reading a report but uh, the way you put the way you all put this together and presented it to us uh, made it uh, very understandable uh, although the the volume of the alarm on several of these species is uh, is is louder when when presented in this manner. Um, you just did a did a great job, Lynn, and and thanks to you and your colleagues for for putting the presentation together in this manner. Through the vice chair, Mr. Anderson, thank you for that feedback. Uh, we're, we try our best to prov to uh, provide the information in, in a usable format. Some of it isn't it we can't always do it depending on time but appreciate the feedback on what works for for you all um we keep that in mind and try to move forward with thanks phil um further questions for lynn okay well thank you lynn um next up is the uh, gap report and um dan waldeck dan Good morning, Vice Chair Pettinger. Here's if you can hear me. Uh, Dan Waldeck with the GAP. I'll be reading our report on harvest specification for 2023-24, including final OFLs and ABCs. And, and before I start, I, I think it's important to note that the GAP has not evolved yet to the point where we can produce presentations on par with the GMT. Um, we have discussed um, quite in detail of providing our March 2022 reports as TikTok videos, so I just say uh, stay tuned for that. Um, so the GAP and the GMT discussed the 2324 specs and measures and consider the documents under this agenda item. The GAP recommends the following suggestions for council consideration. Under default harvest control rules, referencing GMT report one, the GAP supports adoption of default harvest control rules for all species except for the following. Sablefish. The GAP recommends a P star of 0.45 for sablefish as a PPA. However, the GAP agrees with the GMT that the range of alternatives is sufficient for analysis. As we noted in our September 2021 GAP report, the stock is healthy, as evidenced by the recent update stock assessment. Changing the P-star now to account for management uncertainty does not seem warranted. The stock assessment indicates the biomass is able to support a harvest strategy based on P.45. P-star equals 0.45. 
The council and GMP have both recognized the economic importance of this stock for open access, fixed gear, and tall fleets. The GAP sees little risk here of using a P star of 0.45, yet the rewards to fleets and coastal communities is immense. The GAP also discussed a P star of 0.40 out of concern for the long term management of the resource, uncertainty of crawl surveys during the COVID 19 pandemic, and current market conditions. To that, and the stock assessment does show improvement no matter which P star is selected. However, to provide the most opportunity and flexibility to all fleets across all three states, the GAP settled on a P star recommendation of 0.45. The GAP believes a lower alternative of P star equal 0.40 is sufficient to account for the uncertainty of the trawl survey data and therefore does not see the need for analysis of P star equal 0.35. Link type. The GAP suggests retaining P star equal 0.45 within the range for analysis and also as the PPA. It is important fishermen have access to link cod both north and south of 4010, given the special cutbacks with copper and pullback rockfish in California. GAP members have noted link cod is still abundant, but most of link cod have moved further offshore recently. Fishermen are not finding them as readily as in the past. However, the GAP supports the P star 0.45 as PPA to afford the most flexibility in the future as targeting on other stocks will likely be limited. For charter boat fishermen, this is especially important for creating fishing trips to attract customers. Access to link cod will be vital for southern, for south of Point Conception with the proposed reduction in copper and vermilion rockfish. Link cod can be selectively targeted, typically using larger baits and fishing pinnacles around the Channel Islands. Commercial GAP members that it appears link cod are starting to return to the near shore areas like sablefish, it is important to maintain opportunities to fish link cod. Oregon black rockfish. The GAP agrees with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife recommended case by case ABC alternative one for black rockfish as the PPA. As noted in September 2021 ODFW report, the default harvest control rule would likely constrain fisheries in 23 24 at a time when sport and commercial fishermen will need alternatives to traditional fisheries that aren't as abundant such as salmon. Furthermore, the new ODFW hydroacoustic survey will inform a new assessment. Spiny dogfish. As noted in our statement under agenda item E2, the GAP greatly appreciates the additional work undertaken to inform stock status of spiny dogfish. The additional work highlighted the effects of the West Coast bottom crawl survey Q on stock status. The spiny dogfish stock assessment demonstrates the stock has been stable for more than the past decade at current harvest levels. The assessment also projects that the stock will remain relatively stable in the near term if annual catch limits in 23 and 24 were set close to current ACL. Relative to the spiny dogfish decision table, the gap highlights this decision table is atypical in that the middle state of nature is not the most probable state. The SSC speaks to this in its report on groundfish stock assessment. And I have two SSC quotes here. The first the SSC also, also recommends that the low base and high state of nature not be assigned specific probabilities as is typically done with decision tables. And second quote, the SSC ground for subcommittee also discussed potential options for assigning weights to the states of nature in a revised decision table. Typically, the, these are assigned with higher weights to the middle state of nature and lower weights to the low and high states of nature. Options discussed included equal weights, declining weights from the low to high states of nature, and greater weights for the revised middle state of nature. Due to the uncertainty associated with distribution of revised states of nature, the graphic subcommittee recommends not assigning weights, and that ends those quotes. While the SSC chose not to assign probabilities to the various states of nature, the gap stresses that the additional work reviewed at the mop-up panel provided evidence that lower Q values were more plausible than higher Q values because of, among other things, seasonal migration patterns and the timing of the West Coast Broader Call Survey. The GAP recognizes the SSC recommended adoption of a new base model with Q fixed at 0.43, that is the middle state of nature. However, in setting harvest specifications, the GAP requests the council consider that the higher state of nature could be as plausible as the middle state, because that is supported by the additional analysis reviewed by the MOFA panel and could facilitate analysis of ACLs for 23-24 that are close to current ACL value. With that in mind, the GAP recommends the council add an additional alternative full ACL for 2021 and 2022 catches, P, of point, P star of 0.4 with full ACL from new middle state of 2.43 after that, which is the latter set of rows in the decision table and would include ACLs at 1456 metric tons and 1407 metric tons for 23 and 24 respectively. 
This alternative would be in addition to the new alternative proposed by the GMT. Including both of these alternatives for analysis would be informative and balance the need for stock conservation, the potential neg negative effects to numerous ground fish fisheries that could be constrained by Dr. Sensible Catch, and the necessity of new ground fish or, or new management measures for 2324. And I want to pause there to note that um, after we published this report, we found that the recommendations we made for a new alternative um, was actually not necessary. Um, and I will note that when the GAP developed our report, we wanted to include an alternative for analysis to provide contrast with the GMT alternative. It was our understanding that the new alternative we recommended was not in the current range. It appears that the GAP new alternative is the same as the no action alternative. In that case, the GAP recommends that the council adopt the range of alternatives recommended by the GMT and to not select a PPA at this time. Adoption of a preferred alternative would occur at the April 2022 council meeting based on information necessary to balance the need for stock conservation, the potential negative impacts of numerous groundfish fisheries that could be constrained by dogfish and snow catch, and the necessity of new managed measures for 2324. Uh, thank you for allowing me that correction to our statement. Moving on to vermilion and sunset rockfish. The GAP agrees that these rockfish are important stocks to commercial and recreational fishermen, particularly in Southern California, and recommends retaining a default harvest control rule of P-star 0.45 as the PPA. If the fleets are expected to move to the shelf to decrease pressure on nearshore stocks, it is important to keep these stocks available for flexibility in fishing operations. One charter representative noted these fish are ubiquitous and the problem with will be trying to avoid them. The GAP expects to make more comments under agenda item E5, management measures, regarding options for these stocks in order to maintain access while also keeping vermilion sunset biomass healthy. California fullback rockfish. The GAP understands this stock as overfished will be removed from the near shore complexes to a facilitator building plan that more detail and that more details will become available in April. The GAP expects to make more comments at that time. Copper rockfish south of point conception. At this point, the GAP supports the SSC recommendation, as noted in, in the supplemental SSC statement under this agenda item. Quote, after discussion, the ground for subcommittee recommendation is that two California assessments should be pooled for status determination. This results in an overall depletion of point, uh, sorry, 31.7% of unfished spawning stock biomass in Copper Rockers, California. Quote, quote. This would obviate the need for a re rebuilding plan while awaiting a full assessment in the next stock assessment cycle. And that ends the text of our report, which then follows is a table of uh, our recommendations and the GMT recommendations. I would just highlight again that under, for spiny dogfish, uh, the GAP recommendation here is for the council not to select the PPA at this time as to consider the preferred alternative in April 2022. Thank you, and I will answer questions to the best of my ability. Thank you, Dan, for a great report. Um, questions for Dan on the uh, GAP report? Corey Writings. Corey? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thanks, Dan, for being here. Good morning. Um, thanks for all the, the work that the GAP did on this and, and the GMT, too. Um, I, I'm trying to get a handle on some of the trade offs here. And the GAP, um, speaking specifically here about sable fish, and the, the, the gap noted um, a P star of 0.45 saying the reward to fleets and coastal communities is immense. And I, I'm trying to understand that in the context that attainment, um, as discussed earlier, has been somewhere between, I think, 74 and 82 percent. And thinking about that in context of the uncertainty around the surveys, um, uncertainty around the coastwide nature of the SOC, I'm curious if you could share with me some of the conversation that the gap had here um, and, and what that reward to the fleet and coastal communities might be. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Riding, uh, through Vice Chair Pettinger. I think uh, the, maybe the simplest response to that uh, good question is to, to sort of, and I think the gap tries to think about things collectively at, at the fleet, at the sector, at the fishery level. But also, to your question, I think it's really important to think about this at the individual level, so that, that while attainment of any one of, of, of our groundfish stocks might not be up to the ACL level in, in any one year, individual operators do often maximize their, their catch of any particular stock. Stable fish is a very important species. So, so for those participants in the stable fish fishery who are able to maximize their stable fish revenue, 
having these higher P-star values analyzed provides a snapshot of what those revenue uh, projections could be, not just at the fleet level, but also at that individual level, which I think is an important consideration. I hope that answers your question. It does, thank you. Okay, thank you, Corey. Uh, further questions for Dan? Okay, not seeing any hands. Thank you, Dan. That completes the uh, our advisory body's um, input. And uh, before we go to public comment, we're going to take a 15-minute um, break. And um, we'll, we'll just make it uh, 945. So it's a good thing I'm coming.
<clears throat> okay, it's uh, 9.45 and we're back in session and uh, we have uh, public comment coming up and uh, I believe uh, Chuck wants to uh, have a word with us, Chuck. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, let me uh, share my screen here. This will probably help a little bit. Um, so uh, for public comment on this agenda item, I, I just uh, want to know, we, we've got uh, maybe a question for a couple of the future public commenters. Uh, Frank, your city has signed up via Jamie Diamond. Jamie Diamond has already signed up independently. You know, our rules allow uh, one, one, one person to speak once. Uh, if you need to uh, include somebody else's uh, comments, you that should be done within the time allowed for yourself. So I'm just, I just want a little clarification. Um, Frank, are you planning to uh, speak yourself? Um, I'm not sure what the via Jamie Diamond um, means. Um, and if not, Jamie, uh, would you, uh, I just want you to be aware that uh, the, the comment your comment opportunity, if you're speaking for Frank, would need to include both your comments and what you have to say on behalf of Frank. So um, just uh, a question as to whether, uh, what, what, the, what the plan is there. If I can provide clarification, I didn't have, um, I didn't have, I rearranged my schedule, I'll be able to provide uh, my comment. It doesn't need to be provided via Jamie, thank you. That's great, thank you very much, Frank. Okay. Um, then I guess we can proceed with uh, public comment, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, Michelle Chuck. Robinson is up first. Okay, very good. And uh, first up is uh, Michelle Robinson. Michelle. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Uh, we can. Great, thank you. Good morning, uh, Vice Chair Penninger and Council Members. I am Michelle Robinson, a fisheries consultant, and I'm providing these comments on behalf of Fishing Vessel Owners Association, Ocean Ballad, and the Dana F. Bessaker Company. We support the GMT's recommendation for sable fish to include a lower HCR alternative of P star equals 0.35 in combination with an alternative of either 0.40 or 0.45. Um, we believe this is warranted because the degree of uncertainty in the 2021 Sablefish update is substantial and significantly higher than the level of uncertainty in the 2019 benchmark. While we believe this warrants additional precaution, we believe that it would also be good to examine this more closely through additional analysis, and that would hopefully provide the opportunity for a more informed uh, council decision on this in April. A P star of 0 0.35 corresponds to ABCs and ACLs of 9,412 metric tons in 2023 and 8,608 metric tons in 2024, which are 16 to 33% higher than the ACLs in 2021 and 2022, and would be the highest ACLs ever adopted for this stock. We want to note that we have two separate concerns with the results of the 2021 Sable Fish update. Number one, the modeled current depletion level, so the status of the stock today, and number two, the effect of that on the projected status trend. Both of these relate to the increase in scale for spawning biomass. The last benchmark assessment in 2019 was largely driven by a strong recruitment event in 2016. Because NOAA was not able to survey groundfish in 2020 due to COVID, this high recruitment event could not be verified. However, in speaking with fixed gear sablefish harvesters, they have not seen a substantial increase in smaller sablefish off the West Coast to the degree that they have in the North Pacific. Because of the increase in scale for spawning biomass, the estimate of B0 increased by 14%. 
this produces an estimate of current spawning biomass that is substantially higher, 46% higher in the 2021 update for 2019 than it had been in the 2019 benchmark. As a result, the depletion level for 2019 increased from 39%, so just under the 40% target in the 2019 benchmark, up to 50% in the 2021 update. The retrospective re review also suggests that the stock had never been below 40% depletion, whereby the 2019 benchmark indicated that the stock had been below 40% each year from 2011 to 2019. Additionally, the magnitude of the estimated change in depletion in the forward projection goes from 58% in 2021 to 50% in 2031 under the default PSTAR of 0.45. And the reason for this large change is twofold. One, the model assumes attainment of total catch each year and two, the model sets catch limits to target a depletion level of 40%. So in addition to having higher catches due to the assumed higher spawning biomass, those catch limits are also inflated because the model is trying to fish down the stock to get from the assumed depletion level of 58% to the target depletion of 40%. So to be clear, our clients um, support efforts to achieve that target level when there is greater confidence in the status of the stock. Our recommendation for precaution is driven by the uncertainty in the 2021 update, which is again higher than the uncertainty that was in the 2019 benchmark. And I just want to thank you again for the opportunity to provide comments and I'd be happy to address any questions. Thank you, Michelle. Um Questions um, for Michelle on her testimony? I don't see I can't see any questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no hands, uh, thank you, Michelle. Um, next up will be uh, Ben Itkinap. Ben? Good morning, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the Council. I am Ben Enticknap representing Oceana. I want to speak to copper and quillback rockfish in the issues of stock complexes and stock delineation. Uh, first, I wanted to say that we appreciate your decision on Tuesday to adopt the California copper rockfish and quillback assessments. I know that was a difficult decision. Both assessments find these populations are depleted and they both indicate biological overfishing has been occurring in recent years, meaning that the council must now begin the hard work to, to develop annual catch limits and conservation measures to end overfishing and rebuild these depleted stocks. First, regarding stock complexes, Oceana supports the GMT recommendations to consider removing any species designated as overfished from a complex and to consider removing copper and quillback rockfish from the nearshore rockfish complex north. Given that the catch levels uh, there have repeatedly exceeded their species specific overfishing limits and are stocks of major concern due, due to their vulnerability scores. The GMT also recommended the council consider removing quillback from the nearshore rockfish south complex because the data show annual mortality for the species has exceeded the species specific OFL contribution every year in the last four years. And so for all the same reasons, uh, we request the council also consider removing copper rockfish from the nearshore rockfish south complex. Uh, copper rockfish have vulnerability scores uh, that highlight they're of major concern to being overfished. They're some of the highest vulnerability scores of, of all West Coast groundfish species. The population south of Conception is depleted as evident by the assessment adopted Tuesday. And the stock assessment found biological overfishing of copper rockfish south of Point Conception in nine of the last 10 years. Uh, so again, just want to stress we're asking that you also remove copper rockfish uh, from the nearshore rockfish south complex. But overall, uh, we appreciate that the council is considering removing vulnerable rockfish populations from the larger stock complexes. This is a very important step for sustainable fishery management 
And given the risk of overfishing, we urge you to not delay this action to another process, at least for the purpose of these uh, vulnerable near, near shore rockfish species. Regarding stock delineation, um, the information provided under this agenda item E3 attachment four and E3 attachment five suggest that copper and quillback rockfish have small home ranges closely associated with local nearshore reefs and kelp forests. The evidence suggests adult movements are minimal from hundreds of meters to just a few kilometers. Their populations are isolated by distance and that there's likely significant population subdivision along the west coast with limited movement and exchange. Uh, we also know that copper and quillback are highly vulnerable to localized depletion and overfishing, and as such, we caution against ignoring their spatial structure and management. Uh, as you know, disregarding population structure can allow overfishing and severe depletion of spatial components, uh, stock collapse, and failure to rebuild. So we, we support the recommendation from the SSC to manage quillback separately off California, consistent with the assessment reflecting the scientific scientific information on stock structure. However, we're concerned by the recommendation to combine the two California copper rockfish assessments. It was clear the burden of proof in this case was placed on proving they are two separate stocks rather than proving they are not. And we're also troubled by the process of how this decision uh, is being made, which came only after reviewing a rebuilding analysis that suggested the population would need to be rebuilt in 10 years as required by the law with very low fishing limits. In the event, however, that copper rockfish uh, south is pooled with the uh, other copper rockfish assessment off California for the purpose of status determination and rebuilding plan is not adopted, we recommend that fishing mortality nonetheless be reduced and limited. We recommend the council adopt a lower P star value resulting in a larger buffer between the OFL and ABC. We recommend annual catch limits lower than the ABC and that you adopt area-based management measures that limit copper rockfish mortality south of conception proportional to the assessments. And I just want to stress, I, I know this is not easy, uh, but we urge the council to act now to avoid further depletion of these rockfish populations that could ultimately result in stricter cash limits later in the future. So this is hard work uh, and we appreciate your attention to these important issues. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, questions for Ben on his testimony? Okay, seeing none. Um, next up is um, Jamie Diamond. Jamie? Good morning, uh, Chairman and Council Members. I am here today to speak with you about copper rockfish. My name is Jamie Diamond. I own Stardust and Coral Sea Sport Fishing Vessels out of Santa Barbara, California, and I'm on the Board of Directors for the Sport Fishing Association of California. I'm a mother of three young kids in local public schools, an elected school board member, PTA president, coordinator for the local food bank, and just took over ownership of the landing our vessels and others operate from. I say all that so you understand the humanity here, the impact to lives, jobs, revenue, and coastal fishing communities lost, and the value of us as people to our communities potentially lost if this moves forward as is. This is so rushed, I haven't had time to calculate solid numbers, but back of the napkin math says we're looking at a best case loss revenue of $60 million. Worst case would be a loss of boats and landings from the larger LA area to the Oregon border. Magnuson Stevenson Act says to manage using best available science. Beyond best available science, the act also says we must take into consideration the economic hardship on a community. I am begging you to declare this a disaster because that's what it is. The amount of fish out there has not been captured in this assessment. We are fishing in areas that haven't been touched in over a decade. Of course, catch is going to go up. It's littered with copper and vermilion for that matter, and they're huge. You could call our area in the Santa Barbara Channel Islands the cradle of life for ground fish, the convergence of RCAs, CCAs, MPAs, and the volume of fish sitting there far outweighs what is reflected in what can only be described as the most negligent assessment that has come across this council in some time. Calling the assessment data moderate is being far too generous. The data isn't even skewed. The data simply isn't relevant. Much of it was taken from local boats and is not representative in any way, shape, or form of the biomass. Furthermore, these assessments are so far off, we will be having to descend 10 times the amount of fish we can keep. 
I'm formally requesting no matter what is decided, we get proper descending device credits. Many here in the advisory bodies and on your virtual dais have openly admitted the data moderate assessment was a terrible decision and is not reflective of the stock. They wish they could just throw it away. Well, I'm asking you to declare a disaster and do just that. To remove or limit us on copper rockfish, the way that is being spoken of will have devastating effects on the sport fishing industry in California who rely heavily on ground fish, especially in areas like where we are. Our business in Santa Barbara does not get to access most of the highly migratory fish such as tuna and yellowtail. We rely on rockfish from March 1st through December 31st. Vermilions and coppers are the largest component of our bags. Over the years, we have reduced to two hooks 10 in the RGC complex, now five sub bag limit on reds, vermilion, excuse me. We had our prime fishing grounds ripped out from under us with the promise it would never happen again, but here we are again, more bad science, RCAs, CCAs, or maybe now we're gonna call that the coral conservation area. I say no more. No more pulling projects out of hats, creating more problems and solutions. No more taking our ocean for pet projects. No more accepting bad science. I need you, the council, to be brave and strong, stand up for what is right, and make the changes you know need to happen with this process. There's no more room for the our hands are tied statements. We would have a whole team of speakers here today, except we're also having to fight the California Air Resources Board this week. They intend to either see CPFBs go out of business or have us scrap our wooden fiberglass boats to build four to $5 million steel vessels to accommodate an engine and emission system that doesn't even exist. I know that has nothing to do with you, but this is what we are facing as sport boat owners and operators. We are under attack from all sides right now. All we want to do is take people fishing. Why does something so simple have to be so complicated? We are going to lose boats and businesses over this. There has to be a better way. If you choose to move forward, then we need to bring into the discussion the need for disaster relief funds for our fleet that rely on this important ground fish for local trips, full day trips, and multi-day. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Um... Questions for Jamie on her testimony? Um, Mark, uh, Chair Grelnick, Mark. <clears throat> thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, I just wanna thank Jamie for her testimony and let her know that it's it's being heard. Thank you, Mark. Any uh, further questions or comments for Jamie? Okay, thank you, Jamie, for your testimony. Um, next up, uh, Bob Alverson. Bob? Yes, Mr. Chairman, can you uh, hear me? A little louder would be nicer. Is testing? One, two, three. Is that, okay? Is that better? Gotcha. Okay. So, Mr. Chairman, for the record, my name is Bob Alverson. I'm representing Fishing Vessel Owners Association. And our, our comments are, are, are focused on, on sablefish, uh, pea star uh, analysis. Um, we would support uh, the range of alternatives, uh, P45, P40, and P35 being uh, analyzed. Uh, and we'd just like to end with, uh, over the long term, we would recommend um, a, P, a P star of 40. Um, and our rationale is this, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, and we uh, are look. We received a, a report on the status of sablefish out of Alaska, and their their trends are similar to the trends off Washington, Oregon, and California with regards to successful spawning incidences. The last major spawning positive spawning incident took place about 1976. The next time we saw a major spawning uh, event. Um, was 2016, 40 years apart. Now there were above average spawning events between there, but those spawning events only helped maintain or slow the decline of the harvest of ABCs during that 40 year stretch. And um, I'm sure an F45 would not injure this resource uh, in, at least in the next couple of years. But when you look at, if, if the past is prologue, uh, and the, and if this resource replicates what has occurred in the past, it 
it goes a long time between major spawning events to to uh, um, supplement itself. So we recommend a uh, uh, a long term uh, more conservative uh, harvest uh, concept, uh, which we think uh, in the long term uh, preferred action from our organization would uh, be a P star of 40. Mr. Chairman, that completes uh, our comments on this and um, we'll stand by for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, questions for Bob on his testimony? Okay, seeing none. Thanks, Bob. Yep, uh, thanks. Next up is uh, Frank uh, Ercity. Frank? I think you're muted, Frank. All right, good morning, members of the council. My name is Frank Ercity, owner of H&M Landing. I also serve on the board of directors for the Sport Fishing Association of California. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to provide comments on the copper on copper and vermilion rockfish. I wanted to express my concerns today over proposed bag reduction on vermilion and the assessment data used to manage copper. To call this data moderate is incredibly irresponsible and flies in the face of science. Using incomplete and ir irrelevant information to manage such a vital species for the Southern California CPFV fleet makes anyone question the reason for this management body. We acknowledge the data was obtained during a pandemic and only from a limited number of trips. We recognize data was obtained on trips that do not provide a true snapshot of the biomass. Data was collected on half day and local trips, which is nowhere near a true representation of this biomass. The real problem here is the institution, not the resource. Set-asides are massive where copper and vermilion thrive up and down our coast. MPAs, CCAs, and RCAs. Let's work on the real problem, and that's gathering accurate data to better manage our resources. Let's look at creating a process that captures a true assessment in, the re in real time by those that are on the water daily accessing the species we are attempting to manage. The Magnuson-Stevens Act calls for managing fisheries using the best available science while taking into consideration the economic impact of the communities that rely on the managed species. If we move forward using current junk data, I request you all begin the process of asking for disaster relief funds for the 135 Southern California by CPFV owners and the landings they operate from. Moving forward as proposed with this data is irresponsible and not in keeping with the Magnuson-Stevenson's Act. I urge this council to act responsibly and sensibly and take into consideration the economic impact this will have as a result of this unnecessary reduction in bag. Recognize the data you're being presented is insufficient at best, less than poor, and in no way should be used to manage copper and vermilion. I request no action at this time. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Frank. Uh, questions for Frank on his testimony? Okay. Thanks, Frank. Uh, next up is uh, Tom Schiff. Tom? Can you hear me okay, Vice Chair? Ooh, we can now. Okay, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, committee members. Well, then mainly to uh, comment on the great report by Lynn, I think it was. I am one who tries to stay up with ground fish, and I'm telling you, it's not easy. And I've been out on the water fishing for them. I, uh, I guess I go back initially to the old school. It was all red snapper. In any event, I thought her report was beautifully done in the in the, uh, in the sense that she used the different colors, which I think can highlight the species of most concern something akin to what the habitat uh, directors or committee does with their stop sign report and i just can't say enough about how good that i think i would like to comment on the current situation and the uh, apparently very sharp controversy about uh, the uh, the past survey or fish assessment stock assessment this somehow reminds me a bit of going to a 
that workshop over to the Prophet Science Center, or chaired by Dr. Elaine Punt. This was on the sardine assessment, and that showed uh, very, very questionable uh, validity in that they were surveying beyond the three-mile limit, and most of the subject uh, species was inside the three-mile limit. Fortunately, he was able to take into effect the cow wildlife surveys, aerial surveys, and use some uh, uh, well, knowledge of models and, and modeling to uh, come up with a good solution. So I, uh, from what I've heard, um, and again, I, I, can, I can respect that the survey may have been hampered by uh, certainly COVID and shutdown matters of that, but uh, I, I think the, the people that I heard speak know as much about the ocean as uh, anybody conducting the surveys. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, questions for Tom on his testimony? Okay, seeing none, um, that takes us to um, council action. And um, I'll uh, open up the uh, floor for discussion. Okay, uh, Maggie Summer, Maggie. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, my apologies, trying to move through all my multiple materials. I will start uh, by again expressing uh, much gratitude toward everyone who has put together so much complex information uh, for us to um, consider today. It has been really e extremely, it's, I, I will say it's been difficult to put all the pieces together, but it has been very helpful and I, I appreciate the way that has been presented to us. Um, I, I'm going to start with uh, what I think is a um, uh, relatively uh, low-hanging fruit comment. This is just uh, for information. I wanted to note that in E3, uh, Supplemental Revised Attachment 1, I Right. Uh, for quillback rockfish in Oregon in 2023 and 2024, the OFL and ABC are slightly different than the values presented in September because they're based on updated projections uh, using more accurate estimates of mortality in 2021 and 2022. Um, and my apologies, I have I had made myself a note to uh, alert you all to this. Um, and forgot that the SSC had called it out in their statement too. So they have uh, taken care of, of this task of informing you for me. I, if anyone has any questions on that, I would be happy to respond to them. Uh, but I think with that, I'll stop and allow our discussion to move on to issues that I suspect will be uh, of much more interest for council discussion today. Thanks. Thank you, Peggy. Um, further discussion? Uh, Joe, uh, Joe Oban, Joe. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And I, I, I too want to uh, express my appreciation to uh, the uh, materials uh, that the GMT uh, provided. Uh, that were uh, very useful in terms of being able to really uh, easily follow uh, the information and what was being recommended. So I, I just wanted to Express that. Uh, so the comment that I have um, for the council under uh, discussion for this item uh, regards sablefish. For sablefish, the tribes are supportive of the no action alternative for sablefish uh, of these star of 0.45. We would also vote in favor of having a key star of 0.40 analyzed for consideration at future council meetings. The tribes do not feel that a P star of 0.35 fulfills the treaty rights of the tribes and are not in favor of further analysis. The treaty sablefish allocation is based on a catch accounting exercise that occurred that indicated that 20% of the sablefish north harvestable population 
would be available within the treaty territory area during the fishing season. Through the federally recognized treaties, the tribe reserved 50% of the harvestable surplus, which when paired with the Ketchik County exercise results in the 10% treaty allocation. The tribes have reviewed the stock assessment endorsed by the SSC and associated risk. Uh, the stock is increasing coastwide from Alaska to California. The assessment that the council received is robust, such that regardless of the trajectory of, the, of that stock they're going through, uh, the tribe cannot say any need to buffer for additional risk for the stock. In conclusion, the tribes will support analysis of a P-star of 0.45 and a P-star of 0.4. We cannot support further analysis of a P-star of 0.35. Thank you for the opportunity to provide those uh, comments. Uh, thank you, Joe. Um, further discussion? Mr. Mike, have a mic. Send it to him. Keely Cat Keely. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. I have a few comments to provide relative to number three on the council action list. Um, I'm happy to hold those if others have comments specific to one and two, or I could offer those now. Um, I don't see any hands behind you, uh, so uh, let's, why don't you go ahead. Thank you. I did want to provide a few comments related to item number three on the council action list, which is providing guidance on stock complex restructuring. Wanted to first start off with um, a big thank you for the extensive and comprehensive work of the GMT on this particular issue in the stock complex report, as well as the uh, very thorough presentation provided today. That information put together will be key in understanding how our stock complex management structure is working. And I want to recognize um, what I know was the significant workload that it took to get to the information that was presented today. I'd also like to note that um, we recommend the council consider removing any overfish species from the stock complexes to allow direct management under a rebuilding plan. We think the council should consider whether additional conservation and management is warranted for stocks in complexes, specifically those with category one and two assessments that have had their OFL contributions repeatedly exceeded in recent years. However, we recognize the considerable workload reevaluating stock complexes and the trickle down effects of any large scale changes to complexes, including those that are allocated to the shoreside IFQ sector, could amount to. And as such, while we recognize the, the benefits of a comprehensive evaluation and consideration of significant changes, we think that is likely beyond the scope of what is possible in this biennium at the stage we are at at the November meeting. So for the 2023-2024 biennium, we would encourage the council to consider the recommendation of the GMT for some targeted management measures to reduce mortality of specific stocks in complexes that have had their OFL contributions exceeded, but we would look for further discussion about how, to, how and when to tackle a more comprehensive evaluation outside of the scope of this specific specs biennium. Happy to answer any questions or have any further discussion on those points, but I wanted to share them with the council. Thank you. Thank you, Keely. Um, further discussion? Uh, Maggie Summer, Maggie? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I'd like to come back to this uh, question of um, the Sablefish P-Star alternative of 0 0.35. Uh, I am hearing uh, a considerable amount of, of uh, discussion of, about that alternative and uncertainty about whether that uh, additional level of 
uh, reduction from the default specifications uh, is is warranted um, relative to the uncertainties in the assessment. Um, and I just wanted to maybe uh, re revisit that question. Uh, I'd be interested in uh, hearing perspectives from other council members. Uh, if anyone has any to share, uh, I will say um, in my recollection of the SSC's, com their, our presentation on the stock assessment uh, and the SSC's comments on the update assessment, uh, I believe there were some improvements in the assessment and there was uh, general confidence in the outcomes of that assessment uh, even given some of the uh, uncertainties such as the lack of 2020 survey data. So, uh, you know, I, I, I would certainly want to move forward with the uh, no action alternative and the P star of 0.4 alternative for analysis. Uh, and I, I would welcome hearing any uh, input from other council members on retention of a 0.35 and, and whether that uh, is determined to be necessary at this time or not. Yeah, thanks, Maggie. Um, Marcy Ripko, Marcy? Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you, Maggie, for the lead in. Um, I too am comfortable uh, with a range to include um, 0.45 and 0.4 um, for the reasons you suggest. I, I think there is some um, basis for uh, uncertainty in the fact that there's a lack of survey data um, that was included um, that does um, suggest some uncertainty um beyond where we're at today so that that alternative to me is is reasonable um you know i i think about our management measures and i think about this stock and i think about our history with both assessment and management of this stock and i'm gonna guess that if it's not the <laughs> most scrutinized um and most closely and carefully managed stock um, among our uh, ground fish species managed under the FMP, um, I, I'd be quite surprised. Um, we have worked so hard to develop management measures that really are effective in ensuring that we um, attain and not exceed uh, this resource. Um, we've uh, allocated um, according to our plans and we track individual pots of fish and manage them um, in season uh, very closely. Um, so I find there to be very little uh, risk with our management approaches that um, cause me pause. Um, as for um, the overall risk of uh, or the overall probability of overfishing. Um, I think because we have spent um, so much uh, energy and focus on um, assessing stable, stable fish um, over numerous cycles, it's always a high priority for us um, on our uh, assessment lists because it's such an important uh, resource, um, both um, to our fisheries and communities, uh, as well as to the ecosystems uh, that um, that it uh, resides in. So um, I'm feeling like I have a great deal of comfort um, with that um, more narrow range uh, in P star values and um, would uh, support your suggestion to not include 0.35 in the alternatives. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Um, Heather Hall. Um, actually, Maggie, your hand's still up. Did, uh, ah, um, Heather. Great. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair, and, and thank you, um, 
Maggie, for teeing up this discussion. I know it's uh, something we've all been thinking a lot about. Um, and I want to just start by saying we're at the, um, the stage in the biennial specs process where um, we look at a range of alternatives and can select a PPA. Um, we don't take final action for a while. And in, in my mind, that um, simply, in, for that reason, speaks to having a range that has a good bookend. Um, and I see that as being 0 0.35 to help us um, understand the analysis. It just, it broadens the analysis and help, helps us make a good decision when the final decision comes. And so I'm um, just speaking now and in, in, in support of keeping um, 0 0.35 in for, for simply informing our decision. Um, in addition to that, um, the reason why we wanna be precautionary or we want to look at precautionary alternatives is um, just the big change from the, the last several assessments. Um, it's, it's, it's no longer in the precautionary zone and, and even saying that they're, they're, the stock was never in the precautionary zone. Um, we also had no stock assessment in 2020 and, or excuse me, no uh, survey in 2020 to, to inform the stock assessment um, and only half of a survey in 2019. So taking some time um, to get those data points um, for the next assessment, I think is, is really important. Um, we can see from um, recruitments in the North Pacific um, that they can be sporadic and so, I just think weighing all of those things um, right now in, at the point we are in the process, um, eliminating the P star of 0.35 is, is too soon. And I, I would really like to see that. I, I spoke to the GMT um, presentation this morning and the, um, the challenge with understanding the economic analysis, and I'd really like to give the GMT time to um, to look at that and respond to those questions. I I know um, we heard that they said they could do that, and uh, so I think it's just uh, too soon to take P star of 0.35 out of the range. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Um, Pete Asmer. Pete. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Yes, I, I guess to weigh in on that a little bit, I would support moving forward with this two alternatives, the status quo of the 0.45 and an alternative of 0.4. I, I understand the, the rationale for uh, why we have the 0.35 in there. Um, in, in getting to my position on this, I look hard at the decision table that was included in the documents and, and referred back to um, the 2019 when we had the same set of discussions regarding the 2020-2021 biennium. And, and there was a lot of discussion about the decision tables in there. And, and I understand um, concerns regarding the, the risks, the uncertainty, excuse me, in the assessments and the need for the assessments. And, and I support those assessments. But at this time, looking at the status of the stock, um, I, I think it's, it's very much warranted to just go with those two alternatives, 0 0.4 and 0.45. And um, I, I guess I, I have, don't have an objection to a preliminary preferred of 0.4. I, I think there's a rationale for that, um, as well as a rationale for a 0.45. But in terms of the current biennium, we're looking at uh, the 23-24 and what might happen then in future years. This is a long-lived species, um, even at a point, P star of 0.4. 
catches will or the ABC would be substantially higher than it is in the current biennium and um, any fish left in the water are available in the future and and it's hard to look forward to that that next biennium um, but there we'd consider a different set of P stars then again so anyway I I think because of the status of the stock we can narrow it down to the two P stars of 0.4 and 0.45. Thanks. Thank you, Pete. Um, Heather, I see your hand still up. Did you uh, put it back up after? Okay, very good. Uh, Krista Swenson. Krista? Yes. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, so I am going to fall in the camp uh, alongside um, WDFNW in, in uh, favor of uh, 0.35, and um, really it, it's the same um, points that I agree with that have already been outlined, and so I'm not going to run through all of those um, to save us all some time, um, but I do also want to reflect for a moment on the fact that it is a subgroup of industry stakeholders that are making this request um, to be a bit more conservative. Um, and I, I would like to respect their wish for that. I, I recognize it's not everybody. Um, I certainly am not opposed to having something else chosen as a preferred alternative or you know, preferred choice, but I do think that uh, taking a look at that in the analysis space is definitely worth considering and, and I'm very supportive of keeping it in. Thank you. Thank you, Krista. Um, Phil Anderson, Phil? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I'm finding myself in the same place as Krista, and for similar reasons. Uh, I think um, uh, prelim preliminary uh, preferred at 0.4. Um, I will be prepared to support that. Uh, it's put forward. I would like to keep the range um, on the table for now. Uh, we are going to be, as I think Mr. Hassemer mentioned, we're going to be um, at higher levels, and I think I mentioned this before in some previous questioning about uh, the analysis relative to jobs. Um, we're going to be at a higher level of uh, ACL than we've been in, in, a, in a long time. And uh, so just an opportunity for everybody to carefully think through here uh, how we react to um, the higher levels that are being um, uh, that are coming out of the stock assessment um, seems to me to make sense. I know there's a lot of, there's opposition to 0 0.035 and whether that, you know, what where, where we end up at the end of the day, I'm not sure, but, um, but I think it's worth keeping it in the mix and just carefully considering where we end up with this. As we all know, sable fish is a really important stock to a lot of different fisheries and uh, we need to take care of it. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Phil. Uh, further discussion? Okay. Um, Maggie Summer. Maggie? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I'd, I'd like to let you know that um, I will be prepared to offer a motion, uh, but it will take me a, a few minutes to put some final pieces together and, and get it to Sandra. So happy to do that. If the while the council is uh, while we are continuing to discuss, or uh, if you take a, a break, I could do it at that time. But I did want to let you know that uh, I, I will have one prepared shortly. Okay. Um... Maggie, is it you're talking about five minutes, 10 minutes? Uh, it, it would just, it would probably take me five minutes, Chair. Thank you. I'd... Okay. Um, well, if I don't see any hands, um, we'll take a break for five minutes and um, come back at 10.40. Um,
Okay, it's uh, 1040, and uh, Maggie, do you, uh, do you have a uh, motion? Thank you, Vice Chair. I have sent it, so if it has made its way to Sandra or Chris, I am ready when they are. The ether's a little slow today, but I'm sure we'll get here. Okay, Maggie, when you're ready. Thank you very much, Vice Chair. I move that Council adopt <clears throat> For all ground fish stocks, adopt the OFLs for 2023 and 2024 and stock categories presented in E3A Supplemental Revised Attachment 1 as final. For all ground fish stocks other than those listed below in number 4 and Quillback Rockfish in California, adopt the P-STAR, ABC, and ACL values for 2023 and 2024 in E3 Supplemental Revised Attachment 1 as final. For the stocks listed below, adopt the range of default and alternative P-STAR, ABC, and ACL values for 2023 and 2024 in E3A Supplemental GMT Presentation 1, except use the area delineations and values for vermilion and sunset rockfish in E3 Supplemental Revised Attachment 4. Identify the following alternatives as preliminary preferred. Sablefish coastwide, Alternative 1, ACL equal to ABC, P star of 0.4. Lincod north of 4010, Alternative 1, ACL equal to ABC, P star of 0.45. Lincod south of 4010, Alternative 1, ACL equal to ABC, P star of 0.45. Oregon black rockfish, Alternative 1, ACL equal to ABC at 512 metric tons. Pacific spiny dogfish, no preliminary preferred alternative at this time. Vermilion and sunset rockfish in California, south of Point Conception, no action. ACL equal to ABC, P star of 0.45. Vermilion and sunset rockfish in California, north of Point Conception, no action. ACL equal to ABC, P star of 0.45. Vermilion rockfish in Oregon, no action, ACL equal to ABC, P star 0.45, and vermilion rockfish in Cal, pardon me, in Washington, no action, ACL equal to ABC, P star 0.45. Noting that all reports referenced in this motion are from November 2021. Okay, thank you, Maggie. Does the uh, language on the screen accurately reflect your motion? It does. Okay, uh, looking for a second. Second by uh, Marcy Remco. Thank you, Marcy. Um, can we speak to your motion, please? Thank you very much, Vice Chair. Yes, uh, again, uh, this really is, is built on uh, a tremendous amount of work by the SSC, the GMT, the GAP, public input, the National Marine Fishery Service and council members, and I appreciate uh, all of that information and input um, and hope that after I have conclu concluded, perhaps uh, council members from Washington or California uh, would invite them to add anything they have regarding the stocks uh, specific to areas off their states. Uh, the uh, regarding the defaults all adopted in uh, numbers one and two in this motion, these uh, are the default harvest control rules and the uh, values that result from their application. These harvest control rules were established in Amendment 24, uh, and they have been applied here to the best scientific information we have on stock biomass status and yield resulting from the most recent assessment of each stock. Uh, they have been endorsed by the SSC. And I'll just note that California quillback rockfish will be addressed in a separate motion. 
regarding the alternative harvest control rules and specifications uh, addressed in items number three, item number three. The intent here is to provide an adequate range for analysis to address conservation and socioeconomic concerns stemming from assessment uncertainty, stock utilization, fishery circumstances, and other factors. The SSC endorsed the alternative projections in attachment three and supplemental revised attachment four. And those are uh, what are reflected as well in GM, supplemental GMT presentation one, uh, except that the area delineations of vermilion and sunset rockfish uh, differ between those two and are, uh, we should be focusing here on the area delineations for those docks as laid out in supplemental revised attachment four. Uh, I will note that all of the default harvest control rules are included in the range for analysis. And in addition uh, to the alternatives that were uh, reviewed in supplemental revised attachments four, as well as attachment three, I am including the GMT alternative one for spiny dogfish. This would be slightly more precautionary than the default in recognition of the uncertainty associated with the assessment results and decision table. Regarding the inclusion of the uh, alternative with a sablefish P star of 0.35, I appreciate the advisory body and public input and the council discussion and acknowledge the considerable uncertainty about whether it's necessary to include this additionally precautionary alternative at this time. This motion does propose retaining it for analysis to further explore the need for a reduction from the default of this magnitude. Uh, it does seem to me that a P star of 0.4 is adequately conservative, particularly in light of the management approaches that Marcy reminded us of, as well as the fact that we anticipate assessing this high priority stock frequently. In addition, as shown in the projections in supplemental revised attachment four, there is little difference in the risk to the stock uh, and between alternatives in terms of the impact on stock status. However, given the strong interest expressed in further analysis and review, I have included it here. Rationale for the preliminary preferred alternative selections is as follows. For Sablefish Coastwide, um, alternative one, the P star of 0.4. Again, with the range proposed, we will have several options to apply uh, various levels of precaution due to changes in the new assessment. And as I just said, uh, based on the information we have up to this time, uh, I believe that P star of 0.4 is most appropriate. For Lincod, uh, north of 4010 and south of 4010, the alternatives, alternative one for each with a P star of 0.45. As noted in the GMT uh, report and presentation, there was high uncertainty in scale in stock size in the assessments, war warranting some precaution in an approach to setting specifications uh, however, a category two sigma does provide some buffer for uncertainty in the OFL estimate resulting uh, from the assessment. Uh, it, that uh, would seem to be adequate and a P star of 0.5 as preliminary preferred uh, is appropriate at this time. Again, noting that the default of, uh, we, we are retaining, pardon me, we are retaining 0.4 in the range. Uh, I may have just uh, misspoken in my characterization. I am. And in the uh, motion wording, I will uh, highlight this. Those stocks identified uh, as PPA for Lincod North and South, the intent is to uh, select P star of 0.45 as the PPA. And I, uh, the motion language labels those as alternative one. And uh, in fact, 
they should be the no action alternatives there. So if that requires uh, an amendment to the motion to correct that, uh, I, I would flag that for attention after I conclude my remarks, which I will do shortly. Returning to rationale for the PPA, uh, briefly, we have uh, ODFW has described uh, rationale for considering the uh, black rockfish alternative um, and the GMT and GAP supported that. I note that there is a, a very small difference in the 10-year depletion estimate between uh, the projection between the alternative projections, and this was endorsed by the SSC. I'm not proposing a, a PPA for specific spiny dogfish at this time, uh, given the, the interest in further analysis of the alternatives before a determination of a, a preference between them. And then for all of the vermilion uh, uh, rockfish stocks here, the PPA is identified as a uh, P star of 0.45. The GMT pointed out uh, the issue of catch exceeding OFL contributions to the complex, uh, but I believe that the appropriate place to address that is uh, via management measures rather than specifications. Recall that we have been managing to the complex specifications rather than focusing management on uh, component stocks, and this certainly has brought uh, the potential need to do that to our attention. Uh, and a P-STAR choice will not address the issue uh, of reducing catch. Again, management measures seem to me the appropriate place to do that. I think with that, I will uh, conclude my remarks. Um, and again, ap apologies for the error in the description in, in labeling the LINCOD North and South PPA as alternative one when I believe it should be no action to reflect the P star of 0.45. Yeah, thank you, Maggie. We probably, sh probably should do that. So is someone willing to amend the motion to uh, make that change? Pete Asper, Pete? Yes, thank you, my, Mr. Vice Chair. Before asking any questions, I'd like to move to amend the motion. Um, Chris or Sandra, whoever's typing, it's probably easiest to do this with strikeout, but uh, I move to amend the motion as follows. In item four, for both Lincoln North and South, of 4010 North Latitude, replace alternative one, the, the language alternative one, with the words status quo. Thank you, Pete. Does the language on the screen accurately reflect your uh, motion? Yes, it does. Okay, looking for a second. Second by Heather Hall. Thank you, Heather. Um, Pete, I don't know if you need to speak to it, but <laughs> I'll no, let you. No, just a simple correction. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't see any hands to speak, so um, all those in favor uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, the uh, the amendment passes unanimously. Okay, so we're back to the uh, an amended motion on the floor and for discussion. So looking for a hand. Keely Kent, Keely. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I had a question for the maker of the motion, um, specifically on item one, and wondering whether the um, exception that is included for quillback rockfish of California um, under item number two should also be there under item number one. Um, my question is specifically whether or not um, if there are you know, further action on Quillback Rockfish off of California, if that should be considered separately for OFLs as well as ABCs and ACLs. Thanks. Maggie, oh, I see John DeVore has his hand up. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I, 
I, I don't recommend changing the language simply because um, in our analysis, when we analyze the no action alternative, um, in, depending on what the council does ultimately decide on California Quill back, the values that are in revised attachment one, the 4010 adjustment and all of that would um, inform the no action alternative and, um, and managing it in complexes is part of the no action alternative as well. So I, I do expect that we'll see another motion here uh, regarding California Quillback as, as Maggie uh, spoke to, but um, I, I, I don't really have any concerns with including those values in revised attachment one, since we do need that for the no action alternative. Thank you, John. Uh, Maggie? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you to Keeley for the question uh, and to John for your response. Uh, I had not exempted California Quillback Rockfish from number one uh, based on, on guidance or thinking similar to what John just presented. Uh, but on, on further thought, uh, as you asked your question, I would like to highlight the fact that um, this motion does specify that those are final and maybe ask uh, Mr. DeVore to confirm that you, you, this is, it is uh, okay to proceed with the motion as is, which would include Quillback Cal Rockfish off California in that motion without uh, revision. And again, thanks Keely for the, the question and possibly the catch. So um, my, my, my answer to that is that, um, you know, any, any alternatives that you adopt that depart from the default harvest control rule, for example, all those listed under uh, item number four, but presumably including uh, California Quillback um, when we see uh, subsequent emotion, uh, subsequent motions. Um, I don't really see that as a problem because I think it's it's really uh, understood that um, that's not a those values aren't final uh, preferred alternatives for those that are still being considered for alternative harvest control rules. So I'm, I don't really quibble with that language. I think it's well understood. But if others have a problem with that, uh, for the record, um, I won't quibble with that either. Maggie. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, and thank you, John. Uh, I, I guess uh, if it helps, uh, as the maker of the motion, I will uh, state that my intent would be uh, certainly to allow for consideration of alternative harvest control rules, including for California quillback rockfish, and also for adjustment to the nearshore rockfish uh, complexes um, if quillback rockfish is removed for those, I believe those values would also need adjustment. So that that would be my intent. Okay. Um, further discussion? All right. Uh, Mar oh, Marcy Remco. Marcy. Um, yes, when, when it's appropriate, I... I'd like to speak uh, in favor of the motion, but I'm, I'm not sure if we've wrapped up on the technicalities. Thank you. I, I see Rose Stanley um, has her hand up below you, so maybe she might. Um, Rose? Hi, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I would like to um, agree that I do think there is a bit of confusion with the current wording under number one, which is adopting the OFLs, which would include the uh, near shore rockfish complex OFL, uh, which would include quillback um, as final. So I would suggest that um, while I appreciate um, there's maybe intent to allow for changes should quillback be pulled out of the complex, that it would be clearer here to have language um, that uh, would allow for more room on that piece. Thank you. Okay, um, so we've heard that uh, 
CC would like to have it um, a minute to pull that out, I guess. So, um, Marcy. Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, possibly one approach forward might be that, um, uh, presuming that we're talk talking about um, withdrawing and editing and resubmitting um, this motion, um, potentially we we might take up the the quill back motion first. Can you uh, repeat the? Could you repeat the question? Yeah, should um, should we withdraw this motion? Um, and then um, move to um, uh, CDFW's motion, um, and then um, and then have it this this uh, resubmitted. Uh, depending on how many more motions are going to be made, uh, it might be easier to withdraw and everybody get their things together and do it at one time instead of piece by piece. Okay, um, Maggie. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Chair. Uh, I see Phil has his hand up and may have some good advice to offer. I'll just state that I am I'm willing to withdraw and revise the motion. Okay, um, Phil, do you have some insight or a second? Well, I, I mean, I, I certainly agree with Dave that that's, that is a one approach. I, I think the point was if we could get get the quill back piece uh, out there and, and done, then we could come back to this. And so um, I get a question for Dave. I, you know, I was going to suggest we could table this motion, move on to the quill back piece. Once that's done, then come back and bring this back before uh, the body and make any additional amendments to it that may be needed. That sounds... Uh, the other way to do it. Okay. The, uh, it should be a motion to postpone, but ideally you have a motion on the floor uh, and all discussion is supposed to be related to that motion. Um, okay. Um, I don't see any harm in postponing action on it and doing something else. Well, like our... Chair Grolnick will have some insight. Um, I have a, a comment directed to the current motion. Uh, I move that we postpone consideration of this motion. Okay. Um, looking for a second. Second by Phil Anderson. Thank you, Phil. I don't see any need to discuss the motion or to expand on it. Okay, I agree. Um, okay, all those in favor of uh, postponing um, consideration of this motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, motion passed unanimously. Um, and uh, Mark? Um, okay, and now I believe Marcy. Um, take us away. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I do have a motion on California quill back. I believe Sandra and Chris have it. Okay. Thank you. For quill back rockfish off California, I move the council adopt the following, recognizing the SSC's recommendation that the stock be determined as overfished. Standalone California OFL and ABC and ACL values to be informed by the rebuilding analysis adopted under agenda item E2. Remove quillback rockfish from the minor nearshore complexes north and south of 4010. Include SPR harvest rate alternatives from table two on page 10 of the Quillback Rockfish rebuilding analysis of 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, and F equals zero. Thank you, Marcy. Is that language on the screen accurate? Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay, looking for a second. 
Second by Bob Dooley. Thank you, Bob. Uh, speak to your motion, Marcy. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, well, uh, this is the next step uh, as we proceed with um, restructuring our management uh, in our nearshore fisheries and our nearshore complexes uh, to address um, the expected overfish uh, determination for quillback rockfish off California. Um, appreciate uh, the discussions that have gone on um, over the past few weeks on on how we um, <laughs> how we address the overfished status of of this stock um, in our management moving forward. Um, I know there's been a lot of folks that have um, thought about how we uh, address the fact that quillback is part of a complex um, and has been included uh, in the complexes for um, a number of years. Um, also the complexity that comes with the fact that quillback um, off California um, means that we're needing to re, uh, re restructure or, re or address um, a quillback um, both for north and south of 4010 um, and that that affects all three states and all fisheries that uh, participate in um, utilization of the minor nearshore stock complexes. Um, it is clear that when we have an overfish stock uh, like we do for quillback off California that um, we manage it um, individually in our specifications that is in keeping with how we've always managed overfish stocks um, that we uh, no longer can manage that species as part of a complex because it needs um, specific, uh, narrowly tailored, focused management um, to address the needs of rebuilding. So um, because uh, the California assessment was, was broken at the dividing line of, of the state line, um, and not the 4010 line, this does affect um, both um, the north and south um, minor near shore complexes and consequently um, all three west coast states. Um, want to um, acknowledge um, and appreciate the work of the GMT, um, in helping us think through how um, these, how this removal of quillback um, does affect um, the management of our other nearshore complex stocks. Um, I think we'll hear more about uh, that in future agenda items um, as, as the work moves forward. Um, just also want to um, acknowledge that the um, rebuilding analysis for quillback rockfish um, did provide us with a range uh, for consideration of SPR harvest rate alternatives, um, examining the SPR um, from um, 0.5, uh, 0.6 and 0.7 um, does give us um, a pretty wide range of um, T targets, um, as well as uh, probability of recovery by uh, T max, which would be 2066, 52% um, probability of recovery by T max uh, at the SPR harvest rate of 0.5, um, up to 98% uh, probability of recovery by T max uh, under an SPR of 0.7. Um, so with that, um, I think this, um, this is, this is the next step and that concludes my motion. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Um, discussion on the motion. Mm-hmm. 
okay. Certainly not the easiest decision. If I don't see any hands, we're going to uh, call for the question here. Okay. Seeing no hands, um, I'll call for the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Um, motion passes unanimously. Okay, um, so we do have a table motion that probably has to have some work done to it, potentially. Um, so, uh, Maggie, do you have something that you want to take a, take a bite of this? Well, thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, if we could put the tabled motion back on screen. Postponed. And if if we are going to uh, continue with this motion, uh, then I, I believe it would need to be amended by uh, someone else. Uh, and I would welcome an amendment to uh, make the correction uh, to make sure that uh, Quillback Rockfish off California and stock complexes, and pardon me, and the nearshore rockfish north and south stock complexes are not included in um, item number one. Okay. Well, Heather has her hand uh, up. So um, I also have a uh, Heather. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, I'm, I'm prepared to make a motion to amend. And please, can we please scroll down um, so that number one is on the screen. Thank you. Um, I move that under uh, number one, as shown on the screen, after for all ground fish stocks, insert and stock complexes except quillback rockfish off California and the nearshore rockfish north and south complexes And then um, comma and resume the rest of the original language. Okay. Thank you, Heather. Um, is that accurate? Is that language on the screen accurate? Yes. Okay. Uh, I guess I'm looking for a second. Um, second by Maggie. Okay, Heather, um, any discussion? Sure, I'll just say that I, I think this uh, amendment is necessary to make sure that our, our intent in the motion is clear and complete. Um, and I, that's it. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Um, don't see any other hands, so I'll, I'll call for the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Abstentions? Uh, motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Heather. Okay, now we're back to the uh, amended motion. Um, and um, looking for discussion. And seeing none, um, oh, Marcy, you're up. Go, Marcy. Yeah, I believe we're we're back to the substance of the main motion. Uh, we are. 
Okay. Um, I just want to speak uh, in support of the motion, and I really want to thank Maggie for some amazing hard work um, overnight and into this morning, and just her amazing ability to synthesize and um, pull everything together for us. Um, it has sure um, uh, been a delight uh, to work, I think, as a, a tri-state team here in the background, and I really um, appreciate her, her leadership on on this motion in particular uh, and the extra lift. Um, we had materials come to us kind of late in the game and um, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're doing our best and uh, really want to acknowledge the, the thinking um, and the, the comprehensive nature of the motion that uh, is in front of us here today. Um, I want to speak specifically to um, a few of the PPA recommendations that are contained in item four, um, particularly the um, recommendations on Lincod South um, for the P star uh, value of 0.45. Um, Maggie touched on this in her um, remarks, but I just wanted to um, recognize that uh, for this stock, um, the Southern uh, Lincoln assessment uh, was a category two assessment and uh, is in the precautionary zone. And consequently, that means that 4010 um, default HCR is applied automatically. So uh, that, uh, that, um, that coupled with um, extra precaution that comes with the category two determination, um, those are two additional um, buffer layers of precaution that go with this uh, Southern Lincod stock, um, which uh, certainly um, gives me comfort in continuing uh, with a P-star value of 0.45. Um, also want to recognize some of the remarks from uh, the GAP uh, as well um, as members of our delegation that have reminded us that uh, Lincod off California um, while we haven't, it appears that it's been more difficult to access these fish uh, the last year or two, um, but would acknowledge and that the fish have been found deeper. And that's been, I think, um, recognized by the, the trawl sector uh, as well. And that for um, the non-trawl fleet, um, the RCAs continue to um, not allow for much access to the lingcod stock off of most of California. So um, that is, I think, an explanation as to why we haven't been um, as fully utilizing um, this resource as, as maybe we uh, might want to. Um, so uh, all in all, I think there's um, the, the 0.45 um, P-STAR buffer offers adequate protection coupled with the the category two um, assessment um, determination as well as the uh, default HCR uh, 4010 adjustment. Um, moving to vermilion rockfish um, off of California, um, want to support the PPA P star values of 0.45. Um, it's wonderful that we have a new assessment for vermilion rockfish. I know that um, heard many remarks in our delegation about um, how comfortable folks are with the quality of the work that was done and the um, the breadth of the assessment and um, the comprehensive nature of it. And we have been waiting uh, many years for a new ver vermilion assessment. Um, and now we have one and uh, we feel um, pretty good about it. Um, just acknowledging that, um, believe that the new vermilion assessments, we've got a category one off of Oregon and category two for California and Washington. Um, that category two uh, determination um, does mean that we have um, resulting um, OFL values that um, have have been are lower or more precautionary than what they would be if the assessment um, had been determined to be a cat one. Um, 
in the case of the Vermilion assessment south of Conception, the reason for the recommendation of the Category 2 uh, assessment was uh, driven by um, the Sunset Vermilion um, mix of stocks that um, were assessed um, and the inability to um, kind of delineate uh, those two stocks in the uh, catch data and other input um, data. So um, kind of by default, because we're assessing that uh, species as a complex of vermilion and sunset, um, the determination was made that it was category two stock. Um, and, and consequently, that means that uh, the resulting uh, OFL um, is going to be lower. So um, there is, I think in, in my mind, a, a considerable amount of um, precaution built in um, which um, lends support for um, our PPA determination of a P-star of 0.45. Um, so again, want to thank um, the maker of the motion and uh, support it. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Marcy. Further discussion? Okay, um, seeing no hands. Um, uh, Heather Hall, Heather. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, and I um, echo the appreciation that Mar Marcy uh, shared for Maggie's work in putting this motion together. Um, I also very much appreciate the effort uh, to that and the coordination between the three states. I definitely miss the days of sitting in a hotel conference room and doing this together um, in the evening and, and help, helping to have an efficient conversation the next day. But um, so I, I appreciate the late night emails and all of that as we, we put this together. Also want to speak again to the Sablefish um, range of alternatives adopted here. I um, appreciate that the PSAR of 0.35 is still here, um, still included in the range of alternatives for, for the reasons I mentioned um, before we, um, at the beginning here, um, but I, I really think it'll be valuable to have that broad range of alternatives. It's a, we have an opportunity, which I think is rare to um, look at alternatives that result in ACLs that are higher in all three alternatives than we've seen in many years while at the same time being precautionary. So uh, definitely appreciate that we'll, we'll be able to, to look very carefully at that one, have the information for final decision. Um, that's it, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you, Heather. Uh, further discussion? And Heather, your hand's still up. Okay. Well, seeing no hands, um, I guess uh, I'm going to call for the question then. So uh, all those in favor, um, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Um, okay. Uh, motion passes unanimously. So with that, I will turn to John. What else, how are we doing here? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, you made a lot of progress, but I, I do believe we, um, we might need a few more things. Um, uh, specifically, I, I believe we're gonna need a tribal motion on alternatives that they would like to see analyzed for uh, the tribal fisheries, um, mainly the set-asides used to uh, manage tribal fisheries in the next management cycle. And um, and and just a, a, a check, there's been a lot of discussion on stock complex uh, restructuring. So I believe we have, uh, enough guidance on that, but, you know, just to, to make sure that we've had a, a thorough discussion there, um, might just to, just, just as a check to make sure that, uh, the 
council doesn't have any more comments on uh, stock complex restructuring. But uh, fundamentally, I do think we need a tribal motion. Okay. Um, I looked at Joe. Uh, Joe, you have anything for us? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I, I haven't been made aware uh, from the tribes um, who are affected here uh, that they have a motion that they would like to uh, provide. Um, but I, I do understand um, that we will have something on that um, for agenda E5, if, if that is uh, adequate. John, I see your mic's still open. <laughs> Yeah, if, if that's a question to me, um, I, I think it will be. I mean, that's that's fine. Just as long as we leave the meeting with uh, that detail um, covered, we'll, we'll be fine. Okay, well, but we could just table this and go to the EFPs and uh, make sure we don't get ahead of ourselves. Maggie Summer, Maggie? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Before we move on to EFPs, I, I, I just wanted to chime in on stock complexes, uh, support the comments. We heard from Keeley earlier and the recommendation, uh, the, uh, or the information provided in the GMT report and presentation to us. Um, I, I think it is appropriate uh, that, that we acknowledge our interest in future comprehensive examination of stock complexes uh, outside of the uh, biennial specifications process for 2023 and 2024. Um, we have already uh, partially addressed California quillback rockfish by removing it uh, from the complex uh, earlier in this action. And then I believe under E5, we will be considering uh, management measures, uh, including potentially species-specific management measures for uh, some of the stocks identified um, in the GMT presentation for us uh, for further consideration. So I, I think we are uh, on track to do that and, and have the appropriate points teed up at, at which we'll be addressing those, uh, recognizing that we will need um, a, uh, further discussion at some point on exactly uh, when we will uh, begin a comprehensive uh, stock complex evaluation in the future. Thank you, Maggie. Um, Heather Hall, Heather? Uh, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I am <laughs> stumbled for the button here. Um, excuse me. I uh, Before we move on to, I just wanted to um, ask if we could get some, some follow-up information on um, the Vermilion, the decision um, to combine Oregon, Washington, Vermilion on the status determination. Um, we just noticed this was um, the SSC recommendation on Monday was different than what we'd heard from the stat recommendation and, and our um, member of the stat team wasn't available on Monday, um, multiple power outages and all of that. And so I'd just like to um, ask if we can have the SSC and follow up with us and explain uh, a little bit of, of what that means um, for Oregon and Washington. Hey, thanks, Heather. So Heather, I guess, as far as for clarification on that, um, is that a question to to who? Yeah, thank you, Vice Chair. Um, I should say, as a follow-up, um, ask if, if John DeVore can help us with that, and it can be a follow-up. It's not a discussion I <laughs> intend to bring up now. I just wanted to highlight it, um, that it was a little bit different than what we understood and um, from the stat team. So it's definitely a follow-up. Okay. Do you want to get some thoughts? No, thank you. I I, I appreciate that. Um, we uh, will make 
sure that the SSC comes back with uh, an elaboration on their recommendation uh, for Vermilion in the North um, at the next meeting that uh, Specs is on the agenda, whether that's it certainly will be on the agenda in April, but whether it's on in March or not, we'll make sure at the earliest time uh, the SSC comes back with a more detailed explanation of their recommendation. Okay. Uh, Heather? Thank you very much, John. That's exactly what we were hoping for. I appreciate it. All right. Um, well, I've had uh, discussions here in the room about maybe suspending the completion of this agenda item until maybe after the uh, the FP discussion, make sure we're good. To, oh, Phil Anderson, Phil. Yeah, I, I'm I'm a little bit confused on that. Uh, I, I totally understand uh, the need for a travel motion under E5. Um, lots of set asides and so forth that that they'll be bringing forward. I did not think we were doing that under this agenda item, so I was a bit puzzled what what exactly we were looking for from the tribes under this agenda. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, if I may, um, I only brought it up just to make sure that we get that. Um, I, I, I don't think there's any problem at all with uh, making those decisions under E5. So um, that's, that's what the GMT is prepared to do. So um, I think we're okay on that. We'll look forward to that. Uh, any recommendations on tribal set asides under E5? Well, well there you go. <laughs> Thanks, John. Okay, um, so John, are we, are we done here? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, I believe you are. That's uh, been a very uh, comprehensive discussion, and um, I want to personally thank everyone who's contributed uh, information to, throughout this process to get to this point, but I do believe we have um, enough uh, guidance and uh, alternatives for a detailed analysis of 23 and 24 harvest specifications. So with that, I'd say you have completed your mission for this agenda item. Okay, um, John, thank you. And uh, not an easy decision, uh, even though there was, was much room here. So, okay. Um, with that, we'll go to um, E4. And uh, Jim, are you handy? I am. Good morning, council members. Uh, so this is your agenda item for uh, EFPs for the 23-24 uh, management cycle. Uh, at this meeting, you're going to identify a set of EFPs for public review, as well as the set-asides and caps that will be needed for those EFPs. Uh, then you'll return uh, next June uh, to finalize these decisions when you wrap up your actions on the specs. Let's start by going over your briefing materials that you have. Uh, first, attachment one has uh, COP19, uh, which uh, provides the guides for this process. Then you have uh, six EFP applications that are provided as attachments uh, two through seven. Uh, all of these EFPs that on this cycle are of EFPs that were in place for the uh, 21, excuse me, the 2021 cycle. Um, and additionally, uh, to those attachments two through seven, I want to draw your attention to supplemental attachment 20. 12, which modifies the uh, Real Good Fish EFP uh, application. So following those attachments with all of the uh, EFP applications are a number of interim reports for the 2020-21 EFPs. Uh, one of the obligations of EFP holders is to provide a mid-year report on the activities under the first year of their EFPs and a statement of intent to continue in the second year. Uh, those reports, those inner reports are scheduled for November's of odd number year, so odd numbered year, so hence they're here in your briefing book. Uh, the CF and CDF and W mid year report is provided as part of their application and attachment two, and then the uh, other uh, reports are provided as attachments uh, eight through uh, 11. Uh, except that we we don't have a mid-year uh, report for the uh, for the Cook EFP. 
So while these mid-year reports are provided as requested and they are in your act, in your uh, package there, uh, no council action is specifically required on those reports. Then after uh, those uh, interim reports, uh, you have your uh, supplemental reports from WDFW, uh, the GMT, and uh, the GAP. So I'd like to draw your attention to page two of the situation summary. Uh, there you'll see a list of the EFPs and related attachments, uh, except for the, again, that supplemental attachment uh, 12 for the real good fish EFP isn't listed, uh, but uh, you'll see the other ones listed. And on that table also, on the rightmost column, you'll see a list of where to locate uh, set-asides and salmon bycatch caps that each of the EFPs is requested. Uh, in, in some cases, you know, there is no uh, set-aside or cap uh, requested or needed for some of the EFPs. Then just to kind of uh, give you an overview of going down the list, uh, starting at the top, the first one there is the uh, CDFW cow cod EF, EFP uh, that allows for uh, cow cod retention and recreational fisheries uh, to collect biological samples. The next row then is the WW yellow eye uh, EFP to allow, again, recreational fishery uh, retention and for the purpose of collecting uh, biological samples of yellow eye. The third line is the uh, yellowtail rockfish jig fishing uh, EFP off California. So that's to use the uh, jig gear in the RCA from 3427 up to 4010. And that's a EFP that's been going for quite a while now. Uh, the line after that then is the uh, year-round coastwater midwater trawl rockfish EFP. Um, there are a number of uh, exemptions that are requested. you will see them there on pages uh, two and three of that EFP application. Uh, but in general, as the title suggests, it's to allow uh, use of midwater trawl gear year-round year and in particular before the start of the whiting season. Uh, you also see some uh, requests for uh, exemption for the use of, uh, to allow the use of gears other than selective flatfish trawl in certain areas down off, off California. The next EFP then is the Scott Cook EFP to allow the use of trolled, trolled long line gear in the RCA off Oregon. So another midwater uh, hook and line gear. Uh, and then the last here is the uh, uh, Monterey uh, uh, Chili pepper rockfish EFP, which is to allow a use of a trolled long a trolled long line gear. There's two configurations that they have uh, within the RCA from 36 to uh, 37 and a half north uh, latitude. So that's uh, the list of all the EFPs. I'm not going to go into them any, any more detail than that. You're going to have a really good uh, GMT report, and uh, if you look at the table one of their report, it has a very nice summary of each of these EFPs. Uh, what the applicant is, the purpose, what the exemptions are, and so forth. So I, I'd encourage you to uh, take, a, take a look at that. And of course, the GMT will be reporting on that. And then GMT also has a report number, or excuse me, their table number two in their report, <clears throat> which summarizes all the uh, set-aside requests. And then the report itself uh, uh, addresses the uh, salmon bycatch cap uh, request. So I think that's probably what you're going to be wanting to, uh, to look at when it comes time to uh, do your motions on this. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, your actions then at the bottom of the uh, page two of the situation summary are to preliminarily adopt the EFPs uh, that you can uh, send out for public review and finalize in June. Uh, decide when, are the e when there are any of the EFPs should be referred to an advisory body such as the uh, SSC for, uh, for further evaluation for a more thorough review if, that's, if, that's, if there's questions or if that's needed. And then finally, adopting the uh, preliminary set asides and caps for the uh, for the EFPs. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mr. Vice Chairman, that uh, completes the overview. Okay, thank you, Jim. Uh, questions for Jim uh, on his overview? Okay, seeing none, um, we'll go to the um, WDFW report and uh, Heather All. Heather. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I'll uh, summarize the information here in agenda item E4. This is the supplemental WDFW report on um, EFPs. And um, 
we also have a separate application here. This is just a report um, to let the council know that um, this EFP, um, which we applied for in 2019 and, and be, began collecting yellow eye rockfish in 2021 has been successful. Um, we have collected um, through uh, voluntary um, uh, recreational anglers, yellow eye rockfish that I think we will improve the information that goes into our stock assessments. Um, and uh, so far we have um, collected 97 yellow eye rockfish, um, collecting biological uh, data from that, including length and age. Um, as a reminder, this EFP doesn't require a set aside. We account for the yellow eye rockfish collected in this EFP uh, through our recreational um, sampling. So when these fish come in, they are um, sampled and accounted for there as 100% um, mortality. Um, through this year, through mid-October, um, the uh, yellow eye mortality from this EFP was uh, two tenths of a metric ton. Um, we do expect to add a couple more boats to this um, as it moves forward um, in order to get to our full um, number of yellow eye that we'd like to collect. But again, we don't expect that to um, change the, the overall expectation of yellow eye mortality that, that we had anticipated. Um, so again, we look forward to continuing to bring this information in and improve our um, yellow eye rockfish stock information um, going ahead. And um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Heather. Uh, questions for Heather on the uh, WDFW report? Okay. Seeing none, no, thanks, Heather. Um, next up is um, the GMT report, and I believe uh, Joe Peterson. Joe? Hey, good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, and the members of the Council. Um, this is Joe Peterson. I'm the Vice Chair of the Ground Fish Management Team, and I'm going to be reading for you guys Supplemental GMT Report 1, Ground Fish Management Team Report on Preliminary Exempted Fishing Permits uh, for Approval for the 2023-2024 Biennium. Uh, the ground fish management team reviewed the applications for exempted fishing permits and contained in the November 2021 briefing book was briefed by Dr. Jim Seeger of Pacific Fishery Management Council staff on the no November 8th, 2021 GMT webinar and had additional discussions during the council meeting with some of the applicants. An overview of the six applications is presented within table one. That's at the bottom of this document. Um, at this meeting, the council will need to adopt preliminary off-the-top amounts for estimated EFP catch, which will be deducted from annual catch limits and are descri described in Table 2. A summary of the amounts will be included under Agenda Item E5A Supplemental GMT Report 1. To facil facilitate the biannual management measure discussion and analysis, the GMT reviewed the technical merits of the applications contained within the advanced rate of the We kind of lost you there. You're, you're, you're barely hear you uh sorry um you know if you guys are following the news where all those landslides are in washington that's me so hopefully i have you guys um, can you guys hear me now um yeah that's much better now okay um so the GMT reviewed the technical merits of the applications contained in the advanced briefing book relative to council operating procedures for EFPs and offered the following comments. Um, recreational cow cod sampling in California, California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, the purpose of this EFP renewal is to provide an exemption to allow for retention of cow cod for biological data collection for the use in future stock assessments. This EFP renewal is intended to opportunist to opportunistically collect biological samples for cow cod with the expectation that this alteration will have limited impacts on current fishery operations. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife solicit commercial passenger fishing vessels to participate. Participants will need to abide by reporting and fish handling practices until California Department of Fish and Wildlife staff 
can collect the specimens. CDFW will coordinate and conduct the sampling protocols with the National Marine Fisheries Service stock assessors to ensure that data collected fall within age and growth parameters that meet stock assessment standards. CDFW did not specify a set-aside amount, and the GMT discussed that any changes to CalCog mortality would be minor and could be considered as standard catch estimates under the appropriate fishery harvest limit. The application indicates that CPF, CPFB selected to participate will use legal gear, fish within legal depths, and continue with business practices as usual. The GMT understands that CDFW does not intend to consider allowing retention in the recreational fishery as part of the 2023-2024 specification process. So the overall cow cod mortality is not expected to significantly increase due to this EFP. That uh, Joe, we lost you. Um, Mr. If Chairman, you Joe back, I see Elaine, you have your hand up. I was going to uh, jump in if you guys, if we, if we're losing Joe. Please. Okay, I I think I heard where he was at was on the bottom of ta uh, table or bottom of page one. Turning down the GMT on the other computer. Um, CDFW has provided an interim report on activities under this EFP thus far. However, due to COVID-19, EFP collection efforts did not commence until the summer of 2021 uh, after participating vessels had removed, resumed more normal operations and CDFW staff were able to undertake EFP coordination and project administration activities. CDFW has stated that although only a few specimens have been collected to date, CalCOD encounters typically occur more frequently during the winter months, particularly in Southern California. So is it, it is expected uh, that all collection activities will begin to ramp up this month. The samples collected so far appear to provide the needed data. So two additional years of collection will continue to add the, to this data stream. In consideration that the recreational prohibit prohibition will remain in place, the harvest limit is increased beginning in 20, that began in 21, 22 and is continuing in 23, 24. Uh, the CFP will help fill in gap for sensitive and constraining species. So we continue to see technical merit in the application and recommend moving forward for public review. On the WDFW application attachment three, um, I believe Ms. Hall just spoke to this application. Um, don't know that I need to read all of this, but in general, the GMT continues to see technical merit and recommends the council continue to move forward with this application. Uh, similar to the CDFW one above, it helps, it's helping fill in data gaps. Midwater jig fishing in California, the San Francisco Community Fishing Association, um, the one we've often referred to as the Emily Platt EFP. This EFP is to target yellowtail and chili pepper using commercial midwater jig gear inside the RCA while trying to avoid yellow eye. Uh, this EFP was initially approved for the 13-14 biennium and has been re renewed every management cycle since with various requirement changes to the observer coverage, range limit, and participating vessels. The applicants have previously provided an interim report covering 13 through 19 and an update for 2021. Uh, activity shows the catch has stayed well below their set aside amounts for target species and yellow eye rockfish. The EFP applicants have worked with WICOP uh, on their need for observer coverage for 23-24, which will be provided at no cost if an observer is available. If WICOP is not available, the, all participants understand they must contract and pay for an observer to meet the terms and conditions. This EFP has been prioritized by the council and is incorporated into the non troll RCA agenda item. Given the time frame for potential imp implementation of the new non troll RCA regulations, moving this application forward will provide continuity and continue to add to the existing data sets and address potential delays. Uh, we continue to find technical merit in this application and recommend it move forward for public review. The year-round coast-wide midwall rockfish EFP, which is in attachment one or attachment five, 
The purpose of this EFP renewal is to collect information on salmon bycatch for vessels using midwater gear to target midwater rockfish species year-round and coast-wide. This EFP renewal would also collect information on impacts of bottom trawl vessels fishing between 4010 and 42, shoreward of the RCA boundary using small foot rope gear. The CFP renewal helps fulfill the requirements of the ITS for salmon in the Pacific Coast ground fish fisheries, and no set asides are needed for this EFP as all catches accounted for using participants quota. The team continues to see technical merit in the application and suggests that the application be moved forward for public review. Midwater hook and line fishing in Oregon, hook and line rockfish fishing in Oregon, uh, proponent by uh, Mr. Scott Cook, attachment six. The purpose of this EFP renewal is to test commercial midwater hook and line gear in the RC off of Oregon. The EFP was initially approved for 1920 cycle and is not currently requesting any sub substantive changes to the operations protocols or set aside amounts. The goal is to target midwater shelf rockfish species while avoiding the yellow eye rockfish and also to try to test EM devices for small vessels that are typically too small to carry an observer. A progress report was provided on October 9th, 2019, addressing the lack of participation to that point. No progress was, report has been submitted as the time of writing of this report for activities in 2021. The applicant has previously indicated reasons for limited participation include the expense, lack of available fishing days in the EFP, and difficulty in, uh, in safely bringing an observer aboard. Projected impacts have been provided flow and high, high estimates of the potential fishing effort. And we discussed the, the low and high effort estimates uh, as we have last cycle. Uh, since the CFP would have 100% observer coverage, rather than prohibiting retention of LINCOD, the GMT believes the low proposed set aside of 0.1 would be sufficient uh, to dissuade targeting of LINCOD uh, should this EFP go forward. The CFP will provide new information to better understand the selectivity and potential impacts of this new gear type. While the team continues to see technical merit in this application, however, due to limited participation over the previous three years of this EFP, we do not think this EFP should move forward at this time. Monterey Bay Regional Chili Pepper Rockfish, uh, the Real Good Fish EFP and Attachment 7. The purpose of this EFP renewal is to assess the feasibility of midwater gear type to primarily target chili pepper, followed by Boccaccio and Yellowtail in the non trawl RCA off Central California. Using not more than 10 vessels, uh, shrimp, shrimp fly gear powered by salmon girdies would be, be deployed 50 feet off the bottom to help avoid yellow eye. Each vessel would be held to a daily cap of yellow eye to ensure set aside amounts would not be exceeded. Using this gear type combined with slow trolling speeds, the applicants do not expect to encounter salmon, but demonstrated willingness to work with NIMS and state agencies on bycatch caps, best handling practices, and biological samples if identified as priority. A progress report was submitted that indicated that there have been 22 trips under the CFP through July of 2021, catching 3,950 pounds of chili pepper, 2,221 pounds of boccaccio, uh, both are less than 2%, oh, and less than 2% of the project's quota for the other non-targeted species and no cow cod. Uh, the applicant indicated the reason for low participation in the EFP ended up being higher cost than using this gear in the open access fishery, uh, which doesn't require vessel monitoring systems or observer coverage. Initially, the quota and fishing depths accessible via the EFP were the primary benefit to fishermen, but during the project period, the council has begun working on modifying that RCA, possibly opening deeper depths uh, and drastically increasing individual limits, or drastically increasing individual limits for open access fishery. These have combined to reduce the appeal of the EFP to potential vessels. In previous iterations, the CFP has indicated interest in exploring EM technology rather than carrying observers. However, in Supplemental Attachment 12, they have now indicated that 100% at-sea observer coverage is expected for both years. EM solutions were tested, were not sufficient enough to request lower coverage. Additionally, they are not at requesting the VMS exemption. We continue to see technical merit in this application and recommend it be moved forward for public review. In summary, uh, the GMT provides a summary table of all six EFP applications that were submitted in table one. And table two includes proposed set-asides for all six of the EFP applications. 
And then based on the council's action under this agenda item, we will include the final set asides for these EFPs that get forward in the off the top deductions uh, under E5A supplemental GMT report one for the harvest management measures. We do want to note that three of these EFPs are to test similar gears to target underutilized midwater rockfish species within the RCA, with one being renewed for the fifth biennium. The Council has prioritized two items which may reduce or eliminate the need for this type of EFP, such as uh, the modifying the non trawl sector area managements and moving the MLA Platt EFP into regulations. Uh, Though prioritized by the council, um, actually this sentence should be struck because we have the person who wrote this, me, um, did not realize that the EM Emily EFP, Platt EFP was incorporated into the non trawl area management. So there's a sentence that needs to be struck there. Um, but just based on these EFPs looking at the same stuff, basically the same gear type um, and the actions going on with the non trawl area management, the council may want to consider whether limited workload resources should be spent on EFPs versus working on the prioritized items that could provide some sector wide benefits. Finally, we uh, also note that estimated Chinook catch for non trawl EFPs will be very low. We again recommend a total allowance of 100 Chinook salmon annually for all non trawl EFPs considered in the biennium. Uh, which we include in the salmon scorecard and count against the non whiting salmon guideline. And then we have a summary of our recommendations. And with that, I will try to answer any questions. Um, thank you, Lynn. Um, questions for Lynn on the um, GMT report? Okay, not seeing any. Um, thanks, Lynn, for jumping in there for Joe. Um, next Glad up to help is out. Okay. Uh, next up is um, Shims Judd with the Gap Report. Shims. Vice Chair Penger, can you hear me? Oh, we can. Great. Um, thank you. Um, so for the record, my name is Shims Judd. I'll be reading from the supplemental Gap Report on preliminary exempted fishing permit approval for 2023 and 2024. The GAP received an overview of this agenda item from Dr. Jim Seeger, reviewed the associated documents, and discussed the preliminary 2023-2024 exempted for fishing permit applications. In general, the GAP recommends that all of the EFPs move forward with the exception of Scott Cook's Oregon Midwater Hook and Line Rockfish EFP. Our rationale is described below. The GAP notes that in this cycle, all of the EFPs are renewals. The GAP further notes that many of these EFPs have already provided valuable scientific information, sorry, scientific data and information on new fishing methods with relatively low set-asides. The GAP believes that enabling these EFPs to continue will provide additional important insights, especially on methods for clean catch of healthy midwater rockfish populations, which will be increasingly critical in light of likely future impacts to nearshore rockfish fisheries, given the status of copper and quillback rockfish in particular. The GAP does not recommend forwarding the Scott Cook EFP because there has been very limited effort in the past, and we understand that the applicant is not interested in continuing the EFP. Finally, the GAP notes that regulations may move forward for some of the gear types being tested in these EFPs, and the GAP fully supports timely regulatory approval. While it's possible that regulations will be in place during the EFP term, the GAP believes it is important to forward these EFPs in case regulations cannot be completed in time. And that concludes the GAP report. Um, thank you, Shems. Question for Shems on the GAP report. Okay, thanks, Shems. Um, it takes care of advisory bodies. Uh, there's no public comment. And so um, hopefully we could uh, get this wrapped up fairly quickly. Yeah, so uh, takes us to council discussion and action. Heather Hall, Heather. Hi, thank you, um, Vice Chair. Uh, I appreciate all the work that the GMT did and the GAP did in going through these EFP applications, um, making sure everybody's got their T's crossed and I's dotted and, and 
that they have what they need to um, do the over the winter analysis. Um, I, um, I didn't see any recommendations that any of these need to go to the SSC. Um, and I think that speaks to the fact that they're all um, renewals. And so they've been underway and, and are proceeding uh, with the exception of um, what was noted in both the GMT and GAP reports that um, the Scott Cook EFP hasn't been um, underway at all. Um, so I do have a motion that I'm I'm prepared to offer, but I would um, wait and see if others want to have any discussion or make comments before I go ahead. Okay, thank you, Heather. I'm looking for hands. And I'm just not seeing any, so um, I think we'd welcome a motion at this time. Okay, thank you. I don't know what I've done that is making it hard for me to find my unmute button today, but <laughs> uh, let's see. I'm not sure if Sander has that yet. Um, so I can give it a minute. She's shaking her head. Okay. Hmm. I, I see a thumb being raised across the room. What one minute here? There it is. Okay, Vice Chair, if you're ready, I can read that. Okay. All right. I move that the council adopt the EFPs for public review as recommended by the GMT in Supplemental GMT Report 1, uh, November 2021 including the set-aside amounts outlined in Table 2 of the same report and a total allowance of 100 Chinook salmon annually for all of the non-trawl EFPs. Okay, thank you, Heather. Is the um, language accurate on the screen? Yes, it is. And I see Jim Seeger has his hand up. Jim? I just wanted to note that in addition to the uh, 100 Chinook salmon uh, cap for those EFPs that internal to the um, year round midwater rockfish EFP, which is your attachment five on page four there, uh, there is a 1000 Chinook salmon north of 42 and 100 Chinook salmon south of 42 uh, salmon cap. Uh, so while that's not called out in the motion since it's internal to that EFP application, I'm assuming that that would be included in the motion or do you want to call that out in the motion? Okay, thank you, Jim. And um, I see uh, anything else, Jim? Well, um, this is Heather. I, I would do whatever is needed if that needs to be specifically called out. Um, I would do that. I don't know if Keeley's going to offer some input that helps. <laughs> Um, Gilly? I was going to offer input on a different issue, so I apologize if there is a question for me. I, I would ask you to repeat it. Uh, Jim? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure from a parliamentary perspective whether it needs to be uh, in there or not. From my perspective, as long as we've had this discussion, it's clear to council members that that's internal to the uh, year-round midwater rockfish EFP that we don't need to include it in the motion if that's clear but um 
I don't have a final word on that. I, I don't know if no GC or somebody else needs to weigh in. Okay. Um, I thought those numbers were in the EFP specifically, I, I believe, but, um, Yes, that, that's correct. That, and that's what I'm saying. I just want to acknowledge and make sure that it's clear that they're there. They're on page, uh, they're page uh, four. But since we were calling out all the other set aside specifically that are also in the EFPs, as well as the salmon set aside for the uh, non trawl EFPs, I just wanted to get acknowledgement on the floor that there's also that additional thousand Chinook uh, north and 100 Chinook south within the other EFP. Okay, cool. Okay, very good. Uh, Keely. Thanks. Don't think that we need um, anything further in the motion to specifically address that. Um, I think we have already covered it in our EFP terms and conditions. Um, and since these were our renewals, um, assuming nothing is changing, I don't see a need to specifically amend the motion in this way. Very good. Um, so at that point, I think we're looking for a second. Seconded by Marcy Rimko. Thank you, Marcy. Um, Heather, do you want to speak to your motion? Sure, thank you. Um, I think these uh, EFPs are providing valuable information um, and uh, they've been in, in place last year. So as I said, I think um, continuing them for the next biennium uh, provides an opportunity to gather um, really valuable information and um, that's it. I think that they speak for themselves. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Um, for, for the discussion of the motion and Keely, I see your hand still up. Yes, I do have a question for the maker of the motion if this is the right time. Um, it, it is. Thanks. I just had a question um, I wanted to clarify from your motion um, because there is a bit of discrepancy that I'm seeing in the GMT report. Um, the GMT is not recommending that the Cook EFP be renewed, but when you scroll down into the table of set-asides, the Cook EFP is in there. And so I wanted to clarify exactly what your motion um, would be doing with respect to the Cook EFP. Oh, thank you for calling that out, um, Keely. It, the intention of my motion was to not forward the Cook EFP um, per the recommendation of the GMT. Um, and I hadn't really highlighted that that was still in table two. I, and I was maybe being overly, I didn't want to, I wanted to be sure that the set aside amounts were approved in the motion. And so that's why I referred to the table, but hadn't noticed that those set asides were in there. So um, let's see. I don't know if, if an amendment to this motion um, would be necessary to just say including the set aside amounts in table two, except uh, for the Scott Cook EFP um, would be helpful. Well, it seems to me that if the um, if the Cook EFP isn't moved forward, uh, the set asides don't matter because he's not going to use them because there's no EFP. So unless we're robbing other EFPs who set asides, I don't think it matters or not, but um, what do you want to do here? Marcy? Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, if it's uh, the pleasure of the council to amend the motion to strike um, the phrase that begins with including the set aside amounts outlined in table two of, this, of the same report and a total allowance of 100 Chinook salmon annually for all the non troll EFPs that might get us there. Um, but I appreciate Heather's desire for some clarity. Um, I guess my my thought was that the, the GMT report has a nice summary of recommendations and they, they'd be adequate. 
Okay. So, um, is, are you, is that a motion or to amend the motion? Uh, I think with with um, concurrence from the maker of the motion, that would be my proposed amendment. Thank you, Marcy. I appreciate it. That works for me. That was my starting point. I should have just stuck with it. So thank you. So a second on the uh, amendment, uh, Jim. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. So is the intent of this motion then that the uh, this motion does adopt the set asides, but as specified for each of the individual EFPs that is uh, being forwarded, or is the intent to come back then with a second motion to cover set asides and uh, Chinook caps? Mercy. Oh. Actually, I'm sorry. I should say Heather, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, whatever is simplest, it, it was intended to adopt the set asides that go with the recommended um, EFPs that are going forward. So, Mr. Vice Chair, uh, if I may, so my my question might have been to the maker of the second. Um, oh, again, it, it, I'm not sure, but the the. Uh, the question is, with the motion as it would be amended, uh, as it would stand amended, is it's the is it would it be the council member understanding that that includes the set asides that are part of each of the EFPs, or are you going to be coming back with a second motion? Um, I'm not sure if that inquiry was to me um, as the maker of the amendment, but um, I guess I'd be happy to respond that um, yes, it is, I believe our intention that the uh, EFPs as they are proposed, which include the proposed set aside amounts um, be forwarded for public review. Um, I think the GMT discusses uh, the set aside amounts in, in, in their report and while not um, specifically identified in the summary of the recommendations, I believe that the recommendation to forward um, those applications um, does uh, imply that the set aside amounts that go with the corresponding EFP um, would also be approved by us for public review. Okay. Um, Jim? So the only thing I'm trying to track down right now is I can't remember, and a GMT member may be able to help, um, the their recommendation for a total allowance of 100 shooks and sa shook, nooks some salmon annually for all non troll EFPs. I'm not sure if that recommendation would be covered by this, by this motion. Another approach might, on this motion that might be simpler might be just to say, including set amounts outlined in table two for those EFPs that we are forwarding. But anyway, uh, the point, the, the, the point I want to make, the important point right now is, um, yeah, and I don't know whether uh, uh, somebody from the EF, GMT could help out. I, I need to flip back through all the you know, the three non troll EFPs and see what they say individually about that salmon uh, by catch cap. Yeah, and I don't have that in front of me, but I see Lynn has her hand up. Lynn? Yeah, uh, through the vice chair, Mr. Seeger, we don't have salmon caps for each individual EFPs, each of the individual non troll EFPs that was. Uh, a, a conglomerate of all of them combined. Um, I, I'm not a council member and I'm not a parliamentarian, but but I think what you just suggested um, would cover it. Um, I know as the GMT member who's doing the calculations, I understand what y'all are getting at, so I can do the math. Um, but no, we, we don't have individual Chinook set-asides per EFP. It's 100 for all of them to combined. Okay. Um, thank you, Lynn. Um, uh, Maggie. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. 
I wonder if an alternative amendment so that the motion would read including the set aside amounts outlined in table two. I'm not offering this now. I'm musing out loud. <laughs> including the set aside amounts outlined in table two of the same report for the recommended EFPs and a total allowance of 100 Chinook salmon annually for all the non troll EFPs would address the concerns and ensure that we appropriately adopt the set asides, including that 100 Chinook salmon amount. I, I think that would get us there, uh, Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And um, with that musing, um, I would um, withdraw my amendment if that works for everyone. Yes. Okay. And then, um, Maggie, would you uh, offer up one? Certainly, Vice Chair. Thank you. I'll wait for the formatting to return to a size I can read. Thank you. Um, I move to amend the motion. as follows. After the words of the same report, add for the recommended EFPs, close quote. And that would be the only language I'm proposing to add by amendment and the remaining language would continue after that. Oh, thank you, Maggie. Is that uh, language accurate? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, I don't know if we need to call for the, or a discussion on this. Um, I see Marcy, you still have your hand up. Okay, I'm looking for a second. Second by Virgil Moore. Thank you, Virgil. Um, okay, um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Um, motion to amend to pass it unanimously. Um, and now we're back to the uh, original amended motion or as amended, so. Okay. I don't see any hands, so if if no uh, no hands, I'm gonna call for the question. All those um, in favor of the amended motion, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Uh, the amended motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And Jim, I would turn to you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, so you have adopted on a preliminary basis a suite of uh, five uh, EFPs for renewal in the coming cycle. Uh, you decided that there isn't any need for those EFPs to go uh, to any special advisory bodies, and you have a suite of set asides and uh, salmon bycatch caps, including one that covers all of the non trawl EFPs and another salmon bycatch cap that, that is within the midwater trawl, uh, midwater rockfish EFP. I think that concludes your business on this. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, apologies, if I get back to Keeley, I, that was my bad, got us held up there. So, okay, with that, um, I'm going to hand the gavel back to our esteemed uh, chairman, uh, Mark. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Vice Chair Pettinger. Great job um, getting through the ground fish items. Uh, we have a full afternoon of HMS uh, coming up. Um, and so let me just see if there's a strong preference amongst council members to do a 45 minute or a one hour lunch. And if people don't have a preference, uh, I'll err on the side of a 45 minute lunch, but just looking to see uh, if we have any hands, anyone has a strong feeling. And I'm not seeing any hands. Um, so we will take a 45 minute lunch and we will be back at 
105.
All right, welcome back from lunch. It is uh, 1.05. We have a full afternoon of HMS matters to take up. So we'll start with agenda item H1, uh, NIMS report. And I, uh, I understand that uh, Merrick Burden, our new executive director, is in the ED seat uh, this afternoon. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and council members. Um, as you indicated, Mr. Chairman, we are doing quite well today, turning our attention to H1. H1. Um, unless there are any comments or questions, I would suggest we turn to uh, Dr. Dahl. All right, Dr. Dahl, take it away. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Executive Director. So this is an easy one for me because I'll uh, turn this over to the National Marine Fishery Service representatives, we have uh, in your in your briefing book, there was a, um, a supplemental report from the region. Um, and I believe um, Lyle Enriquez is going to give you an overview of that. And then for the Science Center, um, Dale Sweetnam uh, is going to give you a presentation on Science Center activities related to HMS. Uh, there are no advisory body reports under this agenda item. So um, that's all I have to say for an overview. All right, well, unless I see any hands, which I do not, um, we'll go to Lyle Enriquez, who is in the NIMS seat for this agenda item. Welcome, Lyle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, council members. Can you hear me okay? You bet. Great, thank you. So our NIMS report contains two brief updates. First, the 2021 Driftnet Modernization and Bycatch Reduction Act passed the Senate on September 14th this year. The bill was then sent to the House on September 17th. This federal bill would sunset fishing with large mesh drift gillnets uh, within five years of enactment. Uh, the bill would also enable grants for forfeiture of the gear or pur purchase of alternative gear with minimal incidental bycatch. So just a brief update on that bill. Uh, the second update in our report has to do with deep set buoy gear authorization. NIMS recently closed public comment on a draft EIS for authorizing deep set buoy gear as a legal gear type under the HMS FMP. And we're currently drafting responses to the comments we received and working to initiate ESA consultation with our protected resources division. We plan to publish the proposed rule package, including a draft FMP amendment for public comment in the spring of 2022, and to publish final regulations shortly thereafter. We anticipate that it will take one year to qualify applicants according to the tiered qualifying criteria adopted by the council in March 2021, and to allow time for resolving any appeals on limited entry permit decisions should they arise. Given this, we are targeting issuance of the first 50 limited entry permits in the summer of 2023. So just a short update on the status of where NIMS is in authorizing deep set buoy gear. And those are the only two updates in the report and I'm open for any questions. Thank you. All right, thank you, Lyle. Let's see if there are any questions from around the table, the virtual table. And I'm not seeing any questions on your report. Thank you very much. Um, so if Dale Sweetnam is with us, we can uh, receive the Science Center presentation. Welcome, Dale. Thank you. Can you hear me OK? You bet. Good. Uh, Chairman Gorelnik, uh, council members, I will be presenting an update of scientific research occurring on HMS species that continues throughout the COVID-9 uh, pandemic period. Um, this research represents contributions from the following individuals that are on the screen uh, from the Southwest Fishery Science Center, as well as Scripps Institution of Oceanography and the Pacific Islands Fishery Science Center. The majority of this presentation uh, was presented to the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission in September of this year. Next slide. This presentation will focus on recent collaborative research on HMS, updates on albacore, Pacific bluefin tuna, billfish, and OPA research, ISC upcoming assessments for 2022, and um, Fishful Future, a collaborative salt and stall Kennedy HMS project. Next slide. 
Um, the research would not be possible without our diverse partners ranging from government organizations like uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife to uh, fishing partners like AFRF and SAC and commercial passenger fishing vessels to processors like Five Star and Catalina Offshore Products and Academia. This presentation has been condensed severely and information and references on the research will be provided at the end of the talk so you can go back and return and, and get more information. Next slide. Uh, we'll start with albacore, most, uh, the most important commercial fishery for HMS on the West Coast. Um, long time series of diet data has allowed for better characterization of diet uh, to uh, the ability to impact uh, examine the impact of catchability, determine ecological and oceanographic covariance. And last year, for the first time, the HMS diet, albacore diet, was included in the state of the California current report. Working to fill data gaps identified by the stock assessment team, the most relevant relate to CPS and the lack of information on sex ratio and sex-specific growth curves. In collaboration with Westport Seafoods and the American Fishermen's Research Foundation, we are getting albacore lengths, weights, locations, gonads, stomachs, and heads from which we can get otoliths and tissues that will allow us to determine sex using the new genetic markers that have been identified. Next slide. Uh, in 2021, 78 archival tags were deployed in Albacore, Cutoff, Oregon, and Washington uh, by commercial fishermen as part of our collaboration with the American Fishermen's Research Foundation. Due to COVID, um, Southwest fishery sciences, scientists were not able to travel and deploy the tags themselves. As a result, a tagging training video was created and was sent to commercial fishermen who then deployed the tags successfully themselves, which was a huge effort. We are now asking captains that catch a tagged albacore to please return the whole fish and the tag uh, for a reward of $500. Recover tags will provide insight into numerous areas of interest. Uh, next slide. You can do some interesting things with tagging data other than just looking at migratory tracks. In this study, we used the differences between the ambient and internal body temperatures or heat increment of feeding to estimate foraging success in albacore. You can see at the figure at the left, the internal body temperature of albacore can increase from five to seven degrees above ambient during the day as they catch and digest the prey. One of our main finding was, findings was that the proportion of juvenile albacore seemed to move offshore in the fall in anticipation of favorable foraging opportunities in the Central Pacific during the spring. You can see in the figure at the right where the heat increment of feeding was much lower in the fall, that's the blue areas on the top, versus um, the spring areas where you can see the much higher increment of uh, uh, feeding occurring. Um, let's see. Um, the, the instance of higher offshore transition known was uh, during during the spring. Uh, next next slide. In terms of illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, um, we have a two-year project funded by uh, NOAA's Office of Law Enforcement um, that's uh, headed by the Southwest Fisheries Team from Environmental Research Division and Fisheries Resources Division to work on highlighting potential high-risk areas for IUU fishing in the North Pacific. So they're taking um, models for juvenile and albacore, uh, and al adult albacore to examine the long, long line fishing fleet dynamics and, and figure out where the potential areas of IUU fishing may occur and then collaborate with the Office of Law Enforcement and the US Coast Guard and industry. Our next slide. Uh, results of the North Pacific Albacore Management strategy, strategy Evaluation were presented to the U.S. and Canadian managers and stakeholders on 
March 22 to 25, 2021, during the virtual workshop. Similar stakeholder workshops were also held in Japan in March and in Taiwan in April. The Albacore MSE uh, report was reviewed by the virtual 2021 plenary meeting on July 12th through the 15th. The ISC plenary endorsed the MSE results and reiterated that no additional MSE work uh, is anticipated at this time. The Albacore MSE report and recorded video present presentation were provided to the statistical committee meeting uh, number 17. Uh, for the Western Central Pacific and results from the ISC report uh, were presented to the Northern Committee on October 4th, 2021. Desiree Tomasi um, has been advising Kitto and Jessica Watson of the HMSMT on developing a Shiny app, which is using our code to present MSE results to stakeholders. And that's in the works. Uh, next slide. As far as bluefin tuna research, uh, lengths to weight regressions uh, need to be update, updated to identify data gaps. Um, this is the first step in compiling data and, and identifying those gaps. In addition, that close kin work, um, which was started in 2015, um, excuse me, 20, 2015, um, for identifying uh, genetic stocks has been ongoing and will continue. Uh, foraging ecology data uh, will be used to better integrate HMS into eco ecosystem assessments, manuscript covering bluefin diets in the Southern California Bight from 2008 to 2016 is in final preparation for publication. And we are using microchemistry to examine nursery origin of adults and evaluate movement patterns of adult fish from locations throughout the Pacific. Uh, next slide. Um, as far as bluefin in the Southern California Bight, um, NOAA sampling effort uh, and those done by the um, Sport Fish Association of California um, have provided length compositions uh, for the last few years. Um, and you can see that they are, are pretty similar. Um, there is some a little difference, but um, the comparison are, are pretty good. The NOAA samples are in blue and the uh, SAC samples are in red. And in 2020, when NOAA was unable to sample due to the COVID restrictions, SAC was able to sample their own fleet and, and provide that data. So you can see that we've got um, a lot of uh, uh, information coming in from um, the party, party boats on um, uh, what's being caught in the Southern California Biden in Mexico. Uh, next slide. Uh, bellfish are also moving into the California current large marine, marine ecosystem to forage. Um, we've been tracking movement dynamics through other lift microchemistry to determine uh, locations for where, where they were. Um, and in the foraging ecology, you can also see that diets have shifted over time um, in the bottom left-hand side of the, the screen. Uh, blue is um, the fish and the brown is uh, squid. Uh, so you can see that there's been changes of diets uh, through the uh, 2007 to 2014. Um, so that there's a highly variable uh, diet shift with um, swordfish, and they're very similar to uh, big eye fishing uh, diets. So they appear to forage in the same areas. And next slide. Uh, we have two, two um, species of opa, big eye and, and small eye opa, um, that are found in, in the Eastern Pacific here. And, and their ranges overlap, and, and we're doing a lot of work to train and determine um, species uh, uh, distribution as well as um, abundance, working uh, with Pyro to collect species-specific catch data um, 
and waiting for uh, new species codes for both the small and big eye OPA. They originally have just been um, put into one single category. And so we're trying to determine differences if we can go back and, and correct for uh, species differences. Um, very little no is known about where and when um, OPA spawn and how fast they grow and how, how old they become. Samples were historically hard to come by and present unique challenges such as the otoliths, which are not easy to age because they are formed in a much different way than other fish. And samples are more readily available and methods are in development to determine this. Next slide. Uh, in terms of upcoming uh, ISC activities, there's currently a shark working group meeting on blue, blue shark data prep. Uh, November 19th, uh, or 9 to 19, and then there's uh, the Pacific Bluefin Tuna Working Group meeting in December of this year to prep for the Bluefin Assessment in February of next year and the Blue Shark Assessment in April of next year. And I've identified the ISC plenary meeting uh, July 13th to 18th uh, next summer. Hopefully, hopefully that'll be in person. Okay, next slide. Uh, the last slide is, is on a Salt and Stall Kennedy grant with Catalina Offshore product, Products to foster culinary and non-culinary solutions to undervalued or discarded products um, using such things, um, reducing waste by using it as organic fertilizer, high-end pet food, um, lobster and crab bait, jewelry, um, adding uh, access value to the product by um, doing <laughs> some unique uh, things with OPA and other, other species, um, dry aging, having smoke fish, and um, uh, burger, sausage, and spam, and, and different uh, characterizations. And then uh, feasible, feasibility studies with uh, fish leather, fish skin bandages, pharmaceuticals, fish oils, um, collagen, and fish silage. Um, and this um, fish, Fishful Future has its own website at fishfulfuture.com. Um, so take a look at that as well. Um, uh, that's what all I have for you today. Um, I ran through it really quickly. Um, sorry for that. I just wanted to keep things on track here. Um, and um, if you go to the next slide, there's uh, uh, references for all, all the stuff that I've talked about. So you can go back and, f and find a lot more information. Thank you very much. Hey, Dale, thanks for that presentation. As an aspiring HMS angler, I always uh, want to hear more about tunas. Let me see if there's any, um, if there are any questions from around the table on your presentation. Thank you very much, Dale. Thank you very much. Well, that's what we have for reports. There uh, are no advisory bodies that I'm aware of. Um, uh, let me check and see if there's any uh, public comments. I'm not seeing any public comments. So that takes us to uh, any discussion we might have uh, on this agenda item on the uh, NIMS report. If any. I'm not seeing any hands. So Kit, <clears throat> uh, can we deem H1 completed? Uh, yes, sir. I believe so. All right. Well, let's uh, move right into H2, international management activities. So I'll toss it right back to you, Kit. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll read from the uh, situation summary for this topic. Uh, and it basically covers the outcomes of uh, three 
relevant meetings that happened uh, since your last council meeting. The first is the uh, Northern Committee meeting of the WCPFC that occurred in early October. In your briefing materials, attachment one is the report of the meeting. Uh, the N the N Northern Committee reviewed um, a uh, chair's draft amendment to the cons conservation and management measure for Pacific Bluefin tuna. And that was an outcome of the uh, joint working group meeting that uh, you heard about, uh, I believe in September, you heard the results of that meeting. And um, also a uh, working paper, a draft harvest strategy for uh, PBF fisheries um, and, the, and that is a revision to, um, to the harvest strategy there. So that's more um, sort of long-term. Uh, Northern Committee members uh, that are also members of the Foreign Fish Fisheries Agency, and that's the Cook Islands, Fiji and Vanuatu, initially opposed the proposed catch limit increases in the draft amendment to uh, the conservation measure, arguing that uh, the 2020 stock assessment did not adequately capture uncertainty in model parameters. Uh, the U.S. pointed out that the stock assessment was previously endorsed by the WCPFC's scientific committee and uh, the, also the joint working group, uh, and where FFA members had the opportunity to raise such concerns uh, so ultimately, the FFA members did not block consensus on the uh, NC recommended uh, and the Northern Committee recommended adopting uh, uh, having the WCPFC at their full commission meeting adopt the revised uh, conservation and measure and management measure. Um, also, the uh, Harvest strategy revision was uh, recommended for adoption by the WCPFC without adoption. Although the Northern Committee requested the International Scientific Committee develop recommendations for a definition of a drastic drop in recruitment as referenced in the harvest strategy. And, and then Chinese Taipei, Japan and the US presented a proposed request from the Northern Committee to ISC for projections to be made using the results of the planned next year's uh, update stock assessment and specified catch increase scenarios. And there are references throughout here to attachments to the Northern Committee report that contain uh, these proposals and so on. Uh, the, uh, this proposal was adopted by the Northern Committee as a request of the ISC. The NC then reviewed and discussed the North Pacific albacore fishing effort data. And that's in a working paper. Uh, also, you can find it as an attachment to the summary report, um, particularly focusing on revised fishing effort limits submitted by Vanuatu uh, for the baseline period and apparent discrepancies in Korea's reporting of fishing effort by number of vessels and fishing days. Uh, and the uh, that finally the Northern Committee, as they always do, re reviewed and revised their upcoming work program, in this case for 2022 through 2024. So that's all, all, the, all the business or most of the business that occurred at the Northern Committee meeting online, of course. Uh, next, uh, Permanent Advisory Committee to the U.S. section of the WCPFC, the PAC, met online also uh, and adopted a revised recommendations for positions the U.S. can take at the upcoming regular session of the WCPFC. And that's, in, that's included in your briefing materials as attachment two. And just a note here that the WCPFC 18, the, the uh, annual regular session is scheduled uh, coming up here in a, in a couple of weeks, uh, starting right at the end of November, continuing into early December. And just as an FYI, the annotated agenda has been included as attachment three in your materials, uh, adoption of a conservation and measure, conservation and management measure to succeed 
the expiring measure for the conservation of the tropical tunas, that is big, big eye yellowfin and skipjack tuna, uh, of course in the Western Central Pacific, will be a major focus of the meeting. And the chair of the WCP, WCPFC held a couple of online workshops to help the com commission uh, consider the structure and content of a new measure. And uh, she is also developing a cons consultative draft proposal, which is another way to facilitate adoption, try to get some traction and, and at least work towards some consensus on elements of the proposal in advance of the annual session that's coming up here pretty soon. And uh, also the commission will consider adoption of the two bluefin related measures that were uh, endorsed by the Northern Committee and mentioned earlier in my summary, along with a variety of other actions. And um, the PAC recommendations are a useful guide. They pretty comp comprehensively go through all the business that the WCPFC is going to take up and consider at their meeting and make recommendations on those items. So that's a good source to get a, a sense of what those other broad range of other issues are and and what the perspectives of U.S. stakeholders are in that regard. And then finally, or third, um, the IATTC held um, a resume meeting in October. They met in, in uh, late August, um, and, but was not able at that time to make much progress on some key things um, in, in particular um, of interest to um, us here on the West Coast was adoption of a resolution on uh, bluefin management. So they met uh, in October and uh, the, the, um, the situation summary, since I was drafting it about the time that they were meeting, uh, doesn't have information on the outcomes of that meeting, but um, you have a couple of uh, reports from uh, from National Marine Fisheries Service that provide you uh, outcomes of that meeting and some information relevant to the domestic impl implementation of uh, the catch limits for um, bluefin. And uh, so I'll just run through the, uh, what the, ma the materials you have, both what were in the advanced briefing book and the supplemental items. So. There were three attachments. Those were all already mentioned in my overview, the NC report, um, the PAC meeting rec uh, recommendations, and the, an agenda for the upcoming annual uh, WCPFC meeting. Um, and then there's a supplemental, supplemental attachment four, and that's um, just a message from uh, Dorothy Lohman, co-chair of the joint working group uh, with, um, just sort of informing uh, the interested parties about the outcomes of uh, the IATTC meeting with regard to adoption of a resolution on bluefin. Um, I already mentioned uh, that there are two NIMS reports and that uh, I think Ryan Wolf will uh, give you a presentation on or give you an overview of. And then you have from your um, advisory bodies, there's a supplemental HMSMT report and a supplemental HMSAS report. Uh, and that covers the materials uh, that you have before you. And just to wrap up here, uh, reading the council action here is to provide recommendations on US positions for the 18th regular session of the WCPFC and other upcoming meetings and other forums as appropriate. And uh, that concludes my overview, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Kit, for that thorough overview. <clears throat> Are there any questions of Kit before we move on to the reports? Okay. Uh, I think we'll first turn to Commissioner Krista Svensson with a report, I understand. Yes, and I hope you can hear me since I have had to kind of toggle back and forth between um, audio on computer and phone. So um, hopefully I'm good. 
It's crystal clear. Oh, good. Okay. Well, thank you for giving me a few minutes to report on activities relating to WCPFC this afternoon, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to just talk about a few items that have been ongoing since the September meeting and the primary activities that I've been involved with have been attendance at the PAC meeting with the recommendations that were outlined in agenda item H2, attachment 2. Um, I am going to take a few minutes to comment on a few of their recommendations, and while I'm supporting and supportive of all of them, um, I do want to talk about a few that are relevant to our West Coast stakeholders. Um, I think it's encouraging that the PAC is making the recommendation in paragraph 24 to submit a new or revised conservation measure for North Pacific Stripe Marlin, as that's highly important to our recreational fishers. I'm also highly supportive of the recommendation on the need to stress urgency in progress on the development of harvest strategies, including the need to set limit and target reference points and harvest control rules for all of the reasons outlined in paragraph 51. Um, and if other council members have differences of opinion, I'd be interested in hearing on any and all of these, but, but specifically this one, I don't expect that, but just there's been a lot of discussion um, within industry and within the conservation community about that need. And so um, just giving everybody else one last opportunity to raise their hands. And um, with regard to Elbacore, uh, the recommendation that came forward to hold at least one meeting for U.S. domestic stakeholders to discuss inputs into North Pacific Elbacore harvest strategy based upon the MS. E results, I think, is an important one. U.S. stakeholders have been very active in the process since the onset, um, including spend, spending their own money to send stakeholders over to Japan when we first got started. And I think that it is important to continue that level of engagement, um, particularly with the irregularity in landings we've seen in the last few seasons. In addition to the PAC meeting and my role of acting commissioner, for PFMC, I've been participating in U.S. bilateral meetings in the lead up to the 18th regular session of the WCPFC beginning at the end of this month. Um, that has started and I will be missing a few of those meetings um, because of the council meeting and I think that that is a positive as well. It's great to be here with all of you. And then one area I have been um, following and I think is important to raise a little more awareness on is the ongoing work with regard to labor standards. Um, it's mentioned in the PAC report under paragraph 62. And the reason I bring this up is because this conversation is ongoing, not just in the WCPFC, but in general, um, in communities all over the world. Um, it relates to the International Labor Organization's Convention uh, 188, which is work in fisheries. That's what most of the um, policy or advocacy is, is based upon. That is uh, something that the U.S. is not a signatory to. And so um, a lot of the recommendations that are coming forward, I do think that our stakeholders, particularly those that are you know, based out of Western states, whether they're Oregon, Washington, or California, um, but have, may have activities in the South Pacific um, or North Pacific Albacore, um, they do need to be aware of that. They should take the time. There originally was a second workshop that was scheduled to be held today. That's been postponed until after um, the meeting, the standard meeting. Um, beginning at the end of the month and uh, just recommending everybody take a look at that, get their feedback in and raising some awareness for all of us about it. And in conclusion, I would like to say, I really appreciate the opportunity to serve in this role and I'm looking forward to seeing some of you at the November and December WCPFC sec session. All right, does that conclude your report, Krista? That does conclude my report. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Chair. So um, leaving aside discussion, which we'll have later, are there any questions of Krista? 
on her report. Uh, I have a question, Krista. Um, you made reference to labor standards. Um, I understand there is a bill in Congress dealing with illegal fishing and human rights abuses. Has, has that entered the discussion at all? And how will that impact uh, you know, the, the position of the United States in international forums? Yeah, so that has not entered specifically in the workshop discussion. I will say that a lot of the, again, the overarching conversation and the framework around that is based around um, the ILO convention. So that's that convention 188. It, it occurred in 2007. Um, most of it has to do with, um, at least from the U.S. perspective, in terms of what, what is concerning for U.S. stakeholders that, that have voiced their opinion so far. A lot of it has to do with um, hours worked. Um, so one of the requirements is that you um, have no more than 77 hours on average per week um, worked. Some of it um, has to do with hours um, active working during the day. So, you know, if you're actively fishing, no less than six hours. If you're not actively fishing, no less than 10 hours of continuous rest during a fishing day or, or during a day in general. Um, there are some issues around wages. Um, so again, you know, typically in many of our fisheries, we pay on cruise share. Um, there are a lot of recommendations in the international community based upon paying at 30 days um, and having um, at the very least a minimum wage um, and in some cases a living wage. And those are two very different things, as most of us know. Um, so, so the legislation that's going on in the U.S. government, definitely aware of what's going on at the international level um, and um, really working to create a level playing field for everybody so that we have best practices in the U.S. and beyond um, and, and how that intertwines, whether it's WCPFC or any of the other RFMOs or um, fisheries organizations for that matter. Um, I think I think that that will long term be negotiated through these types of processes. I hope that answers your question. All right, thank you very much, Krista. Um, we will now uh, there are a couple of NIMS reports, and I'll turn to Ryan Wolf. Ryan, thank you, Mr. Chair. One moment. Okay. So we have two supplemental NIMPS reports under this item. Um, I, I won't speak to the WCPFC, cover that well as did Krista, so I'm going to focus on the outcomes of the IATTC meeting, which is our first report, and then our second report, which provides information intended to inform the discussion on, on how we'll implement the new Pacific Bluefin Tuna Resolution, which I'll walk through. So for the first report, um, I do want to take some time to discuss uh, and to report out um, what happened at the IATTC. Uh, it was quite an unusual year. Uh, we had three virtual meetings, uh, the last one in October. I know, I know we've spoken to the previous ones, but just as a reminder, we met in June to solely try and come to agreement on tropical tuna measures that failed. Then we met in August, which was supposed to be the commission meeting. Um, prior to that, uh, the chair um, said that we would only discuss tropical tuna um, and bluefin tuna at that meeting, our temperate tunas. Uh, we failed again to reach any um, conservation and management measures uh, at the August meeting. However, we did get uh, some edits to the long-term rebuilding plan and, and management measure for bluefin at that meeting, as well as uh, an approval uh, for a scheme to adopt an electronic monitoring program by, I believe it's 2025. Um, but the process to start now with various workshops to start to get things in place. Um, and that needed to be endorsed and it was endorsed uh, at the August meeting. So turning to October, um, I could say once again, uh, it was quite the virtual challenge. Um, 
Uh, I, once again, they trying to negotiate international uh, resolutions, especially some of the complex ones we had before us, when inevitably you've got at least a few members who are meeting from one to four in the morning um, throughout the week. It makes, makes it challenging to say the least. Um, but somehow we managed to make our way through. Uh, we had five uh, important resolutions adopted. Well, one of those, uh, it was the budget for the fiscal year 22, but that was important as well, which I'll touch on in a minute. Um, and you can see here, there's there's a description in, in, in we touch on whether they require rulemaking in a timeline, but I wanna walk through some of these uh, and then happy to take questions. So for the tropical tuna measure, um, that applies for three years. This is another three year measure, just like the last one. Well, we had a one year rollover because of the pandemic um, 2020, but the, the last uh, major measure was a three year measure. And that's what the commission at least now seems to be trending towards is, is the durations that they like. Um, <clears throat> it does have managed measures for both persane and long line fishing vessels in the EPO. Um, it, so we did roll over a number of status quo measures. We didn't start from scratch. We kept the, you know, the core Lido, the 72 day closures, the long line tax, and, and then some measures on fads, which then got augmented. Uh, the big discussion, and, and this is what took us multiple meetings to get to, uh, was to try and find some additional measure that would address uh, the big eye tuna situation, in, in particular the bimodal um, assessments and the, the potential that uh, the stock could be in worse shape than we think. Uh, and also we noted that there was a large proportion, almost 50% or more of the big eye catch that was being caught by a smaller number of first thing vessels, a very, a very small percentage of the fleet. Um, so how we addressed that uh, was adopting a new annual individual vessel limit for the catch of big eye tuna by the per se vessels. And if that is exceeded, uh, there is corresponding penalties of extended closure days the following year uh, for those vessels that have that exceeded. Um, you know, so in in general, for every, um, I don't know specifics right now, but it, every few hundred metric tons you go over, you're adding additional days of closure, uh, and and so on and so on. So it can get to be a pretty substantive penalty if if high levels of a big eye work continue to be pursued by individual vessels. Uh, there's also some further reductions that are in, in a gradual nature, but it get gets uh, to d additional decreases to the number of active fish aggregating devices or fads um, that can be used. There are now new controls on uh, when you, and how you can deactivate or reactivate a buoy, fad buoy, uh, and some additional fad buoy data reporting requirements that will go to the scientific staff or the secretary and help facilitate additional fad, fad management in the future. Um, there's an enhanced ITTC port sampling program. So when you set up an individual vessel limit, right, we, we need to have a, a much more robust uh, monitoring program uh, to ensure uh, that CPCs or contract parties have the ability to um, monitor and then implement effective measures on their vessels uh, if they are looking like they're going to exceed um, or approach the limit. That is why I note that the uh, resolution on, on a budget was, was very notable this year. Uh, for those that aren't familiar, it is very rare these days to get an international body to agree to an increase uh, in commission members' dues, especially during the pandemic when, when countries uh, around the world uh, are, are facing significant challenges um, budgetary wise. Uh, however, this was such a key pillar of the program, we did get agreement um, on a, uh, additional funds to support a, what's roughly will end up being a you know, half year or a little more pilot port sampling program, which would then become the basis for a, a longer term augmented program uh, to facilitate this little bit more real time management. Um, but we will also need to revisit that at next year's meeting for the, you know, whether this be, and how this will become a permanent budget fix. Uh, and then of course the debate there will focus on whether it should be funded by per se vessels alone um, or the entire uh, commission. 
Um, so that's tropical tunas and was the, the dominant uh, discussion point uh, in challenge of the meeting. Um, we did uh, also adopt a new short year, a short term, excuse me, the three year resolution on Pacific bluefin tuna. Uh, of course, it's just the US and Mexico that harvest that in the EPO. So it was mainly the commission waiting on us to come to agreement, uh, which we were not able to do um, in August, but we were successful at this meeting. Um, uh, it is very similar in structure, uh, although it's instead of a, it's a three-year measure, which it, which was important to us for a number of reasons. It, it syncs us with the 2024 uh, benchmark assessment, and it also allows us to maintain this biennium structure. So um, it includes the current year of 2021 so that the resolution itself shows two separate bienniums, but, but all of the new catch limits only are attributable to 2022 to 2024, which I'll go into in a minute. Uh, I do want to point out two important pieces in this. The first is there's a new uh, paragraph one, um, which highlights and ensures that the commission will consider historical catches in respective members EEZs when they're considering um, any increase to catch limits after the stock has hit its second rebuilding target, and uh, uh, which is, of course, when we would anticipate further um, catch it to be discussed uh, and this is something the u.s pushed very very hard for um you know we have long been looking for um, greater acknowledgement um, of the larger proportion of historical harvest that our vessels have um, taken in in our easy uh, and that the current allocation between us and mexico is not reflective of that at present um, and then second is, of course, the increase, which we discussed previously, I think in September, uh, as a result of the joint working group meeting. Um, these also uh, start to take us into a more equitable uh, balance between the U.S. and Mexico with a, it's a larger percentage um, than typical coming to the U.S., uh, or at least been what has been in previous resolutions. So what this has resulted in is a final biennium catch limit for the U.S. in 21 and 22 of 739 metric tons, not to exceed 523 metric tons in a single year. So keep in mind that biennium is 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 kind of split between the increase of the new measure, which is only uh, attributable to 2022, and then the old measure of 2021. So for the next clean biennium, if you will, um, solely dealing with this agreement that uh, would be 2023 and 2024, the U.S. catch limit is 1,017 metric tons and not to exceed 720 metric tons in a single year. Uh, and then, like I said, there's similar um, to previous resolutions. Uh, you've got, you can carry under harvest forward from the previous biennium an amount not to exceed 5%. Um, this is all consistent with how the measure was before. So those are the two um, big focuses, but definitely from a U.S. perspective. Um, they will both require rulemaking. We do intend to publish proposed rules in December, uh, both of these implementing uh, these measures for the durations of those three years. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how that impacts Bluefin um, in my next report. We're finishing this off. Uh, there are a couple others just to highlight. There was a two-year extension of the existing Silky Shark resolution. Um, this is basically a rollover, so there should be no additional requirements for our fleet, um, but we probably will need a rulemaking, um, which also will publish in December uh, to effectively extend the measure as it was slated to expire this year. Uh, but there's no substantive changes other than the extension. And then finally, big news on the IATTC front, we adopted a port state measures agreement after 10 years, maybe 10 plus years of it being proposed every year and rejected. Um, so this is something the U.S. has been a very big supporter of. Um, the EU is the proponent of it this year, but the U.S. has been uh, very vocal in its support. It requires, among other things, port state inspection of a minimum of 5% of foreign fishing vessels in port, um, communication of detected IUU activity, both to the flag and the coastal states, 
and then investigation by the flag state of any detected IUU activity, um, and it further implements requirements and advances key elements of the UN FAO agreement on porcelain measures uh, to prevent and deter IUU fishing, which the U.S. ratified in, in 2016. We are still evaluating what level of rulemaking may be necessary here or not. I don't have an update for that at this point in time, um, <clears throat> but we have provided a link for those that want a little bit more information to the FAO Port State Measures Agreement um, in the report here. And then finally, I wanted to note um, two other things. We did adopt the U.S. reservations for the Compliance Committee. This is this is also, I think, huge for us. So that there, we will do have, we will have an intersessional workshop, and for the first time, the commission will be presented with information um, of uh, countries that have repeated violations. Uh, or as well as vessels and get to see if we have some individual or, or, or CBC level bad actors uh, and if it's um, not just on the annual basis being able to look back also historically over um, as well as recent years to see if there is a, a trend of non-compliance uh, at the vessel level or, or higher. Uh, and we think this will be incredibly helpful uh, for our future discussions on compliance. And uh, I did want to point out those deadlines at the end. There's an upcoming workshop, and there is uh, now open nominations for our general advisory committee or our scientific advisory subcommittee, and, and there's a federal register notice in the footnote. So if you're interested in soliciting your application, um, the deadline is November 29th, uh, and there's a very specific email address and information for how to submit and what to submit. Uh, and as a reminder, <clears throat> these are all three-year terms. Now, my next report is, is much briefer, but um, I did want to take some time to go over all of the, uh, the many things that happened at IETTC. The, the second report is, 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 is on Bluefin. Um, it's, it's now getting uh, towards our domestic management uh, of this international um, measure. Uh, it does summarize our existing regulations and some considerations for this 22 to 2024 rule. Um, so, uh, again, as I noted, uh, for 2022, as well as the 23, 24 biennium, the catch limits are higher than we've operated uh, for the, under for the last six years. Um, I went through those numbers, uh, so I won't go through them again, but I will say, you know, if you look at the next biennium, 23, 24, um, well, there's a maximum that I went through that the U U.S. may catch up to of 720. Um, keep in mind, it is a biennium. So, for, for example, if we caught that in the first year in 2023, then um, our catch limit in 2024 would be significantly less, uh, 350 or so, for example. So um, we will take all this into account, as well as the recommendations of the council and its advisory bodies when we commence with this rulemaking. Uh, and to this end, we've included a few tables in this report that provide catch information by gear, by year, by quarter, uh, just to help inform the discussion of in-season management of Bluefin amongst the council and its advisory bodies uh, here today. And <clears throat> with that, Mr. Chair, thank you for your indulgence. That concludes my report. Uh, thank you very much, Ryan, for the report, for both reports. And we'll see if there are any questions from council members. John Ugaritz. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Ryan, for the report. Just a um, quick question on the very last part there. It, my understanding is that you would like some input from the council regarding the bluefin limits based on that report and, and the information we're getting from the teams, is that correct? Yes, Mr. Chair, thanks, John, for the question. Yes, that's correct. All right, any other questions of Ryan? And if not, we'll move into uh, the two, two further reports. We'll first hear from the uh, HMS management team, uh, Celia Barroso. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'll be bringing the HMS management team report on international activities and with sincere apologies that it was submitted uh, fairly late, uh, you know, just before this agenda item was being taken up. 
The National Marine Fisheries Service briefed the HMS management team on the outcomes of the 98th meeting continued of the IATTC. Considerations for implementing the adopted IATTC resolution on Bluefin and reviewed the HMS AS statement on these matters. The HMSMT also received a presentation from Desiree Tomasi of the National Marine Fisheries Service Southwest Fisheries Science Center and Jessica Watson of the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, who's also on the HMS management team. And they presented a newly developed North Pacific albacore tuna management strategy evaluation shiny web application. So first off, with regards to domestic implementation of IATTC resolution C2105, in its supplemental report, the HMSAS suggests a management approach that is different for each year in 22 through 24, recognizing the differences in annual limits for each of those years. The current landscape of the bluefin fishery, that is trip and annual limits, market conditions, catchability and availability of fish, may have contributed to the bluefin annual limit not being met in 2020 and 2021. While the HMSMT recognizes that uncertainty in future bluefin landings, that is increased trip, trip and annual limits, uh, changing market conditions, complicates drafting of regulations for a three-year management period, the MT understands and supports that any domestic regulations must conform to internationally agreed limits and should incentivize maximum utilization of that limit by the US fleet while disincentivizing exceeding that limit. The HMSMT supports the AS intent to increase flexibility for US commercial vessels due to the increase in annual limits. The MT supports the trip limit structure proposed by the AS, which is consistent with current regulations for 2021 and approaches to implementing prior Bluefin IATDC resolutions. The MT recognizes uncertainty in the 2024 catch limit because it is dependent on the quantity caught in 2023. And noting this, the MT supports planning for various scenarios where the trip limit structure is contingent on a range of possible catch limits. Regarding the Albacore MSE shiny web application, during the September 21 council meeting, the MT was briefed on the Albacore MSE shiny web application under development to help managers and stakeholders familiarize themselves with this new product. After the fifth international scientific uh, committee for tuna and tuna-like species in the North Pacific Ocean, uh, committee's uh, stakeholder meeting, the shiny web application was developed to provide stakeholders with an interactive method of exploring the results from the from the MSE conducted by the ISC. And we provide a link to the report. This application includes several tabs that help the user understand concepts of the MSE and then an evaluation tool that allows users to make selections and evaluate results of the MSE in relation to their particular concerns about the fishery. The beta version of this application was presented in a joint session of the management team advisory subpanel during this November council meeting with the goal of obtaining feedback on utility and gaining recommendations for refinement. The management team considers this application useful at assisting stakeholders in processing and learning how to use the results of the MSE. The management team thinks that this will be a particularly useful tool as the United States delegations to the IATTC and the WCPFC Northern Committee consider next steps with regards to developing a harvest strategy for North Pacific albacore using the results of the MSE. The Northern Committee has stated its intent to consider retention or modification of a limit reference point and consider adoption of a target reference point based on the results of the MSE in 22. The MT recommends that the council request a presentation of the albacore MSE uh, shiny up under international management at the March 22 council meeting. And that concludes our report. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Celia. Are there any questions on the management team report? Thank you very much, Celia. Uh, we now have a report from the uh, HMS advisory subpanel. Uh, Dave Rudy, welcome, Dave. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Grelnick and Council members. Good afternoon. Um, I'm willing to read this uh, report, or if you prefer, I can sort of talk about our strategy and how we came about to it. Uh, 
whatever your pleasure is. Sorry, I uh, had to change screens to look at the report, which just came out recently. Um, I think that uh, if you can summarize it, uh, that would be appreciated by the council. We do have we do have it in writing in front of us, but uh, just in the interest of efficiency. Sure, thank you. Be glad to do that. So again, our goal was to um, not go over the catch limit and yet approach the catch limit at the same time not closing the season down early at the same time trying to balance between different gear types so we found that a bit challenging but we we have a proposal we think that will work but still there's a lot of unknowns the the data that was presented to us by um, national marine fisheries service showed that the catch rates are very low in the first half of the year the third quarter is always the highest catch and the fourth quarter is the second highest catch Based on that, we tried to have a um, sort of a, um, what's the right word? A, we, 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 didn't want, we didn't want to catch all the fish early in the year. So we wanted to have a buffer built into it so the fishing could continue hopefully until the end of the year. Um, again, considering the different gear types, the different seasonality, the different different um, motivations for, for fishing based on market, based on fish availability, based on other fish that might be more interesting for the fishermen to go after. Again, it gets complicated. But, but the basic idea is we, we start with the higher quota, in some cases 20 metric tons per landing, and one year we're gonna try 30 metric tons when the quota is at three, 720. And then we go down to either 15 or 10 metric tons until a, a buffer is reached and then we drop it down to three metric tons and that's that's the general strategy for the three-year plan and the the idea is that um you know, if our forecasting is correct it'll work fine but since there's so many unknowns we we would like to come have the council schedule some time at least in September of 2023, so we can evaluate how things are going and see if we need to make changes for 2024. So uh, again, we, we really struggled trying to figure out how to set these catch limits in in um, th the three years in the future. Um, National Fisheries Service is requesting one regulation to cover the catch limits through 2024. Most other council managed fisheries can review domestic management measures annually or in some cases during the season. The advisory subpanel asked in the future, the council request National Marine Fisheries Service to investigate ways to adjust domestic catch limits annually. This may require a change in the HMS FMP. So at a minimum, we'd like the council to bring this up for discussion in September 23. And that, uh, that's, that concludes the summary of my report, and I'm certainly open to questions. I know our report was late. We just finished it this morning. Uh, it was uh, some of our, our key members were uh, traveling, and um, it, it took it took a time to try, took a while to try to come up with a plan, especially for 2024. All right, thank you very much, Dave, and, and thank you for those specific uh, recommendations. Uh, are there any questions of the AS? Corey Niles. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Dave. Maybe this is a, a question for um, council discussion or, or, or more for Kit or, or for, for Ryan. But on that, yeah, yeah, you're basically saying forecasting is hard, you know, especially about the future, wherever that saying goes farther into the future. Um, but what, what, what are the constraints on adjustments, uh, annual adjustment? Is it the FMP? I, I, I was under the impression that NIMS has actually authority to act quicker under some of these international authorities than they do under the Magnuson Act. So yeah, yeah. at some point I would be um, curious in hearing the uh, KITS or, or, or NIMS's elaboration to that last paragraph the AS is, is bringing up. So, so thank you for that question, um, uh, Councilmember Niles. I believe some of the uh, regulatory issues have to do with this is under TUNA convention as opposed to MSA. Uh, I don't completely understand um, all that, but uh, nonetheless, the more complicated issue is since the, it's a biennial uh, catch limit and we have ele approximately 1,100 metric tons available in the 23 to 24 season, 
We just don't know how much it's going to be caught in the 2023 season. If we have a, if we hit the maximum, which is 720 in 23, then we'll have a low catch limit in 24, which requires a little bit different approach in terms of trying to balance the gear types. Whereas if we have a low catch in 2023, we can use a different approach in 2024. Does that answer your question, Corey? At least to the extent the AS can answer it? Yeah, again, I thank you, um, Dave. But yeah, if, if when we get to the appropriate point, and I see John has a question here too, or an answer, but a refresher on how that all works would be good. Great. Uh, well, all right, uh, John, please. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks. Dave, for the report, just two pretty simple questions, I hope. I, I noticed that for 2022, you're talking about when catch reaches a certain amount. And then for subsequent years, you're talking, uh, and, and in 23, 24, but for 24 you're staying when it's within the annual limit so i just want to make sure that that's intentional and that it kind of there's a difference between when catch reaches something and when it's within the limit uh councilman Ugers, thank you very much for the question yes that has to do with the uncertainty in 2024 so again we pretty much know the catch limit will be 720 metric tons in 2023 but the catch limit for 2024 will be 1,100 metric tons minus whatever gets caught in 2023. So it could be 720 if we have a bad year in 2023, or it could be as low as around 300 metric tons if we have a, if we get the 720 in 2023. So that's that's why instead of having a formula of when the catch approaches a hits a certain number, we did the reverse and said. We tried to set these buffers in place to say, whatever that number is for 2024 is 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 going to be unknown. So we go with, we have this buffer built in, so we don't go, we don't close the season early. Thanks, Dave and Mr. Chair. If I may ask one other question. Of course. Thanks. Um, that helps a lot. And, and then the only other question I have is with regard to how you generated these numbers, um, is, is there anything special, for instance, about 105 metric tons at the end of the season in, in, in a given year versus 100 tons? It, or was that just a, a portion of the catch? Or I'm kind of trying to figure that out. It's, um... It's trying trying to project uh, current fishing practices now in this quarter, this fourth quarter of 2021, and trying to uh, speculate what it might be in 2024. So currently, um, we're experiencing high catches of bluefin tuna in the fourth quarter, and if we did not have enough of a buffer, we would be closing the se season now. So if the if uh, other gear types had had maximized their catch early in the year, we would probably be closing the season now. So again, we're trying to, based on current information, current catch catching activity that I'm aware of because I'm I'm one of the buyers of Bluefin, trying again trying to forecast what might happen three years in the future. But no, it's no real, no exact formula. Just that. Um, um, there is there is an increasing um, fishery from with hook and line, and there's also an increasing fishery with drift net from bluefin. Hey John, does that uh, answer your questions? Thank you very much. It does. All right. Uh, any other questions of the AS? All right. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, that completes the reports we have and brings us to public comment. 
I believe there is one uh, card turned in. I think that's by Teresa Labriola. So welcome, Teresa. Um, good afternoon, Chair Gorelnik and members of the council. I'm Teresa Labriola, representing Wild Oceans. Uh, Wild Oceans has over 45 years of history working nationally and internationally to develop innovative approaches and solutions for fisheries management that preserves healthy ocean ecosystems and fisheries fishing opportunities for the future. And at our core, we value our responsibility to provide future generations with the same fishing opportunities or better fishing opportunities than we've enjoyed. Um, although we have seen historic levels of bluefin tuna in the Eastern Pacific, um, the stock still remains in dire straits with estimates of current spawning stock biomass at just 7%. Um, International managers have agreed to precautionary limits with an aim at returning the stock to 20% spawning stock biomass in the next decade. And we support and hope the council supports, continues to support the recommendations um, internationally and, and made by the Permanent Advisory Committee to adopt um, uh, the, right, the, the recommendations agreed on by the Joint Working Group on Pacific Bluefin Tuna. Um, with regards to domestic uh, management, our number one priority is to support the goal of rebuilding bluefin by ensuring the conservation and management measures are met um, oceanwide, but especially in our waters, and that they're not exceeded. Um, exceeding annual limits increases risk oceanwide to the health of bluefin, and it calls into question our collective commitment to rebuilding this treasured stock. Um, and the proposal by the HMSAS really goes a long way towards allowing diverse commercial opportunities while reducing our risk of exceeding our quota in the next three years. Um, they propose larger buffers, um, but they also propose larger quotas. Um, so we continue to have some concerns about a rule that relies on trip limits. Um, they, that may not ensure the conservation of management measures are met, but I, I think this is definitely on the right track. Um, my concerns stem from the recent history in 2017. If you look back, um, it's when the, the U.S. exceeded its commercial limit um, by catching uh, the Persane fleet specifically caught 270 metric tons of bluefin in just four days. Um, landings from nine of those vessels exceeded 20 metric tons. So if a similar successive landings were made in 2022 or 2023 or 2024, uh, that fleet would land about 180 metric tons of bluefin tuna, which is why that buffer is so important. Um, why that, that last 2024 recommendation by the advisory sub panel that um, works on how much annual limit is left is, is a good idea because you're, you're trying to make sure that that, um, that can't happen. Um, if that does happen, uh, it could result in us exceeding our limit or closing very uh, the small scale high profit hook and line fishery we've seen developing in uh, mostly in Southern California, or causing the discards regulatory discards of uh, Pacific bluefin tuna in the drift gillnet fishery. Um, we, we've actually recently just gotten a better look at the amount of bluefin tuna caught in the drift gillnet fishery, and it seems to be um, increasing and actually uh, a subject of targeting by that fleet in the, in the past two years. Um, so the quick analysis of the proposal shows that there is a concerted effort to leave a large enough buzz for it to protect against, to protect us against an event like 2017. Um, and in the past few years, Persian activity has been trimmed. So, um, but we could probably expect this to change with continued bluefin uh, availability and an increase in, in quota from uh, 15 up to 30 metric tons for a trip. Um, we would like just a discussion of uh, eliminating this uncertainty by reinstating pre-trip notification. The pre-trip was put in place as a check on the fleet. Um, it allows us to predict future effort and requiring a boat to declare their intention to fish before leaving the dock helps us ensure that we don't exceed available catch. Um, without it, fishermen are incentivized to take advantage of opportunities on the water. And while that's good, that could also result in an overage. Um, one um, one uh, compromise here would be to consider installing a pre-trip notification 
once a threshold of bluefin are caught or once the remaining quota is below a certain amount, like 250 metric tons. Um, this would allow for opportunities when the quota is 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 unexploited and uh, it would require some pre-trip notification as we get closer to that, that buffer. Um, and it would protect us from exceeding our limit. Um, so just some food for thought there. Uh, bluefin tuna are a backbone species and a historic recreational uh, species that has inspired a lot of new and experienced anglers to get very excited and engaged again. Um, and we support the robust international policies and domestic implementation to protect Pacific bluefin tuna as a top predator in the ocean and ensure um, fishing opportunities for future generations. So thanks, and I'll take any questions. Thank you very much, Teresa, for your testimony. Are there any questions of Teresa? Thank you very much, Teresa. Uh, that concludes a public comment and takes us to our council action, which will be up on the screen there, uh, to provide recommendations. Um, so I guess uh, I'll open the floor, Ryan Wolf, followed by John Ugaritz. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I just wanted to respond, I think, to Corey's question or just make sure that um, I think I understood it regarding our ability um, to make changes to the regulations. Uh, um, and could have clarified this when I was giving my report. I mean, this, this uh, you know, we are, our intent is to do three years, cover this three years of measure through a domestic rulemaking that will be done under the Tuna Convention Act. So it's different, right? It's not a Magnuson action. Uh, therefore, um, you know, we can do in-season management as um, if it's laid out, you know, in the rulemaking, like we've we've had in 2021, and, and it's been discussed here. But if we came upon whether it was in 2022, 2023, for for whatever fitting year, if, there, if we wanted to make revisions to the regulations, that is just a um, a process that the the United States can do at any time to amend its its implementing regulations, as long as we are doing it in a manner that's still consistent with the overall international measures. So it's something we can do at a relatively quick pace if needed. And I hope that answers this question. Does that work for you, Corey? Thanks, Mr. Chair. And um, thanks, Ryan. You probably ask you this every time we do this. But yeah, um, that was my understanding. But what I heard the AS saying was they, they might like to, to do that um, if, if this plan, if we were to have a plan along the lines of what they're proposing, um, and it works well, then you can you can run it in season without changing the regulations. But if it turned out that uh, uh, you know new new information says maybe that wasn't the best approach, then then we could you all could still change it uh, next year, for example. And that's what I, that's what I'm hearing you say is is possible. So um, yeah, I think that clears it up for me. Appreciate it. If, if I've got that summary right. All right, good. Thank you. Uh, John Ugaritz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I wanted to go back to 2017 and what's happened since then. Um, we've, we've strived significantly to avoid the overage that we had in 2017 from reoccurring and it, it has not reoccurred though total catch has remained relatively low since then but a couple other key things have changed um, etix is now fully operational and we've had a 24-hour mandatory reporting requirement for bluefin since that time um, i feel based on our experience with ETIX and my staff's experience on the docks, that we have a much better ability to manage bluefin catch in season the way we do some other species um, that we didn't have before. And while I was very supportive of pre-trip notifications when we implemented them after 2017, the 
the reality was that it ended up forcing the fleet to notify when they really weren't sure if they were going to catch anything. And it did result in an early closure that then had to be reversed, um, which from both a management and a fishery standpoint was, was not ideal. Um, I think the key thing here, and, and I think the team has done, excuse me, the, the advisory sub panel has done a great job of laying out uh, a proposal that is nearly what I would suggest in terms of leaving enough of a buffer in quota so that the trip limit reduces to a point that it is manageable so that we do not uh, exceed that annual limit. Um, and so I'm pretty supportive of, of what they've done. I think I might make a few changes, uh, just minor things, leaving sort of 100 tons at least between each change in limit so that we do have the ability to uh, make a change adeptly and um, maybe maybe rounding off some of the numbers just to make it a little simpler um, to understand. But but otherwise, I, I like what the advisory sub panel has done. I really appreciate the hard work they put into this over the past couple of days. All right, thanks very much, John. Further discussion? Specific recommendations? John Ugaritz. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I, I have a motion for this, if it pleases uh, you and the council. Um, I think that I'd like to get the specifics down uh, to be clear to what we're recommending to National Marine Fisheries Service. Yeah, that would please me. If you could uh, get a motion going, and then well, we would have something concrete to, to discuss. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think staff may have it and can put it on the screen. There we go. I move that the council recommend that NIMPS implement the following trip, I should say trip limits for the 2022, 2023 and 24 bluefin fishing seasons, depending on actual annual limits each year. For 2022, the annual limit is 523 metric tons with an initial trip limit of 20 metric tons. The trip limit reduces as follows. Between January and June, when cumulative catch is within 323 metric tons of the annual limit, the trip limit shall be 15 metric tons. When catch is within 223 metric tons of the annual limit, the trip limit shall be three metric tons. From July to September, when cumulative catch is within 273 metric tons of the annual limit, the trip limit shall be 15 metric tons. When catch is with 198 metric tons of the annual limit, the trip limit shall be three metric tons. October to December, when cumulative catch is within 223 metric tons of the annual limit, the trip limit shall be 15 metric tons. When catch is within 100 metric tons of the annual limit, the trip limit shall be three metric tons. For 2023, the annual limit is 720 metric tons with an initial trip limit of 30 metric tons. The trip limit is reduced as follows. Between January and June, when the cumulative catch is within 320 metric tons of the annual limit, the trip limit shall be 20 metric tons. When catch is within 220 metric tons of the annual limit, the trip limit shall be three metric tons. From July to September, when cumulative catch is within 290 metric tons of the annual limit, the trip limit shall be 20 metric tons. When catch is within 200 metric tons of the annual limit, the trip limit shall be three metric tons. October to December, when cumulative catch is within 250 metric tons of the annual limit, the trip limit shall be 20 metric tons. When catch is within 100 metric tons of the annual limit, the trip limit shall be three metric tons. For 2024, if the annual limit is between 525 and 720 metric tons, the initial trip limit is 30 metric tons. January to June, when cumulative catch is within 300 metric tons of the annual limit, the trip limit shall be 20 metric tons. 
when catches within 220 metric tons of the annual limit, the trip limit shall be 10 metric tons. And when catches within 150 metric tons of the annual limit, the trip limit shall be three metric tons. From July to September, when cumulative catches within 300 metric tons of the annual limit, the trip limit shall be 20 metric tons. When catches within 200 metric tons of the annual limit, the trip limit shall be 10 metric tons. When catches within 140 metric tons of the annual limit, the trip limit shall be three metric tons. From October to December, when cumulative catches within 250 metric tons of the annual limit, the trip limit shall be 20 metric tons. When catches within 100 metric tons of the annual limit, the trip limit shall be three metric tons. If the annual limit is between 400 metric tons and 524 metric tons, the initial trip limit is 20 metric tons. January to June, when cumulative catches within 300 metric tons of the annual limit, the trip limit shall be 15 metric tons. When catches within 200 metric tons of the annual limit, the trip limit shall be three metric tons. July to September, when cumulative catches within 250 metric tons of the annual limit, the trip limit shall be 15 metric tons. When catches within, uh, I think this should be 150, not 1750 metric tons of the annual limit, the trip limit shall be three metric tons. October to December, when cumulative catches within 200 metric tons of the annual limit, the trip limit shall be 15 metric tons. When catches within 100 metric tons of the annual limit, the trip limit shall be three metric tons. If the annual limit is between 297 and 399 metric tons, the initial trip limit is 15 metric tons. For January to June, when cumulative catches within 200 metric 220 metric tons, the trip limit shall be three metric tons. July to September, when cumulative catches within 200 metric tons, the trip limit shall be three metric tons. October to December, when cumulative catches within 100 metric tons, the trip limit shall be three metric tons. And finally, if the annual limit is 297 metric tons, MT there, or less, the trip limit shall be five metric tons for the entire year. All right, is the language on the screen accurate and complete? I just have to add in those last three bullets, after metric tons in, in each case, but before the comma, so 220 metric tons after that should say of the annual limit in each case. Thank you, now it matches my intent. All right, thank you for the motion. We'll see if we have a second. Seconded by Bob Dooley, please speak to your motion, John. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As I mentioned, I, I believe that between National Marine Fisheries Service and California Department of Fish and Wildlife, we now have a much better feeling on how to manage tightly to annual catch limits in bluefin fishery. We have also seen an increased interest in local bluefin catch, which we are supportive of. Uh, we feel like this is a high value, high quality and high interest fishery for both the commercial fishing industry and the public who wishes to consume bluefin. I would far prefer to have these fish caught off the West Coast with our stringent limits than imported into the US from other countries. Um, I think that the advisory sub panel did an excellent job in providing good discussion and input into what reasonable limits would be that allow for that catch. Um, I made some minor adjustments, uh, rounding some numbers and ensuring um, enough between changes in uh, trip limits that we can manage to that. Um, and while I uh, am sorry that I had to read that long motion, um, I'm glad that we have something to look at here. All right, thank you very much, John. So we have a motion, we have a second. Uh, let's see if there are any questions for the maker of the motion or any discussion on the motion. Bob Dooley, please. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's just, I just want to say, I really appreciate John's uh, motion and I really have to acknowledge the working together with the both NEMS and, and the uh, advisory panel to, to come up with a really good solution here. And I think that's, uh, that's to be commended. It's uh, a rare day when we see this much agreement and I think it's, uh, it's it reflects in the communication that's been, uh, you know, an increase between all the parties. So thanks John for the motion and I will be supporting it. All right, thank you very much, Bob. Any uh, other discussion on this motion? Not seeing any hands, I will call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. John, thank you very much for the motion. Is there, are there further recommendations or guidance to be provided under this agenda item? Krista Svensson. Yes, I um, just wanna revisit the recommendations from the PAC um, in preparation for WCPSC 18 co coming up and wanting to make sure that, um, you know, unless anybody voices an objection, that those are the positions that we want to bring forward either through me or, or I don't know by what other vehicle, but probably Dr. Dahl. Um, and I don't know that we need a motion, but if we do, I, I suppose I could put something together pretty quickly for that. But just wanting to generate some dialogue about, are we comfortable with those positions? And uh, is there anything else we need to bring forward in addition to those if needed for WCPFC? All right, thanks for bringing us back to that, Krista. So let's see if there are different perspectives or additional perspectives. I am not seeing any other hands, so I, I have to assume that folks are okay. I can't read minds, I can only look for hands. Any further, let's see, uh, Krista Svensson, please. Yeah, I mean, seeing that there aren't any, then I'm going to take that as acceptable in, in furthering those positions. Um, and then it's just, are we comfortable with that as a recommendation or, or do we need a motion to do that? Okay. Great. Kent. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think you're asking me for a wrap up of this item. Uh, and I think you've completed your business uh, to, the, to the degree that you wanna discuss international matters. Um, and you've provided guidance to NIMS on uh, the structure of a, a rule to establish uh, a trip limit regime for management of Pacific bluefin over the next three years. There was some questions and discussions around the potential for um, given some uncertainty about uh, what the actual catch limits can be, you know, looking out a couple of years. Um, uh, you know, adjustment to those. Uh, so uh, I'm sure that we'll be sort of tracking how uh, the fishery proceeds and how the uh, uh, trip limit regime performs. And uh, certainly we can schedule, I think, something at, at a, another council meeting sometime in the next two years or so, if, if it is a necessary or appropriate for the council to weigh in on potential changes to the regulations that NIMS uh, implements. And then just the other thing, um, as uh, Krista uh, just brought up, uh, as commissioner representing the council um, uh, uh, at the WCPFC, she um, noted that she'll be taking the PAC recommendations as a guide to the positions that uh, 
this council would uh, be supportive of uh, uh, in discussions with the uh, U.S. delegation, head of delegations, U.S. government, in terms of formulating U.S. positions. So um, I think with that understanding and endorsement, uh, she can she can go forward and fulfill her role as uh, as a representative of the council in that forum. Well, not so quick. Ryan Wolf has his hand up. Ryan. Yeah, thanks. I'll be quick. I just wanted to touch, uh, give an update. I probably should noted earlier because we've talked a little bit about you know the AS had his um, recommendation to to look into this. I think I answered Corey's question, um, and I agree with what Kit just said. I just wanted to note we will have some stakeholder workshops again over the coming year in the spring. Uh, one of those will be focused on domestic management, and so we can always come back to the council if there's um, additional recommendations uh, as a part of that, and we. We can we'll keep the council informed of future meetings all right thanks very much for that ryan all right so we have completed our business on agenda item h2 uh leaving uh the big one h3 uh for the balance of our day uh we're going to take a 10 minute break here uh we'll be back at 2 50 and we'll pick up agenda item h3 Say, uh, Mr. Chairman, before we go on break, could I make a quick announcement, please? Of course, Mayor, please go ahead. Um, thank you. So we are, uh, we've finished compiled all of, compiling, sorry, compiling all of the uh, materials for our closed session. Um, if you don't have an email already from Renee um, documenting how to access those materials, please look for that in the coming minutes. Um, and depending on how things go today, we could take that up as early as um this afternoon or perhaps tomorrow morning before lunchtime. So just a quick announcement. All right, thank you, Merrick. Yeah, we need to get that taken care of.
Okay, we're back. And uh, we're on agenda item H3, uh, Drift Gillnet Fishery Hard Caps. And uh, we'll go back to you, Dr. Dahl, for an overview. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll uh, read the situation summary. Uh, the issue may be a weighty one for the council, but the summary is short. Uh, this is Drift Gillnet Fishery Hard Caps. Um, at your June meeting, you adopted a revised purpose and need statement and a preliminary range of alternatives for a hard cap closure regime for the California large mesh drift gillnet fishery. The council originally took action on these protected species hard caps in September 2015, but NIMS uh, terminated the rulemaking process in 2017 because it found the hard caps regulations are inconsistent with MSA uh, National Standard 7. A NIMS rationale for this finding may be found in a letter they sent to you and dated June 9th, 2017, and it was in briefing materials from that era, uh, the June 17 briefing book. There's a link here. Uh, and the, that finding was, sub, after a, a rather tortured process, was finally or subsequently affirmed by uh, litigation. Um, yeah, actually, I, I guess that was what earlier this year. Um, when it adopted the preliminary range of alternatives, the council directed, that, that is in June, the council directed the HMSMT to more fully develop the range of alternatives consistent with the purpose and need and addressing the concerns expressed by NIMPS with the original proposal uh, stemming from their analysis. Uh, the management team met on October 13th and discussed uh, varying closure periods during a single gillnet fishing, fishing season as a range of options under the alternatives that you adopted or the, the two alternatives aside from um, the alternative, which is to forward the 2015 proposal. Uh, based on this discussion, the HMSMT has submitted a report uh, that includes for reference the revised purpose and need statement and more de detailed descriptions of the alternatives based on the council's June action and information to aid you in adopting a final range of alternatives or a range of alternatives. And if you uh, decide to do so, identify a preliminary preferred alternative. That was a management team report that was in the advanced briefing book. Um, in addition, you have uh, a uh, supplemental report from the management team and uh, you also have uh, a, a report from the advisory sub panel and uh, the environmental consultants EC have submitted a report as well. Uh, and I, so those materials are available and uh, will be presented. Um, oh, I, I um, overlooked also there's a supplemental CDFW report uh, that's just an update on the um, progress you know, of the California permit buyout program based on that uh, California uh, legislation. Uh, so with that uh, overview of um, the, uh, the materials you have, there is also a comment letter included in the materials. Um, I'll just wrap up here by noting the action is to adopt a range of alternatives and a preliminary preferred alternatives and preliminary preferred alternatives as appropriate. And that's my overview. Uh, thank you very much, Kit. Are there any questions of Kit on the overview? All right, we will get started with our reports. And we will start first with the supplemental CDFW report, and I'll go to John Ugaritz. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to paraphrase the report. It's mostly an update. Uh, in June of 2021, um, we provided our last update on progress towards implementation of Senate Bill 1017, which provides for a drift gillnet transition program. The total cost of that program was $3.24 million. 
and funding provided by the California Ocean Protection Council and Oceana allowed us to notify the first 24 approved participants that they could proceed. California state budget for 2021-2022 fiscal year uh, provided funding necessary to complete the program for the remaining 20 participants. As of November uh, 23 permittees, which includes 16 active and seven inactive, have completed the process of relinquishing their nets and permits and agreeing not to fish or renew or transfer a federal DGN permit. The remaining participants have until October of uh, 2022 to complete the process. Of the 42 federal drift gill net permit in 2021, six have participated in the transition program. 17 have indicated their intent to participate. That leaves 19 federal permit holders who are either ineligible to participate or chose not to participate in the California program. Of those 19, only three uh, had drift gillnet landings during the 2020, 2021, or 2021, 2022 seasons. And I will provide a minor update to what we submitted. Actually, since we submitted this, we've had one more inactive participant complete the process and one active participant has submitted his net for destruction and we are creating his paperwork. All right, thank you very much, John. Are there any questions? Was that, was that the, uh, I didn't mean to cut you off. Were you done with your report, John? You may be having some connectivity problems because you started to drop out towards the end. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, yep. Uh, what was the last part you got there? <laughs> well, I, I think you had updated us on, on the new participants in the, the, the late breaking news on one additional active and one additional inactive. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair, that was the end. Okay, great. All right, are there any questions of John on the CDFW report? Thank you very much, John. We'll now go to the management team, Liz Helmers. And I know that uh, you had uh, a report in the advance book, a supplemental report, and you have a presentation. So I'll let you uh, take it as you wish. Afternoon, Liz, we can't we can't really hear you at all. All right, hold on one second. All right, is that better? Oh, so much better. Okay, good. <laughs> I said uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, council members. Uh, for the record. My name is Liz Helmers. Um, I am co-chair of the HMS management team. We did have a report in the advanced briefing book, and then we submitted a supplemental report under this agenda item as well. And so I am going to give a presentation uh, to just summarize those two reports and answer any questions the council may have. Next slide, please. So an overview of our reports in the presentation. Um, in our advanced briefing book report, we discussed the council's adopted revised purpose and need, the range of alternatives identified um, by the team at that point, which were largely uh, different approaches the council would be able to take in determining um, its final range of alternatives. Um, and we included a preliminary evaluation of those alternatives. In our supplemental uh, briefing book report, we included additional considerations and then uh, also provided some actual team recommendations for this agenda item. Next slide, please. So just to refamiliarize everyone, um, the council's revised purpose is to incentivize fishing practices and tools in an effort to minimize bycatch and bycatch mortality as well as to conserve other unmarketable non-target species, including ESA listed species and marine mammals in the drift gillnet fishery to the extent practicable. The need is to ensure that take and bycatch of unmarketable non-target species, including ESA listed species and marine mammals in the DGN fisheries minimized to the extent practical, practicable 
and that such take and bycatch does not result in limitations on the economic viability of the West Coast swordfish fishery. So in the report in our advanced briefing book, um, in line with the council's motion in June of 2021, we have four alternatives. The first is the no action alternative. The second is the council's 2015 um, final preferred alternative, which was two year rolling card caps. Alternative three uh, provides five options for annual fleet wide hard caps. And then alternative four provides four options for individual vessel and fleet wide hard caps applied uh, in tandem. Um, just to call your attention, in our advanced briefing book report, tables one and three uh, provide the hard cap numbers under these different alternatives. So on the screen now, you can see um, alternative two, which is the council's original two-year rolling hard cap. Um, the team worked to create these schematics in order to help visualize the closure periods and how different scenarios would potentially affect the fishery closures um, when hard caps were reached. So this is an example for um, the 2015 FPA. While we were discussing these and discussing the current action, um, the team had noticed that the terms year, season, and fishing year were often used interchangeably in the council's previous hard caps action and subsequent final rule. So while the team views the intent behind all of these terms as consistent, each term could imply a different temporal scale, which could change the nature of the action when applied to hard cap. So the team discussed, and generally we found that year is out of a calendar year, so January 1st through December 31st. A season is used to describe the period between May 1st and January 31st of the following year, when fishing is permitted within some area of the EEZ, and that fishing year refers to a 365 day period from April 1st to March 31st. And this is consistent um, with federal rulemaking and that's in 50 CFR 660-702. In addition, questions about the temporal scale of the hard caps action led the team to also uh, question what the spatial scale of the hard caps action was. The final rule to implement the council's 2015 hard caps recommendation applied hard cap counts and fishing closures only to the EEZ, which is consistent with the spatial extent of the existing EEZ closure to DGN fishing from February through April. So in the schematic, you can see that period um, identified as the US West Coast EEZ closure. The team wondered if, uh, the team wondered if this applied beyond the EEZ um, as that it is possible for the DGM fleet to fish outside the EEZ. And so we would like clarification as to whether hard caps applies to all vessels in the DGM fleet, regardless of their geographical fishing location or only to those fishing within the EEZ. If the council applies the hard caps to only the EEZ, it could allow DGM DGN vessels to fish on the high seas, which is currently an infrequent practice, during a hard cap closure, potentially resulting in take of hard cap species that would not count towards hard cap totals. The lack of clarity of this temporal and spatial application of the hard caps action could inadvertently lead to loopholes in the hard caps action. Um, and there may be other unintended consequences. So to facilitate addressing this issue, the team suggests that the council adopt fishing year, which is April 1st through March 31st, for all of the actions pertaining to hard caps, as this is consistent with the regulatory definition. Um, and we also suggest that the council clarify whether hard caps apply only to DGN fishing within the EEC or include all DGN fishing without regard to area. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so alternative three, which was included in our advanced briefing book report, uh, has five options. The first option uh, is a 14 day closure. The second option, a 30 day closure. The third is for the remainder of the season. 
Uh, option four is a 14 day closure. Um, and then once the fishery reopens, should another interaction occur, the fishery would close for the remainder of the season. And then option five is a 30 day closure if a cap is reached before November or a 14 day closure if the cap is reached after November. So just a reminder that these are all for single fishing year fleet caps. This is not for the two year rolling period as is um, defined in alternative two. So at one point the, the council had asked uh, whether a reduction in the length of the closure period should be matched um, by a commensurate reduction in the cap levels and the team discussed this. So for example, would a cap of two injuries or mortalities with a window of two years function similarly to a cap of one injury and mortality subject to a window of one year? Uh, but due to the rare event nature of bycatch for the species subject to caps, the team believes reduction from a cap of two events over two fishing years to one over one fishing year could substantially increase the risk of closure and negative economic impacts to the fishery, making hard caps an even more costly action. Uh, so our recommendation, um, as was in the motion uh, in June 2021, is that cap level should remain the same for one or two fishing year approaches. Uh, we discussed a few other scenarios relating to the hard caps and closures. One was when a closure occurred near the end of a fishing season, when the season ended during the closure period. So for example, if a cap with a 14 day closure period went into, an effect, went into effect on January 31st, uh, the team debated whether or not we felt that the duration of the 14-day closure should be considered to end on February 13th when the fishery is already prohibited in the EEZ, or should the remaining 13 days of the closure be transferred to the May 1 through 13th period of the same calendar year. After discussing this, the team recommends the former approach, noting that extending the closure into a portion of the following season when little or no fishing would occur otherwise would create an additional regulatory burden with little or no benefit, conservation benefit. Um, next slide, please. All right. Uh, lastly, for alternative three, we had option five, which was the 30 day um, closure in the early part of the season or the, a 14 day closure in the later part of the season. So before or after November. Uh, the schematic that we provide on this slide shows an example of this. So after um, more discussion, uh, the team had considered whether the length of the closure period should vary or if it should remain constant over the course of the season. Um, and we brought forward this option, um, taking into consideration that from November through the end of January is the most profitable and productive time for the drift gillnet fishery. So a closure during this time period would be likely to be more uh, detrimental to the economic um, to the economic benefit of the fishery, and earlier in the season, there would be less economic uh, harm. And so a longer closure would be um, equal in incentivizing change of fishing behavior and also in um, mitigating any ne negative economic impact. Next slide, please. So then we brought up alternative four, uh, which has four options. Here there are options one through three. Um, like alternative three, the options one and two here, um, they would allow for the caps to be hit repeatedly within the same season after short closures. Um, and thus, that's not providing the same conservation benefit that the team believes the council is looking for. Um, well, option one would be an individual closure of seven days and fleet-wide 14. Option two is a closure of 14 days and a fleet-wide closure of 30. And then option three would be an individual closure of 30 days and a fleet-wide closure until the end of the fishing season, uh, which we listed here as May 1st. 
Um, this schematic only shows options one or two. Under alternative four, the council's June motion states that individual and all unobservable vessels are prohibited from fishing after the specified cap and the full fleet is closed after the hard cap is exceeded. The team was uncertain as to the council's intent, but interpreted the motion under alternative four to mean that an individual hard cap would trigger a closure when an individual cap is reached, a total of one turtle, for example, and a fleet hard cap would trigger a closure when a fleet cap is exceeded, uh, more than two turtles, uh, for example. The team would like clarification uh, as to whether this interpretation of the council's use of the terms exceeded and reached is correct. Options one through three here are similar, although they represent successively longer closure periods. There's a trade-off uh, between longer closure periods, which could reduce the risk of interactions versus the shorter periods, which would impose less risk of negative economic impacts to the fishery. Next slide, please. So in our advanced briefing book report, alternative four and option four was written as this, and it, it says as in options one through three, the closure periods would be the same as those in one through three, but when the fishery reopens in the same fishing season, if a vessel that previously reached or exceeded an individual cap again hits any of the caps, that vessel plus all un unobservable vessels are prohibited from fishing for the remainder of the current season. And if any of the fleet-wide caps are reached, the entire fishery closes for the remainder of the current season. Next slide, please. But that is not consistent with what the team discussion actually was. Next slide. So in our supplemental report, we provided a revised alternative four, option four. So the revised alternative option reads that as in options one through th three with the varying closure periods, but when the fishery reopens in the same fishing season, if an injury mortality of any hard cap species occurs on the same vessel, that vessel plus all unobservable vessels are prohibited from fishing for the remainder of the current season. And if an injury mortality of any hard cap species occurs after the fishery reopens from a fleet wide closure, the entire fishery closes again for the remainder of the current season. So the reason we wanted to make this change was that our intention was for an additional injury or mortality uh, to occur, not the reaching of a second hard cap um, after the fishery had already reopened from a closure. Uh, that trigger uh, makes a big difference, I think, in the conservation benefits of this alternative and option. So just to reiterate, options one and two under alternative three and options three, one through three under alternative four do not take into consideration the rare possibility that an additional interaction could occur or that a second cap could be reached during the same season once the fishery reopens from a closure. And you know, the team all felt that this seemed to contradict the council's intent to further limit injuries and mortalities to hard cap levels. The team could provide an analysis to help the council decide between the range of sub options under alternative four. Since option four would pertain to any of the other sub options, the council may wish to decide whether to limit the ROA to include only options one through three, modified to either include or exclude the provisions of option four going forward. And just to note that individual closures and fleet-wide closures are applied independently, meaning that an individual could be subject to both the individual closure and the fleet-wide closure. Next slide, please. In our preliminary evaluation of the alternatives, uh, we looked at some of the economic data for the fishery and how closures would uh, potentially affect the fishery. Uh, table four here provides some evidence of potential lost revenue for the two different closure lengths of 14 days or 30 days. 14 days closures would obviously result in less risk of lost net revenue. And the team discussed whether there would be any difference in bycatch mitigation incentives between a seven day and 14 day closure period. Uh, but we did not have a strong feeling as to whether or not that would be a factor. 
um, pertinent to options for different closure lengths under alternative four of this data. These data help to inform that. Next slide, please. So table five provides information on the potential share of season revenue lost for closures at different points in the season. The table demonstrates that a closure from November through January could result in a loss of 82% of the revenue for the year. Next slide, please. So there were additional considerations that the team included in its supplemental report. Um, the first was DGN fishery stability over the most recent decade. Um, when comparing the five years leading up to the 2015 council action uh, to the subsequent five years leading up to the current action, participation and revenue have not changed significantly. So that's through 2020. Further, the team had questioned the potential impact of the proposed federal legislation. Should that become a law, possibly as soon as the turn of the year? The second consideration was the potential for a deep set buoy gear fishery to offset financial losses in the DGM fishery. And as deep set buoy gear is a reasonably foreseeable future action, which may provide an additional source of revenue that could potentially offset financial losses during the hard cap closure periods, if DGM participants are able to effectively use deep set buoy gear. Uh, however, it's unknown whether buoy gear may produce a comparable net revenue stream for DGN vessels, both overall and on a per vessel basis. Discussion uh, surrounded some differences in the market served by buoy gear and DGN products, as well as the timing of respective fishing seasons. And so that is bullet three here. While the council did not recommend closure periods for buoy gear, ocean conditions during the winter months of the DGN season may limit or prohibit deep set buoy gear fishing. This is reflected in the X vessel revenue of the two fisheries over the year. Uh, the last consideration that the team discussed was, Oh, sorry about that. A key, uh, we also discussed a key assumption in relating the two is that DGM participate, participants have access to information about how to avoid these species. So the newly available EcoCast product may help. Um, it provides the near real-time spatial information on bycatch risk, uh, which may help fishers decide when and where to fish. However, of the hard cap species proposed, EcoCast modeling currently only includes leatherback sea turtles, so its utility may be limited with regards to other species subject to hard caps. Next slide, please. This is figure one from our supplemental report, and it shows the average monthly inflation adjusted X vessel revenue on a per vessel basis over the 2011 through 2020 time period. And it can be seen that the buoy gear X vessel revenue peaks from August through October, while DGN revenue peaks from November to January. Um, however, this information not, may not capture the impacts of other factors such as state regulations, preliminary state of development of deep set buoy gear, the fishermen's participation in management process, COVID, and other such factors. So lastly are our team recommendations. Uh, there are four. Uh, recommendation one is that the council adopt a, fi a final ROA, and when they do so, uh, to clarify whether an individual vessel should cease fishing when an individual cap is reached or when it is exceeded. To clarify whether, sorry, I forgot to ask you to change the slide. <laughs> um, to clarify whether the entire fleet would cease fishing when the fleet cap is met or when it's exceeded to standardize terminology when referring to the hard cap time frame, preferably fishing year, which again is April 1st through March 31st, to remain consistent with the regulatory language, to clarify whether hard caps apply only to fishing within the EEZ or to the entire DGM fleet, regardless of geographic fishing location, to potentially narrow the range of alternatives included under alternative three to only option five, and to include all Alternative four options one through three, including the provisions of option four in the final ROA, and modify alternative four and option four so that if another injury mortality of any hard cap species occurs after the fishery reopens, 
the fishery would close for the remainder of the season to ensure another cap is not reached. Next slide, please. Our second recommendation is to task the team with conducting an analysis of a range of alternatives to support the council's consideration for selecting a PPA at a future meeting. Three is to identify reasonably foreseeable future actions such as buoy gear authorization, fishery transition programs, et cetera, uh, that it expects the team to consider in its analysis to inform the council's selection of a PPA. And lastly, is to consider the team concerns for scheduling work to develop an analysis of the alternatives. Um, given the need for clarification on a number of elements, the team was unable to determine the appropriate methods for producing analysis at this meeting. But we believe we could make some headway on producing the analysis between now and the March 2020 meeting. However, at this time, we are unable to guarantee the completion of the full uh, hard cap analysis by March. Next slide. That's the end of the report, and I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Liz. There might be a question. And look, Dr. Braby, please go ahead. Thank you. And Liz, thank you so much for the presentation and interpreting all of the um, work that the team has put into the report. Very much appreciated. Uh, and appreciate the heavy lift you guys have uh, put in on this. My question is about the feasibility um, of uh, tracking uh, bycatch in uh, the high seas versus the EEZ and whether the team had additional information um, for us to consider uh, in that question that you posed to us. And if I missed it, apologies, but that's, that's what I'd like to hear about. Thank you for the question, Dr. Braby. The team had some discussion of this, although it was not too extensive. I think generally uh, fishing on the high seas is something that is pretty rare. Um, in looking through all the data myself, I've only um, seen and verified just a uh, just handful of landings. Um, seeing as how those trips are unlikely are probably unlikely to be um, observed, I think it would be difficult in order to assess what type of catch or bycatch occurs um, during that fishing. I think that would be something that the council would have to rely on self-reporting for um, to whatever degree self-reporting does occur. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Further questions of the management team? All right, thank you very much, Liz. Yeah. A lot of information in that presentation. Um, we'll now go to the uh, advisory subpanel, Dave Rudy. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Karolinik again, um, and, and council members. Good afternoon. The Highly Migratory Species Advisory Subpanel wants to thank the management team for their effort in offering up a large range of alternatives. The advisory subpanel proposes the following alternative using alternative four and exceedance levels of hard caps. See agenda item H3 HMS report one. When an individual vessel has one observed serious injury mortality interaction, that vessel would be subject to a 14 day closure. When an individual vessel hard cap is met for the same species by the same vessel, that vessel would stop fishing until the next fishing season starting May 1st and would also be a 14 day closure for the entire fishery. Option one, if a fleet, we, fleet wide hard cap is met during May 1 through October 31st, the fishing would close for 30 days. If a cap is met again between November 1st and January 31st, the fishery would close until May 1st. Option two, fleet-wide hard caps are based on a November 1st to October 31st time period. Counting, on, counting of observed serious injuries mortality starts on November 1st as reset the following November 1st. 
If a fleet wide cap is met, the fishery closes until November 1st. The numbers we're using are based on the exceedance of the hard cap. And so it's basically three for most species for the fleet and five for two species. And the individual vessel caps would be two for most species and three for two species. Basing the hard caps on the exceedance level the, in the HMS, HMS management team report is a consideration of a potentially higher level observer coverage in a much smaller fleet, six vessels actively participating. The advisory subpanel supports increasing observer coverage levels on the active fleet as long as it is cost neutral to fishery participants and hard cap levels increase in proportion to coverage levels. The advisory subpanel recommends that the Pacific Fisheries Management Council revisit the hard cap levels if observer coverage increases significantly beyond the 20% status quo. If new stock assessments show increased abundance of hard cap species, that would also warrant revisiting the hard cap numbers, or an automatic increase procedure would be defined or could be defined. Note that the original 2015 council action, the council would revisit the hard caps once the observer level exceeded 70%. In addition, the council could consider increasing access to the Pacific Leatherback Conservation Area when observer coverage is above this level. That concludes my report and I'm open for questions. Thank you very much, Dave. Are there questions of Dave on the AS report? Thank you, Dave. Welcome. We have a report from the enforcement consultants. Greg Bush, welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. Greg Bush, I'm the chair of the enforcement consultants and I'll be reading agenda item H3A, supplemental EC report one, enforcement consultants report on drift gillnet fishery hard caps. The enforcement consultants have reviewed the documents pertaining to agenda item H3, drift gill net fishery hard caps, range of alternatives. The EC supports the Fishery Management Council's efforts to evaluate regulations to minimize bycatch of non-target species taken in the California, Oregon, fresher shark, swordfish, large mesh, drift gill net fishery. The EC has reviewed H3A, HMSMT report one, and has the following comments. Hard cap reporting. The EC recommends that hard cap take reports only be based on observed takes from observer reports. EC also recommends consideration of 100% observer coverage if all observed and reported mortality injury of the listed species are to be applied to the hard caps. And I would note that we do recognize that the uh, range of alternatives is just based on observer reports. And as we stated in our June 2021 Supplemental EC Report 1 to Agenda Item F5A, the EC is concerned about the accuracy of data if some data are based on self-reported take because of the motivations for misreporting are exceptionally high when a take may trigger a hard cap closure. The history of accurate self-reporting has not been completely reliable. For example, the EC noted two recently adjudicated enforcement cases involving drift gill net vessels where the operators failed to report the take of marine mammals and only admitted to the take after being presented with video evidence. Neither, neither of these vessels were required to carry an observer. Alternative one, no action, no additional concern. Alternative two, the council 2015 final preferred alternative, no additional concern. Alternative three, annual fleet-wide hard cap closures, the EC prefers a fleet-wide closure upon reaching a hard cap rather than individual vessel closures due to the challenges in tracking activities of a subset of a fishing fleet. Closures of fewer than 30 days would be difficult to enforce. Additional aircraft overflight, so the fishing grounds would need to be scheduled and weather would need to be conducive, which can be challenging with the all too common marine layer hampering visibility from the air. Options one, four, and five are not recommended for consideration due to the short duration of the closure. Alternative four, individual vessel and fleet-wide hard cap closures. Individual vessel hard cap closures are more difficult to monitor and enforce. Vessel monitoring system is effective for monitoring closed areas and fleets of vessel, 
but less effective as a tool to monitor a subset of vessels. The EC also recommends clearly defining or clearly identifying which vessels are considered unobserved, such as no observer at time of cap being reached, not selected for an observer up to that point in the fishing season, vessels with or without a waiver, and not currently, currently carrying an observer, et cetera. This category must clearly be defined if individual vessel closures apply to both vessels involved in the take and unobserved vessels. EEC is also concerned about the enforceability of those options of proposed closures of fewer than 30 days. Additional aircraft overflights, verifying gear removal are also less effective when the closure only applies to a portion of the fleet. Options one, two, and four are not recommended for consideration during, due to the short duration of the closure. That concludes the EC statement. All right, thank you very much, Greg. Are there questions of Greg on the enforcement consultants report? All right, thank you very much. That completes our reports and takes us to public comment. Uh, the last I saw, there were five uh, signups for uh, public comment. And we'll get those up on the screen. And uh, first name I have is Asha Hudson, followed by Griffin Garner. And I apologize if I didn't pronounce your first name correctly. Can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you, I think. All right, I'm, it's Asia Hudson, but people always pronounce it wrong, so you're okay. Okay, Asia. All right, then welcome, Asia. Hi. All right, ready? Just proceed when you're ready. All right. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and Council Members. My name is Asia Hudson. I'm a lifelong California resident. I grew up with close ties to the ocean, enjoying the environment all that encompasses. I'm also a lifelong seafood lover who just recently tried my first moonfish purchased from the Tuna Harbor Dockside Market in downtown San Diego. My relationship with the marine environment led to my many concerns in regards to the overall health of this ecosystem. These concerns influenced my studies, leading me to my application and acceptance at Scripps Institute of Oceanography as a graduate student. Though, with that said, I will be speaking for myself today. I support Alternative 4 under the understanding that the hard caps are intended to influence behavioral changes in how fishing occurs. I agree with the Alternative 4 that the initial punishment should be solely placed on the individual vessel, but should not severely affect the livelihoods of the crewmates. A repeat offense by the same vessel deserves a harsher punishment. However, I do not believe that the entire fleet should be affected. This only applies if the vessel is continually taking protective species. If multiple vessels meet the fleet-wide hard cap, then the entire fleet should face the consequences described in the HMSMT report. For better enforcement, this alternative should be paired with the move to 100% monitoring. The fleet size has diminished since 2015, lowering the cost to implement. Without 100% monitoring, the hard caps are less effective and false reporting is a possibility which also negates the implementation of the regulations. In addition to the adoption of Alternative 4, a shift towards alternative fishing methods should be seriously undertaken. As the phase out of drift gill net gear has been underway since 2017, those that repeatedly take protective species should lose their drift gill net permit. New fishing gear like deep set buoy gear has shown so far to have low amounts of bycatch while also catching more swordfish when compared to drift gill net gear. The council should adopt alternative four with consideration to who the offender is, an implementation of 100% vessel monitoring and a loss of the DGN permit and a re to replace offender, to a repeated offender, sorry. In closing, I would like the council to note that I hesitate to condone behavioral changes through negative reinforcement. If there is a way to reward individual vessels or the entire fleet for not reaching the hard cap limit, I believe that will encourage more sustainable change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asia. Are there any questions of Asia on her public testimony? Thank you, Asia, for your coming to us and providing your comments. Thank you. Uh, next, we will hear from Griffin Garner. 
Yep. Can you hear me? You bet. How's it going? Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the council. My name is Griffin Garner, and I'm also a graduate student at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, but I am speaking on behalf of myself today. Um, I have a very similar comment to Asia, Asia, Asia Hudson, uh, my colleague that spoke before me, so I'm just going to keep it short and echo pretty much exactly what Asia has said. Um, I support the adoption of Alternative 4 as the primary preferred or pre preliminary preferred alternative. I also support 100% monitoring of the DGN fishery and remove the, and remove the unobservable fish, uh, vessel exemption as part of the hard caps rule package. And I also want to see the adoption of deep set buoy gear when practical. I am a conservationist, but I'm also a lifelong fisherman and a US, uh, US Coast Guard certified captain. Time and time again, we side against our hardworking fishermen and choose to make decisions that have huge impacts on their livelihoods, while we do not face the repercussions of these actions. Shutting down this local fishery in turn supports the import importation of swordfish from other countries that have far fewer regulations and more destructive fishing practices, like large-scale longlining. From 2015 to 2020, 84% of swordfish supply on the west coast of the United States came from foreign imports, according to NOAA. Um, again, I support the uh, adoption of deep set buoy gear and the adoption of alternative four. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you very much, Griffin, for coming and providing your testimony. Are there any questions for Griffin? All right, thank you, Griffin. Next, uh, we'll have Jeff Shester, followed by Teresa Labriola. Welcome, Jeff. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is Jeff Shester representing the conservation organization Oceana with, uh, with over 100,000 members on the West Coast. Um, we wanted to start by uh, thanking the council and the management team for all its work. Uh, uh, this has been a process over many years and hard caps on sensitive bycatch species uh, have consistently been uh, identified as an important component of the Council's approach to transition away from indiscriminate drift gill net swordfish fishing gear. Uh, hard caps create strong economic incentives to change fishing behavior to avoid sensitive species and to switch to more selective methods like deep set buoy gear. We asked the Council to adopt the range of alternatives at this meeting and identify alternative two, the original hard cap uh, package, as a preliminary preferred alternative, which, which mirrors what the Council unanimously recommended in 2015. With respect to uh, the, the the new alternatives three and four, we are concerned about the proposed shorter closures as they reduce the effectiveness of hard caps as incentives to reduce bycatch, uh, and also have enforceability concerns as raised by the uh, EC report on this action. Uh, we strongly oppose any changes to the actual hard cap numbers themselves, particularly the new distinction made between whether hard cap is met or whether it is, it is exceeded, as the term exceeded actually increases the hard cap numbers. Uh, by one, which can be important for, for many of these hard cap species. We further request that the council add to each action alternative in the range of alternatives language requiring 100% observer coverage on all trips on all vessels. The council has previously recommended this and reaffirmed its recommendation. And it is important that observer coverage be included in the alternatives, not be put forward as a separate action as they are integral to the effectiveness of hard caps. Recent analysis in, uh, by the scientists uh, Alexander Curtis and Jim Coretta in 2020 uh, found that 100% observer coverage is necessary in the California drift gill net fishery to determine whether the fishery is causing population impacts to endangered leatherback sea turtles. And we have submitted this study to the briefing book as part of our comments today. Furthermore, in the 2013 emergency rule for sperm whales, NIMS required 100% observer coverage with hard caps in those deep water areas where sperm whales are present. Oceana included in our comment letter an analysis of data received from NIMPS via Freedom of Information Act request of self-reporting of marine mammal and sea turtle bycatch on uh, unobserved fishing trips from 2001 to 2018. This reporting is required under MMPA requirements and logbook requirements. The, over this period, NIMS estimates using the regression tree methodology published in Coretta 2020 and referenced in our letter that 1,219 marine mammals were caught on unobserved fishing trips over that period. However, the number of self-reported takes was only 28. 
This means that approximately 98% of marine mammal takes estimated by NIMPS to have occurred during that period were not reported as required by law when an observer was not on board. Combined with previous findings that 100% observer coverage is necessary to get at accurate estimates of rare event bycatch, Oceana's new analysis further underscores the necessity for 100% observer coverage in this fishery. Furthermore, 100% bycatch is the only way to ensure that hard caps are fairly and equitably, equitably, equitably applied across the entire fleet for their behavior. As pointed out by CDFW and WDFW in the past, as well as Oceana and other conservation groups, NIMS economic analysis that led to the original withdrawal of hard caps was faulty. And in addition, the situation of the fleet has changed dramatically since then as the result of the California State Transition Program and the Council's authorization of deep set buoy gear. Oceana was proud to contribute over $1 million to the state transition program, and we thank the California Ocean Protection Council, uh, legislature, and CDFW uh, for its help in fully funding the program and implementing the program so that all willing participants can receive funds for surrendering their permits and nets for recycling. In the analysis, please direct NIMS, uh, the NIMS staff and the council staff to evaluate the hard caps under the expected number of active permit holders that will remain in the fishery at the conclusion of the California Drift Gill Net Transition Program, as indicated in CDFW Report 1 on this agenda item. We also ask that uh, there be an inclusion, I think as mentioned by the management team, of deep set buoy gear as an alternative gear type that can be used to continue sport fish fishing in the event of a closure due to hard caps being reached. And I would note based on the best available science uh, right now that ha has been published uh, both in the, the deep set buoy gear EIS as well as analysis uh, previously put forward uh, by NIMS, uh, a, a, a day of drift gill net uh, fishing uh, with uh, for swordfish and and deep set buoy gear fishing uh, have equivalent profitability due to the higher uh, value of of the swordfish per pound. Uh, finally, the recent uh, advancement of federal legislation does not obviate the need to move forward expeditiously with hard cap implementation, as hard caps are an important management tool to prevent increases in bycatch during the phase out period. And lastly, we ask that the council initiate an FMP amendment to phase out all remaining federal drift gill net permits by the sunset date established in California law, which is January 31st, 2024, now that the funding is in place. And uh, in response to the, the request for clarity from the management team, we, we suggest that the council affirm that the, the hard caps would be assessed uh, at the level of the fishing year and would apply to all drift gill net fishing, both inside and outside the uh, US EEZ. Uh, so thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Jeff. Are there questions of Jeff? Okay, not seeing any hands. Uh, now we'll hear from Teresa Labriola, who will be followed by Gary Burke. Welcome, Teresa. Uh, thank you, and good afternoon, Chair Grillnick and members of the council. Um, I'm Teresa Labriola, representing Wild Oceans. And as I was again reviewing the materials and alternatives for the drift gillnet hard caps and going back um, to 2015, I again asked myself, how did we get here to the place where we're talking about um, hard caps? And, um, you know, the Pacific Council has been reining in the drift gill net fishery for many decades. And while other U.S. or international fisheries took steps to remove drift gill nets from their waters because of bycatch, um, the, count, the Pacific Council has been experimenting with clever command and control of this fishery. Time area closures, changes in net depth, net depth pingers. Um, but still there are concerns with interactions with species um, such as endangered sea turtles and marine mammals. Um, and, and that's what leads us here today is this continued um, impact on, um, on threatened and endangered species and leads us to adding hard caps on protected species to the list of regulations already on this fishery. Um, we do support and continue to support the council's proposed action to implement hard caps to minimize bycatch in the drift gill net fishery and to incentivize fishing practices and tools to achieve this goal. Um, we think that um, 
hard caps are a way to have an accountability backstop on the drift gillnet fishery for protected species. And looking at the way that um, <clears throat> the ocean is changing, um, hard caps may actually provide an important component um, to regulating a fishery, fishery as oceans change. And we see species of concerns in new areas and in new times of years, um, such as what recently everyone has experienced with the uh, Dungeness crab fishery. Um, the management team definitely provided a good starting point for your discussion of alternatives. And it's always hardest to put all the thoughts down on paper and it's much easier for me to look at them and, and go, yeah, I, I like how this one works, and, and but I have concerns about that one. So I, I thank them for um, taking that first step, um, including the 2015 hard cap alternative, which they call alternative two. Um, I think it's important to include this in your range of alternatives for three reasons. Uh, one would be consistency. Uh, the alternative two was the result of many years of thoughtful negotiation and compromise towards a management measure um, that would allow the drift gillnet fishery to operate within specific limits that the council deemed were, you know, there were value-based limits of, of where we wanted this fishery to operate. Um, uh, second, the uh, alternative two um, should be analyzed because there are changing circumstances in this fishery. Um, you heard Jeff just talk about the economic analysis completed in NIMPS in 2015 um, and how changes in the fishery are likely to make this analysis look very different. Um, there is a, a, a different, uh, this fleet is made up of, of different members now due to the drift gill net buyout and, and the California legislation. Um, and also the council has voted to authorize drift gill net. And I think we heard today that NIMPS hopes to issue the first permits within the next two years and by summer of 2023. Um, in addition, uh, something I, I, you know, I've learned more about this week is that um, in the small scale, high profit bluefin tuna fishery has been emerging as an alternative and several drift gill net fishermen are actually now targeting bluefin tuna in years uh, like this year when swordfish are not available. And I, I think that's an important um, component of a, a, an analysis that was not undertaken in the past. And the third reason to um, put forward alternative two would be uh, for a comparison. Basically, this alternative will provide the council with a very good baseline of their prior decision and what all other alternatives might look like, both in terms of conserva conservation, conservation benefit and economic impact. Um, Looking through the other alternatives uh, laid out by the, the management team, um, I would like to see an analysis of, of alternatives based on the hard cap numbers in table three as hard caps and not as exceedance um, numbers. Again, we're looking to, to meet, not exceed um, our hard cap numbers. Um, I, I do have con some concern with the fact that that table is the same numbers as the two-year hard caps. Um, and now, basically, they're, they're for a, a single year. Um, specifically, I, I would uh, ask the council to consider reducing the annual hard cap for leatherback sea turtles, uh, which would now be two. Um, as you know, they're critically in critical decline. And um, a, a consideration of... of a hard cap of, of one with leatherback sea turtles seems um, prudent. Um, I'd also like you to focus on alternatives that include fleet-wide hard caps um, that result in the closure for um, se uh, a seasonal closure. So this would be similar to option alternative three, option three, as well as vessel hard caps coupled with seasonal closure, uh, coupled with um, fleet-wide hard caps, such as alternative four, option three. Um, these two options, um, I, I, um, I think would, looking at the, the EC report, these two options have some advantages in terms of enforceability. Um, hearing the EC say that closure periods shorter than 30 days are difficult for management and enforcement. 
Um, in addition, fleet-wide hard caps uh, that don't close the fishery for the remainder of the season means a fishery could close um, because of an interaction, say, with a loggerhead sea turtle or sea turtles, then reopen and have another interaction with another loggerhead sea turtle or, or other species, thereby exceeding the limit or reducing the conservation benefit. So um, uh, to answer some of the MT's questions, I think the, the cap should apply to all West Coast gill net trips, either inside or outside the EEZ. We're concerned about the accountability of our fisheries and their impact on the op open ocean ecosystem throughout West Coast waters. And um, finally, um, I'd like to um, the council to discuss the need for 100% observer coverage in this fishery. 100% monitoring to track rare event bycatch is required for the most accurate and accountable reporting of rare events, um, specifically sea turtles. Uh, the monitoring required is very different from uh, monitoring required to estimate uh, other fish quotas, um, which can definitely be achieved with less um, less monitoring. And um, we think this also represents a good opportunity to use electronic monitoring. And we support 100% observer coverage until an EM system has been tested. But um, this, this may be a, given it's, for, it's a, we're looking at large um, endangered species bycatch, this is a good candidate for an electronic monitoring. Um, thanks so much. I, I understand this is not an easy discussion to have again and um, I know that the fishery continues to change and it's changing right before your eyes as you are discussing this and I thank you for your time uh, to focus and consider how to limit the interactions between gill nets and um, endangered species. Thank you. Thank you very much Teresa. Are there questions of Teresa? Thank you Teresa. Gary Burke, welcome. Okay, how about now? Can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Oh, good afternoon, Chair Grelnick. <clears throat> My name is Gary Burke. As most of you probably know, I've uh, been in the DGN fishing fishery since uh, its conception back in the 40 years ago in 79, 80. I kind of want to briefly go back to the June council meeting for a minute uh, and the discussion. And I thought at the time it was just going to be a discussion. Uh, I thought that was really kind of on the floor. Dennis Henneman came on with the Marine Mammal Commission, gave a great presentation. They've said it before. They said they're basically hard caps in this fishery is not needed. It's such a rare event. And maybe they uh, consider uh, some other way of handling it. And even the management team talked about the pros and cons, other possible ways to address this issue. And I'm thinking the whole time, you know, with the present legislation and going on uh, and the few years we have left, why are we even bringing this up? And then kind of uh, Councilman Ugaritz came up with a surprising motion. Basically, it was the same as 215. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, you guys looking for another lawsuit here? We've been through this. <clears throat> he he kind of scolded the management team, said, hey, you guys missed the mark. You know, and it, that's fine. He kind of scolded the council too, really. But what really upset me on the motion was that the, the, those motion was made days before the agenda was even on the floor. This It seems to happen too much in, the, in this uh, council level where I go to myself, I go, God, we meet in the advisory committees, we give our hearts out, we talk about stuff. And it seems like we're not even taking into account motions made. It's, I remember years back, uh, Councilman Michelle, uh, the, she had it on the table. You could pick it up two hours before the agenda was on. I mean, it, uh, kind of frustrating given all this time. So now we're moving forward here to our present uh, case in hand. I'd like to discuss a few things. You know, uh, number one is the purpose and need statement. You know, we've, we've said this before, it is going to result in zero behavior change in the fishery. Uh, we've jumped through so many hopes to reduce the bycatch until something new comes up. I'm not so sure. There's such a rare event that we can stop much more. I mean, Pete, we've avoided whales all our lives. We don't want to. We've said it before. Whales uh, cause too much damage, loss of net. 
you're out of business. And the nets we've said before will tell you 50, 60,000 nowadays for a net. Uh, if you have one just blow through, it's like a giant bus ripping through a fence. You, you, sometimes you have to go in and cost you a week to repair it up. Uh, to this day, you see whales, the fleet leaves. Um, second, is, you know, this closure now, if we had a hard cap closure, would have even a bigger economic effect on the fleet, uh, basically because these guys, they don't have any other permits to go to. They're basic albacore fishermen. They rely a lot of their money here. They've traditionally, the five, six guys that are doing it, only fish uh, albacore and now swordfish in the drift net. Third is uh, deep set buoy gear. It's not a viable transition. Um, it, it's not a great replacement. If you ever read what's going on, half the people go broke, uh, have, have been. Um, the other thing is that the way the alternatives are, drift net guys, active drift net guys are third in line to even get a permit. They probably won't even get a permit if they wanted one for, I don't know how many uh, years it'll take. You know, the AAS uh, spent a lot of time here on the alternative for this agenda. And I think this agenda that, that they came up with would be the least economic harm to the fishery. And hopefully, uh, wouldn't promise it, but avoid uh, another litigation. You know, when we, uh, the litigation was actually, they, they uh, ended up just uh, evaluating Magnuson's and Stevens Act uh, Standard 7, but we flew on 2 and 8 and a couple other things that we weren't even needed to look into yet, but we hope to avoid that. So I'm asking the council to please include uh, all our alternative on the advisory committee. You know, we spent a lot of time. I think it uh, would be a way that maybe uh, the fishery could last and 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 their avoid litigation and at least put it in the range of alternatives so uh, the uh, management team can analyze it and uh, hopefully adopt it, in my opinion. So uh, thank you very much for the time. Gary, thank you very much for your comments and representing the fishery. Are there any questions of Gary? Thank you very much, Gary. So that concludes public comment and takes us to council discussion and action, which should magically appear on the screen. There it is. That's our action, adopt a range of alternatives and a PPA as appropriate. So we've received a, a comprehensive report from the management team, comments from the AS, and we've had a wealth of public comment. So who wants to get us started here? Go ahead, John. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, and I appreciate uh, the efforts and comments that went into this one as well. Um, we've been working on it a long time. Uh, I don't know that I agree with some of the things that were said, and, and um, I think we can discuss some of that as we move along here. Um, I would kick things off by saying where I think we are in this process. Um, at the last meeting, we asked the team to further develop what could become a range of alternatives. Um, and I think they've, they've done that. And I think they've uh, given us a lot to chew on and some very good questions that I think we should work on answering in where we go forward here. I feel like I've heard enough to have a range of alternatives that is inclusive of the variety of input we've heard today and the variety of input that uh, has come from the teams and, and other advisory bodies. Um, I do not feel like I am prepared to choose a preferred alternative at this point. In fact, I definitely feel like I need to see analysis of a range of alternatives in order to do that. Um, and, uh, that would include analysis of how feasible an alternative is, whether there are particular 
implementation concerns or issues of one alternative or another that would include um, you know the the team's input on potential economic impacts and relative uh, benefit in terms of meeting our purpose and need and and reducing incidental catch of protected species so um, I'm kind of hopeful that based on all of it we can pull together something um, I will say and and perhaps to Mr. Burke's point I have prepared something that I've been working on I will also say to Mr. Burke that that is not only common practice but necessary to be prepared for these meetings and that I for one certainly adjust anything that I've prepared based on what I'm hearing that day and even up to the minute uh, I submit it. So um, I don't think doing my homework is something that should be discredited. Uh, and I'll leave it at that for now. Great, thank you, John. Uh, Dr. Brady. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I, I um, also want to take kind of a big step back and uh, go back to our decision in 2015 about this um, management tool, a herd cap tool. Um, it was crafted as a tool for incentivizing uh, behavior change. And, um, and I think just the process of talking about it and putting it uh, in place, even though it never got into regulations, it has generated a suite of discussions that have been beneficial to information in front of the council today. Um, and so I, I have a hard time thinking about um, moving forward with hard caps and, and not seeing it as continuing to be a tool that helps incentivize um, good behavior. That said, we've seen a lot of changes um, in the fishery over time. And so I, I think there's there's two ways of looking at it. Um, I too uh, feel like we need to have a constrained set of uh, alternatives to be further analyzed because what we're facing uh, and have been facing with this issue for some time is finding a balance uh, between uh, the economic impacts and the conservation benefits. And we, we want to find conservation benefits, but not to um, fully close down a fishery. That is not the choice in front of us. Um, and so I think that today's goal for me is to ensure that we have a range of alternatives that is inclusive, that gives us a broad range of, of information uh, when the team is able to get those alternatives analyzed and back to us um, so that we understand the universe of, of options. And I would like to just kind of close this, this comment with saying that I, you know, I think we are in a, in a situation right now where we're pursuing multiple paths of changes in management um, for swordfish, for the DGN fishery, and this is a piece of that. It's not the entire picture, um, and I feel that we need to move forward with this piece of that puzzle um, and, and think that we're in a good position to do that today based on the team's uh, work, the AS input, public comment we've heard today, and uh, make a good another step forward. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Corey Ridings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this discussion is obviously one that the council has been having for a long time, um, but I think it remains important towards meeting the protected species goals and reducing bycatch. And this is likely to only grow in importance as ocean conditions change and we see um, species in new areas at new times of the year. Um, hard caps in this fishery, I think are consistent with the council's policy on protected species for all of our fisheries. Um, for example, protecting ESA listed salmon and the groundfish fishery. Um, 
I, I think that HMSMT has provided a, a great starting point for a council discussion of alternatives. Um, I, I support a, a broad range of alternatives for analysis. I, I think John and Karen already spoke to that well. Um, I certainly like to see alternative two, the original 2015 FPA included. Um, this was a result of many years of negotiation and compromise um, that would um, allow the drift gillnet fishery to operate within limits. And I, I think including it honors the previous council process and decision point there. Um, also for changing circumstances, the economic analysis completed by NIFS of that 2015 alternative is, is likely to look very different given the change in fishery participation as a result of the California legislation and the phasing out of um, the fishery and, and the council's vote to authorize um, um, buoy gear. Um, I am um, regarding these uh, additional alternatives. I really appreciate the analysis and especially the visuals provided by the HMSMT. Uh, I do have concerns about closures that are only short term. Um, based both on what this means for protected species, as well as the enforcement concerns that we heard raised um, by the EC. Um, should these move forward, I, I look forward to reviewing a more in-depth analysis about the impacts of those options and the sub-options. Um, in regard to the HMSMT's request to clarify where hard caps apply, I, I believe it should apply to the entire fleet, regardless of geographic location. Um, and, and finally, I, you know, some members of the public and others spoke about 100% observer coverage and where that is, and the AS spoke to this as well. Um, I, I continue to think that that is a good idea um, and that, you know, ideally, if we were able to get there, um, it would certainly provide some different options for what CAPS might look like. So as this discussion continues, um, I hope that that continues to be part of the dialogue. So I'm going to stop there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Corey. Uh, Krista. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I um, have to say I'm very appreciative of the discussion that's gone on so far. I also am not prepared to pick a preferred um, alternative today. So I'm glad to hear that there's at least one other person out there that, that isn't ready to do that yet. Um, I, I do think we should have as wide a range as possible, um, providing that there are some sidebars on that, uh, meaning not everything and anything, um, but but I, I am in favor of including option four, uh, in addition to option two, um, based upon the support from the HMSAS. I am also appreciative of um, really the conversation around semantics about both in the EEZ and outside of it, but also the conversation around um, exceed versus reached um, and where those where those points are. So just as we work through all of this, um, making sure that that the language we use is consistent and clear. Um, I, I do want to weigh in briefly about observer coverage. I guess I have a slightly different take on it. Um, in that, uh, you know, I am more familiar with 20% for scientific purposes than 100%. Um, I do think that there may be a happy medium where 100% of vessels, and I certainly haven't spoken to anybody else about this, but, you know, if 100% of vessels need to provide coverage and you are um, using a percentage of that, say 20%, um, then you don't have outliers that are never observed or never have the opportunity for being observed. And so, um, you know, not advocating for that today, but just putting that idea out there that um, I think 100% um, may not be attainable just based upon cost um, without EM. Um, and since EM is not readily available at this point in time, um, really urging caution to proceed down that route. And with that, I will close my discussion comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Krista. Corey Niles, please. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, 
Yeah, Corey, with, it's, it's hard to hear you. Could you speak up or get closer to the mic or something? Yeah, I'll try, Mr. Chair. I was having good luck this meeting so far, but um, sounds good know. now. No, now okay. it's good. Um, yeah, I'll keep it brief. I'll, I don't want to repeat what's been said. Um, I, yeah, I think um, I want to appreciate the work of the team for the the AS and, and coming up with a constructive alternative. Um, my my understanding of the concerns that that NIMS brought back to the council were not so much weren't about the hard caps themselves, but but some scenarios where the consequences would be disproportionate to what to what you're trying to do. I I, I think the, the purpose and need we have here is is right in line with with our with our duty as a council, and and glad to see the ideas out there for doing it. So yeah, don't think we have enough for a preliminary preferred. Um, but but we do have some ideas on how to how to find that the incentive that's proportionate to to getting people to change behavior. I, I hear Gary's skepticism. Um, I do I do think there are things we've heard that that people could do differently. And um, this if we if we come away with an, uh, a range here that of the of the sort people are speaking to, I, I think we'll start to see. Um, to get more clarity on on those issues uh, at the next step so yeah i appreciate all the discussion so far i'll just i will end there not having more to add thank you very much corey uh john you grits thanks mr chair um yeah going back to observer coverage i think the council and certainly department of fish and wildlife has been supportive of 100 percent coverage for the drift gillnet fishery um, I don't see that as uh, necessary to implement hard caps, but it would certainly benefit. I'd also point out that the original hard cap proposal was based on observed uh, catch, observed incidents of injury and mortality. So uh, it's only the observed boats that are counting towards the hard cap. Um, and, and I think I would support doing that as well in this case, though I also support the concept of closing vessels that are unobservable, and that's by NIMS observer program's definition of unobservable uh, when individuals are Hey, John, we're uh, losing your audio. It sounds like a bandwidth issue. Yeah, we don't have you, John. As see if a, if a cap at a risk of hitting that fleet wide cap after there, is that better? Yeah, I got you now. Um, we lost much of what you just said. Okay, uh, just double checking. Can you hear me now? Uh, no, it's it's faded away a bit. All right, all right. Let me uh, let me take a pause and see if someone else speaks while I try and fix that. Okay, very good. All right, we'll look for another hand. To give John a moment to straighten things out a bit. Or we'll just give him a moment. John, you're back. I hope I'm back. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay, great. So um, I was saying that uh, for observer coverage that uh, the caps were based originally on observed, observed injury and mortality, and I think that should be the case here. Um, but I also agree that closing... Uh, unobservable vessels, which is unobservable based on NIMS protected resource, and I'm sorry, NIMS observer program definition of unobservable um, makes sense when an individual cap has been reached. Um, and I'd agree regarding if we have a closure, it should apply to the fishery, not a particular area. So that would be inside and outside the EEZ uh, if a closure for hard caps um, is implemented. Um, in terms of the overall range, I I would like to see uh, both the uh, periods that the team recommends included in the range. I want to see that analyzed 
I don't know how things will play out in that analysis, but I think it's important both for the economic analysis and the um, impact on resources to, to see how those things play out. Um, so I, I would like to include both the full season and the temporary. And then also the advisory sub panel brought up the idea of a different time frame of closure going through November as opposed to the fishing year. Um, and I would like to see that analyzed. I'm not entirely sure how different that will be, but I think it's a good sub option for one of the alternatives. I think I'll see if anybody else has something more to say there. All right, thank you, John, for that. Uh, we, we certainly have a number of alternatives and a lot of options within those alternatives. Do have to narrow it down a bit. Um, let's see if there are any other hands up. And if we don't have more discussion, um, if someone has a motion, we could maybe can continue our future discussion off of that. Uh, go ahead, John. Yeah, thanks. I do have a motion um, that I hope uh, consolidates the various input we've heard, um, and I'd like to put it forward. Please. Oh, and there it is. There it is. Okay, so um, I move that the council adopt the following range of alternatives for drift gill net hard caps and direct the highly migratory species management team to analyze these alternatives for their relative ability to meet the council's stated purpose and need, <clears throat> their relative potential economic impacts to DGN permit holders, and their relative potential to reduce incidental catch of protected species. Each alternative should be analyzed with the addition of deep set buoy gear as a potential alternative gear during closure periods. Alternative one, no action. Alternative two, the original council preferred alternative for rolling two-year hard caps. Alternative three, a combination of individual and fleet-wide annual, meaning fishing year, April 1st to March 31st, caps based on table one below. Caps are based on observed interactions regardless of the level of observer coverage in all cases. I'm sorry, in all cases, ceasing fishing shall be applied both inside and outside the US EEZ. Closures are contiguous, even if they extend into or beyond an existing closure. Table one, individual and fleet-wide hard caps, values that exceed the individual or fleet-wide caps are in parentheses. Uh, I'll go ahead and read the table. It's species, individual cap, and then fleet-wide cap for fin whale, one with two in exceedance, and two for the fleet-wide cap with three in exceedance. Humpback whale, one with two in exceedance and two with three for fleet-wide exceedance. Sperm whale, one with two and two with three. Leatherback sea turtles, one with two and two with three. Loggerhead sea turtles, one with two and two with three. Olive Ridley sea turtles, one with two and two with three. Short fin pilot whale, three with four for individual caps and four with five for individual caps. I think I skipped over Olive Ridley sea turtle, one with two and two with three. Common bottlenose dolphin, three with four and four with five. I'm hoping I read everything on my table there. Option A. If a vessel reaches an individual cap, that vessel and all unobservable vessels cease fishing for sub-option one, 30 days if the cap is reached before November 1st, or 14 days if the cap is reached between November 1st and January 31st, sub-option two for the remainder of the fishing year as described above. If a fleet-wide cap is reached, the entire fleet ceases fish fishing for the remainder of the fishing year. Option B, if a vessel reaches an individual cap, that vessel and all unobservable vessels cease fishing for 30 days if the cap is reached before November 1st or 14 days if the cap is reached between November 1st and January 31st. 
if a vessel exceeds an individual cap, that vessel and all unobservable vessels cease fishing for the remainder of the fishing year. If a fleet-wide cap is exceeded, the entire fleet cease, ceases fishing for the remainder of the fishing year. Option C, if a vessel reaches an individual hard cap, that vessel and all unobservable vessels cease fishing for 30 days if the cap is reached before November 1st or 14 days if the cap is reached between November 1st and January 31st. If a vessel exceeds an individual cap, that vessel and all unobservable vessels cease fishing for the remainder of fishing year, the fishing year, and the remainder of the fleet ceases fishing for 30 days if the cap is reached before November 1st or 14 days if the cap is exceeded between November 1st and January 31st. If a fleet-wide cap is reached, the entire fleet ceases fishing for 30 days if the cap is reached before November 1st or 14 days if the cap is reached between November 1st and January 31st. If a fleet-wide cap is exceeded, the entire fleet ceases fishing until sub-option one, the beginning of the following fishing year, sub-option two, the following November 1st, with the cap counts beginning November 1st each year. Is that the end of your motion? I that is the, sorry, that's the end of my motion, yes. Great, thank you very much, John, for that motion. Um, it, it, it sounds as if the language on the screen accurately reflects your motion, but could you verbally confirm that? Yes, it does. All right, uh, let me see if there's a second. Seconded by Bob Dooley. John, please speak to your motion. My goal here is to have a broad range that can be compared to each other. I, I want to help inform the decision on a final preferred alternative. Um, I'd point out that I'm intentionally and quite specifically not recommending a preliminary preferred alternative in this motion. I feel that we need the analysis in order to make that choice. And selecting the alternative that best meets the purpose and need reduces the potential for in incidental take of protected species and reduces the potential for negative economic impacts. And while I agree that certain alternatives may be more difficult to enforce, these alternatives are not impossible to enforce. Um, I think a great example is that California Fish and Wildlife law enforcement officers are currently enforcing a temporary closure on Dungeness crab fishing in a portion of the state, a temporary ban on the use of traps by recreational crab trappers, while allowing the use of hoop nets and snares along with any host of other temporary and changing restrictions. Enforcement also occurs on individuals every day as individuals are required to be permitted. While it is certainly difficult to enforce temporary brief for individual closures, it's far from impossible. And while with regard to meeting or exceeding limits, I think there's a benefit in analyzing both and both have been included here. Importantly, for alternatives where there's an initial step where individuals are closed or the whole fleet is temporarily closed, an additional um, take by the fleet may be needed to effectively implement the cap where you then close completely. And I hope that the range is broad enough to provide a realistic comparison and, and narrow enough that the team can effectively provide those comparisons. Thanks. Thank you very much, John. Are there questions for the maker of the motion? Ryan Wolf. Thank you, John. Um, I appreciate uh, the comprehensive motion here. Um, I, have a, I have a question um, there from the second line on alternative three. Um, at the end of that, it says the caps are based on observed interactions. Um, I just want to note that's different than what would be an alternative two, because the previous council action was observed injuries and mortalities, not just interactions. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify that is that your intent to have it be different here, what the caps are based on versus alternative three versus alternative two. Thanks, Ryan, through the chair. Um, my intent, uh, as I think I said during discussion, is that this would be observed injury or mortality um, and, and by interaction in this, that's what I mean. Thank you. 
Yes. Any further questions for the maker of the motion or discussion on the motion? Uh, I am not seeing any hands. And so if there's no further discussion, there's no reason to delay a vote. So all those in favor of this motion say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. John, thanks so much for this motion on a tough agenda item. So uh, with that motion made and passed, uh, I will uh, see if there's further discussion or motions on this agenda item, I'll look around the table, see if there are any hands. And uh, I'm not seeing any hands, so I will then turn back to Dr. Dahl and see how we're doing on this agenda item. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, uh, I think you've um, completed your business by adopting a range of alternatives. That's what it says in the council action and um, there have been uh, several statements making clear that you don't uh, feel prepared to adopt a preliminary preferred alternative at, at this time um, and and want to uh, wait uh, until you get some more in-depth analysis from the management team of, of these adopted alternatives before moving to the next step. I guess one thing in that regard, I would just note, um, looking at our agenda planning materials, uh, that further action on this issue has, has not been scheduled uh, in the year to glance, our year at a glance planner or on uh, the next two agendas or the March agenda. Um, at some point, whether it's now or on Monday, I think it would be uh, very helpful to uh, clarify that. That will help the, uh, the management team in balancing the workload they have on this and, and uh, other items before them. All right. Uh, John Ugaretz. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair, um, and, and thanks, Kit. I appreciate that comment. Um, I'm hoping that based on this final range of alternatives, the management team will be able to provide us some input in advance of uh, agenda planning so we, we can better decide how long things are going to take. Great. We'll look forward for the, to the management team's uh, input. All right, uh, I think that concludes this agenda item, but we're not done for the day. Um, Executive Director Merrick Burden, do you have an announcement? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman um, and council members. Um, congratulations on your very productive day today. You've made it through a couple of very uh, weighty items. Um, what we would like to do is turn to our closed session. Uh, your staff is on hand to walk you through the items that were remaining uh, for you after the last one. Um, so what we would suggest is taking a, a short 10 minute break and returning for that if you are uh, so inclined to do so. All right, um, I think that makes sense. So why don't we be back at 440. I, I don't expect closed session will take very long, but we never really know until we get into it. So we'll see everyone back here at 440. Next, pardon me. Remember, you have a different login for closed session for council members only, obviously. So you have that login and an email from council staff. So we'll see you over there at 440.